It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comedy, too. He'll tell a dirty joke he knows quite a few. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a union man with an Emmy for right. Some days he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your ears all right, buckled in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Yes, it's time right now for the David Bell Show. Get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming away. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor Mike Steinel. I hope you can hear me. It doesn't feel like it. Yes, you can. Welcome to the mop up for December 6, 2021. I'm David Feldman coming to you from an air shaft overlooking a parking garage somewhere in Manhattan where the temperature is 53 degrees and wet. And that's just my chair. My I need. All right, I'm like, uh, let's see. We got a good show coming up. New York City Mayor de Blasio today ordered kids over five to show proof of double vaccination before they're allowed to participate in any indoor activities. And respecting this new mandate, Woody Allen announced kids over the age of 10 must also show proof of double vaccination before he'll buy them beer. On Sunday night, the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts honored Bette Midler, Lauren Michaels, singer Joni Mitchell, Motown's Barry Gordy, and opera baritone Justino Diaz. And uh, the Kennedy Center honors will air on December 22nd. Do I sound okay? It doesn't feel right. Yep, you sound good. Really? Then my ears are stuffed up. Are you sure? Yeah. It sounds okay. Yep. Then I have shaving cream in my ear. Okay. You say it sounds good. Oh, I know what's the matter. Plug in your fucking headphones. Yeah. Okay. How are you? I'm doing great. Okay. If you I'm not. Your, if, you, if you shave your ears more often, this won't happen so much. Uh, hang on for one second. Uh, I'm having... Okay, you can hear me, right? Yep, you still sound good. So my ears are just completely filled with shaving cream today. That's correct. This makes no sense. You're absolutely positive. Okay, I will trust you. Can you hear this? Loud and clear. That sounds good. Okay. Yes, sir. On Sunday night, the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts honored Bette Midler, Lauren Michaels, singer Joni Mitchell, Motown's Barry Gordy, and opera baritone Justino Diaz. The Kennedy Center honors will air December 22nd on CBS, and I'm personally tuning in because of Lauren Michaels' acceptance speech last night, during which he continued Saturday Night Live's nearly 50-year tradition of speaking truth to power by stomping the trophy with his foot while saying, the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts is chaired by war profiteer David Rubenstein from the Carlisle Group, who is perhaps the single largest war profiteer in the world. Therefore, 
I, Lauren Michaels, in the name of the millions of people whose death war profiteer David Rubenstein is responsible for, in the name of all these dead people, I cannot accept this award. He stormed off while Kate McKinnon sat at a piano to his left, singing Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. It uh, wasn't funny, but it was earnest. And I salute Lauren Michaels for refusing to to accept the Kennedy Center's honors, uh, demanding that David Rubenstein, who is chairman of the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, war profiteer, head of the Carlisle Group. I salute Lauren Michaels for standing up to power, to, to a murderer like David Rubenstein, war criminal, who somehow is chairman of the Kennedy Center. I, I don't understand that. Well, uh, listen, you should be very envious of me because I can't hear this. <laughs> so... I'm lucky. I don't have to hear this crap. You people do. Uh, Joe Biden was in, att in attendance at the Kennedy Center Honors, as was Kamala Harris, who is discovering that America's great resignation is landing on the doorstep of our very own vice president. People are quitting. They are quitting on our vice president. Chief Harris spokesperson Simone Sanders handed in her resignation. Also, communications chief Ashley Etienne and two other staffers, all who help shape our vice president's public image, they have all quit. Apparently, they're unhappy because the vice president is unhappy with the job they're doing, which is odd because all of them came highly recommended from their previous boss, Andy Dick. Yes, the four people in charge of how Americans perceive Kamala Harris are quitting. According to the polling, Americans don't like our vice president because she comes across as inauthentic. I'm surprised people find her inauthentic since there are four people on staff at the White House paid to make her look authentic. I mean, if you have four full-time employees working on the government dime in charge of making you look authentic and you don't come across as authentic, you just might be a neoliberal hack. Nothing screams authenticity, Vice President more than bringing in a fresh team of public relations people to add a new coat of paint over your hard-nosed ambition. Now, uh, you might not know this. You did not get the memo, but there was a memo sent out. I'm not making this up. When Harris was nominated to be Biden's vice president, her communications staff, the people who just quit, they issued a memo to people in the media warning people in the media not to describe Harris as ambitious. Otherwise, it would be deemed sexist. You're not allowed to call the incredibly ambitious vice president who stands for nothing other than herself ambitious. That's considered sexist. Calling Vice President Harris ambitious is sexist because we wouldn't call Joe Biden ambitious. No, we would call him a degenerate, lying racist. Nobody ever. It's a double standard on this show. We never call Joe Biden ambitious. We call the vice president ambitious. But because Joe Biden is a man, we call him a degenerate, lying racist. Uh, what's today's date? December 6th. I'm just getting my last licks in on these two, on, on Harris and Biden before 2022, when I have to switch gears and then warn everyone against the Democrats losing the House and Senate in November of 2022. I'm switching gears. I have till January 1st to get those last punches in on Biden and Harris uh, and 
then I have to I feel obligated to sell the Biden administration to Americans. Selling Biden's first year in office to the American people. I feel like the realtor in the winter of 1969, trying to rent out the homes belonging to Sharon Tate and Leno and Rosemary LaBianca. I think it would be easier to rent out the bloodstained homes of Sharon Tate and Leno and Rosemary LaBianca than to sell people on Biden's first year in office. It's a disaster. I would vote for him over Trump, but it's a disaster. So, and Harris is a disaster. We knew she was going to be a disaster. She's been described now. People are quitting the vice president's office because she's been described as a bit of a bully, which I find surprising. Kamala Harris is a bully. You're talking about the same prosecutor from San Francisco who locked up the low income parents of children who didn't show up to elementary school. Her a bully. I don't get that off her. I don't get bully off of Harris. Let's be honest here. Biden Harris, when you look back to a year and a half ago, think back to, you know, February, March, more than a year and a half ago of 2020, nobody, nobody in the Democratic Party wanted Joe Biden or Kamala Harris anywhere near the Oval Office. At least none of the voters did. Go back and look at the delegate count. Go back and look at the polling. Think about who was doing well and who wasn't. At the bottom was Harris and Biden. Pete Buttigieg, McKinsey's very own Pete Buttigieg, had more delegates than Biden and Harris combined. He was doing better in the polling He won Iowa, sort of, kind of. He tied Bernie. Bernie had more delegates than Harris and Biden combined. Elizabeth Warren had more delegates than Biden and Harris, and she was way more popular. You know who didn't have any delegates? Biden and Harris. Because nobody wanted, nobody in the Democratic Party who mattered, by that I mean the voters, nobody wanted Biden and Harris. They are repulsive. They are repulsive. They stand for nothing other than themselves and their family of grifters. But of course, Barack Obama and Clyburn and the Democratic Party establishment forced Biden and Harris on us. They made the calls and and Mayor Pete Buttigieg, this has never happened before. The guy who was in second place drops out, even though he's leading Biden. Buttigieg, McKinsey's very own Pete Buttigieg, drops out and endorses Biden, who's who he was beating. And the cipher, Beto O'Rourke, he endorses Biden, Klobuchar who I think was doing better than Harris. And I think even I think she might have been doing better than Biden. She endorsed Biden. And of course, Elizabeth Warren threw Bernie under the bus. And she, you know, she could have made the difference. She could have endorsed Bernie and and stood up to Biden. But but instead, she threw Bernie under the bus, accused him of saying in private. She accused Bernie of telling her that a woman can't get elected president. And what a disappointment she turned out to be. I would still choose Biden over everybody other than Bernie, but she is a disappointment. And so we got stuck with Biden, who has been a failure his entire life. He really is a failure. And as I've said earlier, he didn't go through the filtration process of a primary season. You may not like the way we nominate our presidents, but the primary season filters out the weaklings. And Biden, he couldn't survive the scrutiny. People got up close to him in Iowa, New Hampshire, Las Vegas. They didn't like what they saw. They, they, they saw 
Joe Biden for what he for what he is weak and a failure, not strong enough. Say what you want about Donald Trump. He dominated the filtration process in 2016 because you cannot knock him down. And, you know, again, Donald Trump, worst president this country ever had. You had to remove him from office, kicking and screaming. That's what the primary season does. It filters out the weak. It didn't filter out Biden and Harris. It propped it propped them up because the old guard and the Democratic Party got scared of Bernie. So they just put a placeholder in Joe Biden and he's weak and ineffectual. And you see that. You see that with Build Back Better and raising the not raising the minimum wage. He's just not strong enough. He is like Hunter Biden. He's had everything handed to him. No spine. He's weak and ineffectual. And as I said, Joe Biden, who I would vote for again and who will who I will be sticking up for come January 1st, Joe Biden stands for nothing other than himself, but he's still better than the alternative. He won't shoot us in the streets if we protest. That's what it's gotten down to. Vote for the guy who won't shoot you in the streets if you decide to to protest. It was a bad choice because Americans, you know, you can say a lot about us, but when it comes to picking leaders, we go for strange. We do. We like something new and different and exciting. And Biden is just boring and weak. And he's the same old, same old. He's just bad. Americans get excited. You got to excite the American people. They get excited for their presidents. Kennedy was exciting. Reagan was exciting. George W. was somewhat exciting. Clinton, Obama, and Trump. They were exciting. They were strange. They were risky and exciting. Americans will always vote for something new and different. There are a lot of facets to the American character, most of which I disapprove of. But one of our facets is we'll take a flyer on a president. Do you have any idea how risky it was to vote for Reagan or Trump? Americans take risks. They vote for someone who causes butterflies in their stomachs. And Biden just made me nauseated. Uh, Americans don't like a safe bet. And uh, but he was perceived Biden was perceived as a safe bet. And there's nothing safe right now about a president whose entire foreign policy has been outsourced to former defense lobbyists who want war. There's nothing safe about having Joe Biden in the White House. It's not a safe bet. Now, granted, he did pull out of Afghanistan and come 2022, I will be telling you how how magnificent a job he did and how unfairly he's been treated uh, when people talk about his pull out from Afghanistan. Uh, I will give him that. But he did screw it up. He screwed up the messaging and, you know, the parting shot of killing seven children on your way out. Uh, you know, anyway, is it any surprise that the vice president and our president, is it any surprise that their popularity is in the dumper? Are you surprised by that? We knew what their popularity was. During the primaries, a recent USA Today poll of likely voters shows Joe Biden's disapproval rating at 58 percent. He's underwater. He's underwater. He's where Trump was. Trump. I mean, this is the the first year. This is the honeymoon, not even a year into office. And a vast preponderance of Americans hate our president. They hate our vice president. Well, It's going to be a tough sell. It's going to be a tough sell. Uh, Build back better. I don't think I don't think we're going to get anything close to what this country needs to build this country back better. I'll be talking about that momentarily. Uh, Congress, 
this week, meanwhile, is trying to raise the debt ceiling by attaching it to a defense author authorization bill. The idea being it's OK to raise our debt ceiling. Debt is OK so long as we rack up that debt buying weapons we don't need. It's OK to rack up debt as long as it's spent on the military industrial complex. Bob Dole passed away over the weekend and uh, there's, you know, there's really nothing to say about the man uh, other than the, the sacrifices he made on the beaches of Anzio during World War II. And we thank him for that in all sincerity. But as Senate Minority Leader during Clinton's first term, Dole blocked Hillary Care. And he listened to the evil Bill Crystal, the now never Trumper, Bill Crystal, who gave us PNAC, who gave us the invasion of Iraq and still hasn't apologized for that. You know, Bill Crystal didn't just kill Iraqis and American soldiers in Iraq. He also killed Americans with his famous memo to Senate Minority Leader Bob Dole urging him to kill Hillary care, Hillary care. We could have had some kind of national health insurance that's better than what we have now, had it not been for the Republicans back in 93 and 94 who killed Hillary care. And the person who orchestrated the death of Hillary care is serial killer Bill Crystal, who is now a never Trumper. Bill Crystal, Harvard, former publisher of the Weekly Standard, Bill Crystal, who should and will rot in hell for the invasion of Iraq, and he should rot in hell and will rot in hell for killing Hillary Care, which wasn't great, but it was something, and it was killed solely for political reasons. There's a famous memo that I recommend that you all read that the evil Bill Crystal wrote to Bob Dole and Republicans warning them that if they pass Hillary Care, the Republican Party will become unelectable. He wrote, Clint, this is, these are the words of serial killer Bill Crystal. This is what he wrote in the early 90s to Bob Dole, who was Senate Minority Leader at the time. He wrote, Clinton Care's passage, Hillary Care's passage, would do nothing to hurt and everything to help Democratic electoral prospects in 1996. And in the long run, would revive the reputation of a Democratic Party that spends and regulates while striking a punishing blow against Republican claims to defend the middle class by restraining government. Hillary Care was killed by Bill Crystal, who said, if the Republicans give the American people health care with a Democrat as president, then the Democrats will be associated with saving lives and we will be a party that is unelectable. Again, Hillary Care, not great, better than what we have now. So uh, Bob Dole listened to Bill Crystal. And what is it like 55,000 Americans die each year because they don't have health insurance, thanks to Bill Crystal and Bob Dole. Uh, the one thing, well, there are a couple of things that, you know, Dole was funny. He was very funny. And the one thing I remember most about Dole is what he said running against Bill Clinton in 1996. Dole was running against Clinton. Clinton was running for re-election. Clinton was triangulating, turning his back further on labor, further on the Democratic Party's roots. And by 1996, it was obvious that Clinton was in the thrall of Wall Street, a liar and corrupt. And Dole was losing in the polls. And he had a like a mini breakdown, so they claimed, in front of an audience, I believe in Texas, he just screamed, where's the outrage? Where is the outrage? And that has stuck with me over the years, not just with the Clintons. 
just in general, where is the outrage? This is, you know, this is a man who almost died fighting for democracy uh, during World War II, and he just couldn't believe how full of shit Bill Clinton was and the American people were buying it. Where is the outrage? I keep asking that question. Where is the outrage? Bob Dole, dead at 98. Where is the outrage? CNN fired Chris Cuomo after new allegations of sexual assault were leveled at the anchor man, who is also brother to former New York governor Andrew Cuomo. But Chris and Andrew Cuomo are bouncing back with a brand new show on HGTV. It's produced by the Property Brothers. It's called These Chicks Are My Property Brothers. Wow, I'm so glad I can't hear this. The... <laughs> These chicks are my property brothers because it's being produced by the property brothers. And uh, the way it works is each week, Andrew and Chris Cuomo award a woman $10,000 to keep her mouth shut about a makeover she didn't ask for. The show will feature the rarely seen third Cuomo brother, Harvey Weinstein Cuomo. Sexual assault, not harassment. The Cuomo brothers have been accused of sexual assault. Meanwhile, with Chris Cuomo gone, there's now an opening at CNN. Oh, wait, I'm, hang on, thank you. I, I'm just getting word Andrew Cuomo just jammed his finger into that opening. Cuomo announced today that he is suing CNN for the $18 million he is still owed on his contract. Do you have any idea how many hardworking investigative journalists CNN could hire with that $18 million? The answer is none, because CNN is not journalism. That's not what they do. Well, climate catastrophe, evictions, homelessness, opiate addiction, so many important subjects to tackle. And that's why ABC's George Stephanopoulos is dedicating three hours of primetime coverage to the issue of our day, Alec Baldwin. This Friday night, ABC will lavish two more hours on Alec Baldwin's accidental gun mishap on the set of Rust. Baldwin gave an interview with Stephanopoulos last week and the ratings were off the charts. They were so off the charts, spectacular, that ABC has talked Baldwin into assassinating his wife, Hilaria. That will be uh, coming up in 2022, his conversation with uh, George Stephanopoulos about how he accidentally <laughs> assassinated his wife, Hilaria. Legal experts criticize Baldwin's decision to do the interview on ABC. They they think it could hurt him. You know, Alec, if you were to ask me for advice, my advice would be next time you want to shoot your mouth off, shoot your mouth off. ABC. It's on ABC. Or as Alec from Glen Gary, Glen Ross would say, always be complicating your future criminal defense strategy. No, not good. Uh, the, the, what I just said was not good. <laughs> just, are you sure you can hear me? Okay. It might be better if you couldn't. You know, Alex, Alex, Alec, Alec Baldwin has apologized to the family of the woman he shot he apologized to the producers of Rust. But what about the movie going public? Who, now that Rust has been scrapped, will never get the opportunity to spend $25 and two hours sitting through a rugged period piece that examines how hard it was to be an American male in the 19th century. Where's my apology? 
I was so looking forward to seeing Alec Baldwin's listless display of self-indulgent compost. They will not make rust, and there's no apology to us, the movie-going public. When Baldwin was asked by Stephanopoulos about the crew storming off the set that day, uh, the day he shot his cinematographer, Baldwin said during the interview that the crew was problematic because they were trying to renegotiate their contracts, which was something he didn't approve of. The crew was renegotiating their contracts. And what about promising hotels near the set to the crew? And then when they show up, they discover the hotels were nearly 60 miles away. That's not renegotiating the contract. You were okay with rene renegotiating the contract there. Or how about not getting paid on time? The, the, the shoot had been in production for two or three weeks and nobody had gotten paid. Does that count as renegotiating the contract? Or how about all the emails sent to the producers, including you, warning of unsafe work conditions? Was that an attempt to renegotiate the uh, contract, Alec? Obviously, Baldwin's interview was a crossover ABC special with Blackish entitled Sorry Ish. Well, He's going to spend the next two years in court, and I'm not saying Baldwin's legal fees are high, but his brother Stephen just called to lend him money as opposed to borrowing money, which he does uh, all the time. Uh, the interview went off. Uh, they were able to conduct the interview, but at first Baldwin almost backed out of the interview and uh, he was ready to walk then. George Stephanopoulos did everything he could to create a safe space for Alec Baldwin by hiring a non-union crew. All right. I'll be honest with you. Uh, I'm not in a good mood today. So I was supposed to have Smigel on and we were going to do Trump. But I am having uh, technical problems with Zoom, who I have been happy with in the past. I have been happy with Zoom, but uh, they are screwing me over. Uh, we live stream this show on YouTube. We do the show live on Zoom. And then we decided about a year ago to live stream the Zoom meeting on YouTube. And, you know, it's not a big audience on YouTube, but it's growing. And uh, Zoom is normally, normally, not always dependable for this. But lately, the quality of the live, the live stream uh, has deteriorated. The pixels have been diminished. If you'll remember about two weeks ago, we couldn't even get Zoom to recognize YouTube. And it's been an ongoing problem with Zoom. And I knew I had the show to do today. So Sunday, I had to spend my Sunday on the phone with Zoom. That was yesterday. And this is not the first time I've addressed this problem to Zoom, and they assured me they were going to take care of it yesterday. So Sunday was spent briefly on the phone, relitigating my problems with Zoom. And, you know, there's a ticket, there's an ongoing ticket, there's always a ticket. And this ticket has been active for about three weeks. And each time I call Zoom, I have to re-explain the problem to the new person. And I have to do the same troubleshooting with the new person. And it takes anywhere between 40 minutes to an hour each time. And each new person at Zoom has to start from scratch on the same problem that has persisted for close to three weeks. So yesterday I called and I explained that, you know, I don't work for Zoom. This is taking up my time troubleshooting, doing the same troubleshooting with you when it's a problem on the back end. And by back end, I mean you're a pain in the ass. It's some kind of problem with Zoom, not me. It's not a problem with YouTube. It's not a problem with my computers or my camera. It's a problem with Zoom. And I go through this over and over again, and I can't control my rage, but I have to because you cannot yell at anybody. So uh, 
at one point I was speaking to someone in another country and then another person. And then I called billing and then they're in another country and they're working out of their homes in another country and their phone connection is bad. This is Zoom. And all I keep thinking while this is going on, and I know people have bigger problems. I know people have bigger problems. But all I kept thinking was, how is it possible that Americans who all go through this, not necessarily with Zoom, but with their health insurance company, how is it possible that Americans still believe that that corporations can be more efficient than government? I mean, uh, we're not even talking about corporate America because corporate America doesn't even exist. I don't, I don't even think Zoom. I, I, in fact, I know Zoom isn't an American company, and frankly, no. American corporation is American since most of the time, even when they purport to be American, they've outsourced most of their jobs, especially customer service, and much of their profits overseas. The jobs have been shipped overseas and the profits have been shipped overseas. So American corporations like Apple, Amazon, they do business in America. They call themselves America, but they're not American. They have no skin in the American game. So I'd like to know how it's possible that Americans still believe corporations are more efficient, more trustworthy than our government, because they are not. First of all, they're not even American. Any corporation you're dealing with is not American. They claim to be American. They might have a charter in Delaware. I don't even think Delaware is America. Well, it shouldn't be. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about inflation and interest rates. And I think it might be a little difficult for those of you who don't understand finance and budget deficits in the Federal Reserve. I don't understand it either, but I want to talk you through some stuff that might pique your interest into learning about this and re help you realize how we're all being taken advantage of by these charlatans from Wall Street who spend billions every year brainwashing us, convincing us that government is not as good as corporations. They say corporate America. I maintain corporate America doesn't exist. I don't believe any corporation is invested in America. So I was thinking about inflation and interest rates over the weekend. Uh, inflation seems to be real. That's what we're being told. Inflation seems to be real. And of course, it's our fault. It's our fault for taking that extra $600 in unemployment benefits. It's our fault for taking PPP. It's our fault for wanting to get some help paying our rent. We caused the inflation. That's what's holding up Build Back Better inflation. We're worried about inflation. You can't give the American people what they need, because it will create inflation. The government can't spend money because it will create inflation, right? Wheelbarrows of Deutschmarks to pay for a donut. That's what we're that's what we're told will happen if Bernie's six trillion dollar build back better got passed. Well, obviously, I don't understand how the Federal Reserve works, just like everyone else, including Fed Chair Jerome Powell, the inside insider trader, Jerome Powell, just reappointed to another six years at the Federal Reserve. But I want to talk about the myth of inflation and how the myth of inflation is a propaganda technique that forces ordinary Americans to trust corporate America 
more than we trust our government. And again, corporate America is a contradiction in terms. Um, corporations are not invested. They couldn't care less what happens to America. Now, this stuff is complicated. Try to follow me. It makes sense. You may have to listen to this again, but it makes sense. The Federal Reserve has been creating cheap money with low interest rates since as far back as the Clinton administration. I don't know if you remember, but uh, uh, or you, you might not have been born yet, but the maestro, Alan Greenspan, who ran the Federal Reserve, told Bill Clinton when he first became president, basically, I will destroy your presidency. I will raise interest rates if you don't balance the budget. And because Bill Clinton didn't understand economics and fiscal policy, he got terrified by Greenspan. And so Clinton became a fiscal hawk. The minute he arrived inside the Oval Office, Greenspan turned him into a fiscal hawk. And he literally turned to his cabinet and said, what am I doing here? What am I doing here if we can't spend money? Clinton was a coward. He stood for nothing other than himself. And he agreed to try to balance the budget, which he succeeded at. Bill Clinton, ba Bill C Clinton balanced the budget by the time he left office, which means that the federal government no longer issued treasury bonds. It was unheard of for the for the for the federal government to take on no new debt. It was incredible. The federal government was not racking up any debt when Bill Clinton left office. There were no treasury bonds for anybody to buy. OK. And we had been convinced that that's a good thing because it keeps the Federal Reserve's interest rates down. Well, qui bono? Who benefits if interest rates are down? Who benefits from that? Not the American people. Not the American people. The bankers on Wall Street benefit when interest rates are down. Now, you don't need to understand economics. You just need to know some basics that when the Federal Reserve raises interest rates, it's because they're trying to cool the economy down to prevent inflation. Because if you're on Wall Street, you're terrified of inflation. And they have us scared. They have the American people terrified of wheelbarrows of Deutschmarks to buy a donut. Corporations, however, corporations underwriters, they want cheap money. They want interest rates low because they want to be able to borrow money cheaply so that they can, if they're, you know, uh, Visa or MasterCard, then they can lend the money at exorbitant interest rates. I mean, the markup that Visa and MasterCard and American Express have, it's biblically usurious. They get cheap money from the Fed and then they lend you uh, money at what? I was offered a card at 20 percent a year, 20 percent a year. And uh, my advice to you is call your credit card company and ask them what the how much I'm going to end up paying on my debt in a year. They won't be able to tell you. I recorded a conversation with uh, Visa. They were offering me a card. And I said, let's say I borrow $10,000 from you for, for a medical emergency. I'm planning a, med a medical emergency. I like to think ahead before a medical emergency. So I'm shopping around for emergency rooms to see what they charge, because we've been told 
that it's the free market that it, that makes our health care so great in this country. So I'm being a good, a wise consumer. I'm shopping around for an emergency room. I'm also shopping around for a good credit card to put the ten thousand uh, dollars, the ten thousand dollar medical bill on. And I was on the phone for 45 minutes with three separate customer service specialists from Visa who couldn't calculate what I would end up paying to put $10,000 on my card for the year. I said, I'm not going to be working. So I'm just going to be making the minimum payment on this emergency. What does it cost? They couldn't answer the question. So it is in the best interest of the credit card companies for interest rates to be low because uh, then it doesn't cost them any money to to take money, to lend money at 15, 20 percent, sometimes 28 percent. I was offered a credit card with an APR of 28 percent. That's uh, the truly amazing thing about the low interest rates is it benefits the wrong people. If you're buying a house, uh, you can get a lower interest rate on a mortgage. But credit card debt, uh, that doesn't benefit low interest rates. You don't see the benefit of the low interest rates on your credit card. And corporations love low interest rates. And that's why corporate debt is now the highest it's ever been. When you hear that the stock market is hitting record highs, a few, a handful of companies are driving those highs. Most corporations in the Fortune, the S&P 500, are not doing well. The way they weight the S&P 500, it's just 10 stocks that are lifting the 490 stocks on the index, which most people don't understand any of this. I do a little. But most corporations are not doing well because of cheap money. They are racking up debt. So when you exclude any corporations that are in the business of lending money. Like banks, if you just look at every corporation that isn't in the business of lending money, corporate debt has surpassed 11 trillion dollars this year. This is the big debt. It's even bigger than student loan debt. I think student loan debt is nearing two trillion. Uh, corporate debt, eleven trillion dollars. That is the new bubble. That's the bubble nobody wants to talk about. Corporations issuing bonds, junk bonds, they're called, as well as borrowing from banks, uh, and they're doing it because interest rates are so low, and they're staying afloat. A lot of them are staying afloat on debt while paying their CEOs exorbitant salaries. And most corporations, as I said, are not doing well, but their CEOs, they're doing very well because they've learned accounting tricks and they are taking on debt because money is so cheap. And one day the debt comes due and it's going to get ugly, as it always does. And the United States government, the evil United States government, which can't do anything right, will be forced to step in and bail out all these corporations that took advantage of the Federal Reserve's low interest rates and racked up $11 trillion right now in debt. It may get up to $20 trillion before it pops, but it's going to pop. And we're going to have to bail out all these corporations. But we'll be told we can't nationalize any of them because America can't run a business as efficiently as corporate America can. That's the big lie we're told. We can't. Your tax dollars are there to bail out these these bogus CEOs. And then if we're lucky, They'll create jobs, low paying jobs. They'll thank us by creating low paying jobs the way GM, when we bailed it out, 
you know, gave us some jobs and then gutted the union and shipped the rest of the jobs down to Mexico. That was the thanks we got for bailing out GM in 2009. Was it 2009? But here's the point of all this. When the Fed keeps interest rates down, it means that saving money in a safe and secure holding gets you nothing. If you're lucky enough to have any money that's saved, and I was pleased to discover that many Americans are beginning to save money. There is reportedly $1.7 trillion in cash sitting in American savings accounts right now since the pandemic. Americans right now, Americans right now have the highest savings rate since World War II. And saving money is good. People are not spending as much money the way they used to because businesses are closed. That's not a good thing, but Americans are not spending money. And uh, so there's cash piling up and Wall Street is salivating over that cash. But saving money is good for the economy and good for the country. Japan has a very high savings rate and they have been in a recession for close to 30 years. And their version of a recession, I would take a Japanese recession over uh, an American economic boom anytime. They have similar yardsticks. They can measure GDP and GNP, trade deficits. But even in a recession, the Japanese live far better than Americans do because they save money. Saving money is good for the country. It's good for the economy. It's just not good for Wall Street. See, Wall Street doesn't want you to save your money because if you save money, it means your money is staying in the banks and that money is being used to to be lent out for simple things that are not complicated, like a car, a home improvement loan, college, right? You know, if you're just saving money, you're not uh, taking on corporate debt to go to college. So they have conspired, and I do mean conspired, to keep interest rates uh, in the cellar. I mean, since Clinton, interest rates are like almost zero. And there was a point after the financial collapse where interest rates were below zero. We are not encouraged to save money in America in safe in safe investments. We are not encouraged to invest our money safely. If you have any money and you are terrified of losing it, either to a economic crash or inflation, they have conspired to make it impossible for you to put your money in the bank and let it quietly grow. I checked the interest on a certificate of deposit. That is the second safest thing. That is a certificate of deposit is, you know, a bank, you know, you give the bank money and you you say you can have it for six months or six years and it's guaranteed by the FDIC, which is the federal government. It's, It's as safe as getting a bond from the government, right? A certificate of deposit from a bank right now is offering you anywhere between 1% if you go out a couple of years and half a percent if you're only willing to go out for like six months. Capital One, uh, Alec Baldwin does commercials for Capital One, those fine people. They're offering a five-year certificate of deposit at 1% a year, 1% a year. That is the safest place to put your money 
next to a next to a government bond, one percent over five years. So you save your money. You're going to lose money because of inflation. You will have less money in five years because of inflation if you buy a five year certificate of deposit from Capital One. Meanwhile, they can take that money that you give them and they can do whatever they want with it. Most banks are pl- paying below 1%. Uh, if you get a credit card from them, they're charging you as much as 30%. So in order to protect your money and keep it safe from an economic calamity or inflation, you have no place to go. Now, the the, the only thing safer than a certificate of deposit is a series double E savings bond that's issued by the government. And they do make some that are pegged to inflation, uh, but it's issued by the government and it's the safest place to put your money. And right now, a double E savings bond is paying. I'm not making this up. I I checked three places to make sure this was correct. 0.10% a year. So it's uh, 0.10% a year. Uh, It would take uh, 20 years for your money to double, which is like, my God, that's when I was a kid, Uh, When my kids were born, you know, grandparents, if they have any money, buy babies, you know, like a five dollar savings bond. And uh, it was a government. It is. It still is. I don't think anybody does it anymore. The government issue savings bond that paid, I don't know, five percent, seven percent. Now it's zero point one oh percent. So putting your money into uh, something safe that's guaranteed by the government, uh, you you have no place to put your money. You give the government $100, you're getting 10 cents a year. I think it's 10, yeah. I think it's 10 cents a year on, yeah, $1 would be 1%. So you're gonna get 10 cents a year if you give the government if you buy a $100 government bond. So uh, that's what low interest rates do. They they create uh, nothing but risk. There's no safe place to save your money. There's no place for your money to grow safely, honorably. Unless, you know, well, there is no, there is nothing. Uh, you can buy junk bonds, but those are risky. And those are bonds issued by corporations. And that's what Wall Street wants you to buy. They don't want you buying treasuries. They don't want you buying savings bonds from the government. They want you buying bonds issued, underwritten by Wall Street, issued by corporations. Those are called junk bonds. They pay more because they're riskier. Or... They want you to buy stock. Now, think about what this does psychologically to our political system and voters. Think about what kind of emotional investment Americans have once they realize that in order to protect their money from inflation, they have to depend on Wall Street as opposed to our government. Psychologically, think about what that does to to our politics. People with any money who are saving either for education or retirement are forced to put their money into the stock market or buy corporate junk bonds. And that forces them to put their trust into corporations and not the American government. They cannot buy American bonds anymore. They cannot buy certificates of deposit that are guaranteed by the federal government because inflation 
eats away at it. Even with no inflation, as they there is infl there's always has been inflation. I'll get to that in a second. But even a little inflation eats away at money that's put away in a safe vehicle like treasuries or a certificate of deposit. So psychologically, since Clinton, more and more Americans are putting their trust into corporate America, their faith into corporate America and Wall Street. And it creates this, this unvirtuous cycle where Americans start becoming psychologically, politically, and monetarily dependent on corporations for security and not the government because they're getting their money now from corporations and not the government. There are Americans right now whose entire life savings, their pensions, their retirement, their, their, their children's education is dependent on the stock market going up or they're dependent on the corporation that issued junk bonds. More Americans look at, are, care more about the future of corporate America than they do America because they have a financial stake in corporate America doing well. But keeping interest rates down artificially is bad for government. It's bad for the economy. It's only good for corporate America and Wall Street. But corporate America and Wall Street, they are not America and they're not our economy. They're not our economy. So we have a problem here. This has been a well thought out exercise in both propaganda and the transfer of money. They figured out how to get us emotionally invested in the stock market, even if we don't have any money in the stock market. Even if you don't have money in the stock market, you have money in the stock market. You may not know that you have money in the stock market. If, uh, if you have a pension, that pension is invested in the stock market. You don't know how it's invested, but it's invested in the stock market. Uh, and so you are rooting for corporate America. You're not uh, rooting for the workers. You're rooting for the CEOs because your security depends on the CEO's ability to keep the stock price high and not necessarily the dividends coming in. Most Americans think they don't own stock, but I'm telling you, you own stock. You don't know that you own stock. Uh, you get a lot of your money. Uh, if you have a life insurance policy, the insurance company is playing the stock market. Warren Buffett makes a lot of his money, if not more than half of his money, owning insurance companies. And you want to return on your savings, uh, it's not coming from any safe and secure bonds issued by the federal government or the, or the state or the city because they pay nothing. Your savings, whether you know it or not, is in the stock market. It's in junk bonds. And that's why so many people think that corporate America is better than the government. And when corporate America goes belly up, we demand that our government, which we have been taught to despise, bail out corporate America, because we still think after every time, every 10 years, corporate America needs a bailout. And every time we're convinced somehow that it's the government's fault that corporate America went under. Yeah, it's government's fault because they've stripped our government of the watchdogs to prevent corporations from making risky bets. So the American people have been brainwashed into thinking government is the problem and corporate America is the answer. So when uh, the CEO of some 
I think it was a real estate, some mortgage company last week announced 9,000 layoffs on Zoom, uh, like he did last week. Uh, to many Americans, they figure, well, it's kind of insensitive, but that's good for the stock price. You know, I, you really can't criticize a boss for laying off 9,000 people on Zoom because he's, you know, he's in service. He has an obligation to enhance profits. Uh, he did the layoffs on Zoom. Uh, I wonder if how long the meeting was able to last without. Uh, anyway, I'm off Zoom. I'm not talking about Zoom. But that, uh, this is what's happened ever since Clinton was president and interest rates were lowered. Psychologically, too many Americans who don't understand any of this, uh, anybody with a high paying job, root for corporate America because they want the stock market to go up because they can't find a safer place to put their money. And now, all of a sudden, when, when income inequality is undeniable, inflation is suddenly a problem. The same way crime is suddenly a problem. It's only a problem because the people keeping score have, have decided it's a problem. Crime has been going up ever since Reagan took office. Corporate crime, which is far more serious than a stick up on the street. Corporate crime, when GM doesn't fix uh, its ignition and people die. That's the, our, our, our prisons should be filled with corporate criminals. Corporate crime has been going up ever since Ronald Reagan deregulated all the federal agencies and corporations could literally get away with murder. But suddenly crime is going up. It's been going up since Reagan took office and inflation has always been going up. Inflation is always going up. Ask anyone who needed to take out a loan to go to college. Look at what it costs to go to college. Ask anyone who needs to take out a loan to pay off a medical expense or needed to rent a home. Inflation, like crime statistics, they're arbitrary. Those statistics are dreamed up by what's in the best interest of the people in charge of our government. And the people in charge of our government, they're with Wall Street. They're with corporate America. And they are using the cudgel, the false cudgel of inflation to scare us into uh, not passing Build Back Better at $6 trillion because Wall Street wants fiscal austerity in Washington, D.C. Not, they have $17 trillion in debt. Corporate America has $17 trillion in debt and counting, but they go to Washington and demand fiscal austerity from the government. It's okay for corporate America to, to rack up uh, record debt but Washington, you got to balance the books. Why? Because Wall Street doesn't want the government spending money. Because if the government spends money, it issues bonds, securities, treasuries that are safer. And if they're racking up enough debt, uh, the interest rates go up on those treasuries. So they compete with Wall Street. Nobody is going to tell you this because nobody understands this, including me. But I understand enough. And again, inflation is a legitimate concern. But Americans need to know the difference between fiscal policy and monetary policy. One is democratic. The other is fascistic. Fiscal policy is democratic. Monetary policy is fascistic. Fiscal policy is government spending. It's transparent. There are hearings and we vote. Monetary policy is the Federal Reserve. 
lowering and raising interest rates. That's the central bankers, the neoliberals who meet in uh, Doha or in Switzerland and conspire uh, uh, on interest rates and the money supply. And it's undemocratic. Fiscal policy is the American people voting on the trajectory of our economy. So inflation is a legitimate concern. It's caused when there is too much money in circulation and when there's too much money in circulation, while the supply of things to purchase is in short supply. So prices go up. If people have a lot of money, they want to buy a lot of things. And if there aren't a lot of things to buy, the price of the things that do exist go up, supply and demand. Right now, we have uh, a strange moment in time because there is inflation that can be traced to supply chain issues, which create shortages, and shortages of goods create inflation, right? There's only, you know, 500 Picassos. So everybody wants a Picasso. There's a, a supply chain issue with Picassos because he's dead. So the price goes up. And we have a supply chain issue, but that eventually will be taken care of. Traditionally, inflation is caused by two things. Government spending, that's fiscal policy, and monetary policy, which is the Federal Reserve raising and lowering interest rates, right? That's the fascistic monetary policy. The Federal Reserve, and as you know, uh, we've never audited the Federal Reserve. It's all smoke and mirrors. You can't have uh, fiscal spending and an aggressive Federal Reserve at the same time. That will cause inflation. You cannot have low interest rates from the Federal Reserve that's pouring money into the economy and a federal government that's spending seven trillion dollars on infrastructure. You can't have both fiscal spending and the Federal Reserve lowering interest rates at the same time. That will cause inflation. So if Build Back Better comes in at six trillion dollars, that's a lot of money pouring into the economy from the government. Uh, now, granted, the government could raise taxes, right? And that would dial back the money supply. You'd be taking money, supposedly, out of circulation as long as the government doesn't spend it. Uh, to some degree, that would cool the taxing, uh, raising taxes would cool the economy a little. Uh, but if the Federal Reserve is lowering interest rates at the same time, it juices the economy and low interest rates mean uh, money is easier to borrow. And when money is easier to borrow, that means new money is being created and new money causes inflation. So there is a power struggle that none of us understand. We're not privy to it. We're not allowed to understand it. It's an undemocratic power structure, power struggle between Congress, which dictates fiscal policy, and the Federal Reserve, which dictates monetary policy. And I would say since 1993, we have pretty much abdicated fiscal policy and turned over the economy to the Federal Reserve. There have been some occasional stimulus packages and some tax things. But for the most part, we have depended on the Federal Reserve to determine how hot and how cold our uh, economy is allowed to go. And that has created the, the, the chasm of wealth between the 1% and the 99%, because the Federal Reserve is Wall Street, it's bankers. They, they only care about the bankers. Ordinary Americans, however, the 99% are, 
would prefer, if they understood this, they would prefer Congress, which controls the purse strings, traditionally. You would prefer Congress to have all the power. Fiscal policy, that's government spending, is better for the 99%. We learned that when Roosevelt became president after the Depression started, we learned about Keynesian economics. And if the government, if the economy is doing poorly, the government spends more on infrastructure, thereby creating jobs. And that jump starts the economy. The private sector takes off. And then if there's some inflation, Congress votes to put some brakes on government spending. They dial back the government spending. Bankers don't want that. They don't want the government jumpstarting the economy or slowing it down. They don't want the government spending money because that means budget deficits, right? When there's a recession, you create budget deficits. And that means treasury bonds, right? And in order to borrow money, the federal government has a deficit. They have to borrow money. They issue treasuries, savings bonds, safe investments, and more Americans will buy, will prefer to put their savings in a treasury bond or a savings bond than they would a risky stock or a corporate junk bond. So uh, corporate America fights government spending. They want to issue the debt. Wall Street wants to create debt. $17 trillion dollars of debt right now for corporate America. They don't want the government issuing debt because Wall Street doesn't get a cut of that, right? They want government bonds to pay nothing, which they do right now. Wall Street has succeeded. You'd be a fool. Well, not really, but uh, you would feel like a fool putting your money into a federal a treasury bond, uh, unless you were going to trade it on inflation, you know, going back. And if you're going to swap the bonds on the open market, you can make money hedging against inflation. That's good for the <clears throat> for Wall Street. But bankers want people to have to put their life savings into risky investments like stocks and corporate bonds. The bankers want the Federal Reserve to create cheap money by lowering interest rates. And if government spending is kept in check, then interest rates on safe and secure government bonds and treasuries are zero, next to nothing. And Americans have no choice if they're saving money and they want to protect it from inflation. They have no choice but to turn their savings over to Wall Street instead of the government. That is the new paradigm Government spending on infrastructure is great for the economy. It's great for business, but it's not good for the bankers and it's not good for Wall Street. Bankers and Wall Street are not our economy. They are not our economy. You can have a, a record GDP, a record GNP without the banks and Wall Street recording record profits. You can grow an economy and leave Wall Street out of it. You can have a growing economy with a stock market that's doing OK, not hyperinflated the way it is now. I don't understand how corporate America could have $17 trillion in debt and the stock market is reaching record highs. It's all smoke and mirrors. And any politician who calls himself a fiscal hawk, is doing the bidding of Wall Street. Joe Manchin says he doesn't want government spending. He says he's against inflation, but what he means is he doesn't want the government to compete with Wall Street when it comes to issuing debt. A fiscal policy, that's government spending, uh, that includes deficit spending. That means interest rates go up on treasuries and savings bonds. 
And so reasonable Americans who work hard for their money and want a safe place to put it, they're going to hand those savings over to the government instead of Wall Street, right? We, do, we don't want the government doing anything, especially handling our investments like a safe savings bond or a safe treasury. The last thing Joe Manchin and the people who pay him want is Americans buying safe U.S. treasuries and savings bonds. And if this is confusing, I recommend you rewind this and listen to it again. Uh, it It's supposed to be confusing. We're not supposed to understand this. They made it more complicated than it needed to be. Keynesian economics wasn't complicated. That's government spending. It got complicated when we turned it all over to the Federal Reserve and chose monetary policy to be the solution to our economy as opposed to fiscal policy. Just know, just know, you need to know this, that the Federal Reserve was set up a century ago, a little more than a century ago, to make our economy less democratic than it already was. When they set up the Federal Reserve, we no longer had a say in the trajectory of our economy that was turned over to the last people we should trust, bankers. Just know that money invested in a stock is money that doesn't exist. It doesn't create anything. When you buy stock in, say, Disney or Apple, you are not helping Apple. You are not helping Disney. You are not creating any working capital for Apple or Disney. When you buy stock on the open market in Disney, it's just being traded back and forth between investors and Wall Street gets a cut every time that paper's traded back and forth. Wall Street makes money. The workers, the, nobody benefits from that. Buying stock in Apple or Disney doesn't benefit the employees. It only benefits the CEOs of Disney and Apple because they are paid in something called stock options, where they're incentivized to make sure the price of the stock goes up. They want to leave. They, they want to get out like Robert Iger, who ran Disney. You know, he, he, he's he got a stock option. And if he can leave with Disney stock at a, uh, you know, he wants it to he wants to leave with the stock price being the highest it can go. So stocks because of stock options, this is how they pay the CEOs. They really don't pay dividends anymore. Most of the growth stocks don't pay dividends back to the shareholders because the CEO, it's in his best interest to take the dividends and just pour it into making the stock price go up. And if the price of the stock goes up, the government can't tax that. If the stock pays dividends, the government can tax that. So corporations invest their profits into stock buybacks. A stock buyback is you take these, this cash that's sitting there, and instead of giving it back to the, the shareholders, they, they instead use this money to create an artificial shortage of the stock. They buy back the stock, and then the price goes up. And instead of paying out dividends, uh, everybody's happy. If you're incredibly wealthy, you're incredibly happy because dividends are taxable, right? Apple, I mean, this is incredible. Apple, for example, I think it's worth a trillion dollars. I'm not making that up. I think it's a trillion dollar company. Uh, Apple is notorious for all the cash it has sitting around. It's becoming a, a bank. One of its side hustles is to lend that money out. But if you're a, a, a stockholder, if you go buy a, sh a single share of Apple, 
the dividend yield is 0.54%. In other words, if you owned $100 worth of Apple stock, you would get 54 cents in dividends on $100. That's as bad as the certificate of deposit. And yet, Apple is a trillion dollar company. Apple doesn't pay dividends because dividends would be taxed by the government. So Apple uses its reserve cash to buy up Apple stock. So there is less to trade and that drives up the share price. So Cook, Tim Cook, when he leaves, will be able to cash out his stock options at record highs. On paper, shareholders think they have money, but none of it is coming their way in dividends and the government gets none of it. The government gets nothing from Apple because you can't tax a, a share price that goes up. You can only tax, tax it when it's sold. You can tax dividends, but nobody pays dividends. If you're really rich, and here's where it gets even more complicated because it's supposed to get complicated. The rich, here's what the rich do. They go to estate planners who teach them and help them borrow against their stock to pay for their lifestyle, right? So let's say you have $100 million in Apple. You can't live on the dividends of $100 million worth of Apple. So you borrow against it. And because you have $100 million in Apple, your interest rates are rock bottom, right? You borrow against it. And then when you decide to pay that loan back, uh, you get to write that loan off. What, what you pay in interest on the loan is uh, tax deductible. So I know you don't understand it. You're not supposed to. I barely understand it. You can borrow your stock without selling it and then pay it back, pay back the loan and deduct the interest, which is why uh, Jeff Bezos had some years where he was worth, you know, half a trillion dollars and didn't pay taxes. That's how rich people live. They don't offer anything to our government in terms of taxes. They just take. They just take. Amazon's dividend yield is zero. If you buy stock in Amazon, it will pay you zero it all goes into moving the stock price up. So Jeff Bezos uh, is worth, I don't know, $250 billion. Uh, and he's getting zero in dividends. So he's borrowing against his $250 billion to fund his lavish lifestyle. And... He's getting a deduction on the interest he has to pay on the money that he basically lent himself. And who gets screwed? The government. Because the government ends up owing him money. He might actually get a tax refund. Amazon, the corporation, rarely pays taxes. Jeff Bezos, sometimes he pays taxes, sometimes he doesn't. Meanwhile, he destroys Main Street, he destroys unions, he pays his people nothing, he offers nothing, he destroys everything. As Bob Dole said, where is the outrage? Where is the outrage? We'll be back, I hope, with comedy writing superstar Dave Cyrus. But first, here is a Christmas card I recently got from Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein, and then we'll be back. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comedy too. To tell a dirty joke, he knows quite a few. He's 
just a lefty from way back. He's a human man with an enemy for right. Some days he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your heaters on right, buckled in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Yes, it's time right now for the David Bell Show. Get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Friend me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. And am I your friend? I have to figure this out. Please welcome, please welcome, comedy writer. You love his work on SNL, he, the king of Staten Island. Let's be real. It's just one big thing after another. Comedy writing superstar. Dave Cyrus. Are we friends? Please tell me we're not friends. I'd like to think we are. I mean, I hope you have some. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah. You hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I like to think we're friends. Okay. If, if we work together, does that make us, mm -hmm. uh, are we mixing friendship with business? Can that be a problem? Well, I mean, mixing friendship with business is kind of the only way anyone makes it in comedy. That's why I didn't, because I didn't want to hang out with other comics. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's sort of just part, it's pretty normal. Okay. People like to be friends with people that can do them favors. Right. Now, what are you doing New Year's? Joe in Norway tells me that office hours falls on New Year's, which means I had an idea for New Year's after he told me that. Uh, New Year's, I'll be in Miami writing for NBC's New Year's Eve special. Oh. And then New Year's Day, I'm either I'm going to fly somewhere. Do you ever stop working? Not really. I mean... So much of work isn't the whole day that it's like, you know, I've had people get mad. They're like, well, why can't you just put time aside? And it's like, because I have tons of time. I just don't get to decide when it is. Right. You can't. It's like you can't be in this business and dictate, you know, terms. You can't only take work you feel like. You can't only work when you feel like. Because Suppose you, know, you, you develop a reputation as being impossible to work with. That way you don't. Yeah. Then you can live a normal life well that's the thing i don't want to be someone who's hard to work with and i've seen people throw away their whole careers by being needlessly difficult just because they are they can't get out of their own way i can think of so many people who had great careers could have had great careers but pissed off everyone they ever worked with is it off, is either it, on set or off set is it normal to write with more than one other person um Kind of. My experience, I've often, I've mostly written with one or two other people at once. However, I've also written in very large groups. But usually with that, it's like the group is there to generate material and then someone makes the decisions of what to use of that. So I don't know if you necessarily call that the same thing of writing with people, but I think that two or three people can work fine. Yeah. Okay. When you have a, a play date, when you mm -hmm. were a kid. Yeah. I didn't really do those, but yeah. Remember play dates? 
sort of. You know, Joshy was coming over to play and you were getting along really well. And then mm-hmm. Benji, Benji's mother came by and it was Davey, Joshy and Benji playing. And then you noticed that Joshy and Benji were playing and they weren't including you. And then you started crying and you went storming into the kitchen and said, Joshy and ben- Benji won't play with me. <laughs> and then your mother would have to go and tell Joshy and Benji to include Dave. And they would roll their eyes because they delighted in kind of not playing with you, making you feel like an outcast. Doesn't that happen yeah. with writing when three people write together or a menage a trois? How many menage no, a trois really. have you had? How, how many, many three individual have you ones been? or how many how many individual ones or how many different um, combinations of people? Well, let's like just start with three. Or how many? I, how many? How many different three person relationships have I engaged in? What are you, you're asking? It's like, it's like you're asking how many? Are you asking how many women I've been with or how many times I've been told? How many threesomes have you been in? I know you're a big Hollywood writer, so it's you start your day with a, a threesome. But um, no, it's been a while. But you've had uh, threesomes. I had, a period of, I had a period in my life where they were pretty regular, not, you know, semi regular. Yeah, right. I mean, anybody a relationship I was in that that was something she wanted to introduce to the relationship, so I was right. accommodating to it. And, and you I know, was just, I was trying to, you know, sacrifice for her. I wanted her to know I would do literally anything she asked. Right. and have sex with other women in front of her. Right, right. And having, you know, lived through the 80s and the 90s, you know that I did everything with everyone because that's the way I am. And Well, I mean, you were raised, you know, in a, you were raised to be a good host. Yes. You were raised by... A, have you really had a, a threesome? Culture. Are you being serious? Was have that? you really been in a threesome? Yeah, I, 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 had a, I really in a relationship where, yeah, no, that was the truth. I was in a relationship with someone who said that she wanted to, you know, explore that without it violating the tenets of our relationship. So I graciously accepted. I, if I sense bed bugs on the sheets, I'm threatened. If, there, if Well, I mean, I feel like most men wouldn't turn this down. I, so. I'm threatened by... Anybody, I'm threat. I'm threatened by a woman having sex with me. I can't even. I, 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 my, I'm so insecure. I just have to have sex by myself. I can't even handle two people on the bed with me. I think it was four. Four people in the same bed. No, 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 no. Four times. You've had four menage a trois, four threesomes. No. No, no. I've had four different combinations of people. Okay. And none of them were were satisfying. They all were. No, they weren't. They, be, they were not. No, they, You're just saying that. But everybody left thinking, I should have learned from the ice storm. This is not good. I should have left this as a metaphor, shouldn't I? I should yeah. have let you continue your metaphor and assume I've never done this because now it's just confusing you. I'm confused that it's to me, it's like you, you, you try it because you've had too much to drink and everybody does it laughing. But it's a goof. And then it suddenly gets serious and you go, well, I'm never doing that again. I don't think anybody well, ever enjoyed a threesome. Um, no, it, it went pretty well. Um, I mean, cause it was basically just, I had a girlfriend who had never been with women, wanted to be with women. And so she began the process of sort of feeling out if she could find someone who'd be interested in that. And, uh, right, compare that was, to the you know, writing I think, process. I, I think the key is that as long as you're just direct about it, as long as you're very, very honest and direct about what you're doing and, and why and with who, you know, people can just sort of move on with their lives. It doesn't have to be a problem. I, I'm not exactly, look, I'm not an orgy guy, okay? I am not a poly guy. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a guy who goes around telling everyone you monogamites are losers. I just, I, I happen to be in a situation where I wanted to be a good boyfriend. Well, I just, I can't believe that anybody has sex with another person. 
for pleasure. Or, for pleasure. yeah, I mean, exactly. I, I just believe sex should be done by yourself to procreate into a, a test tube to hand to the nurse for money. And then you get on with your life. Um, I've just all my whole life has just been do donating sperm. I can't. So the point I'm making is I'm a little flustered now. I, I can't. I don't think yeah, of I really you ruined this whole thing, didn't I? I just I really wish I had not <laughs> acknowledged this. I don't. I, I just think of you as kind of. I don't know. A nerd. Women like you, though. I've well, not, I mean, women like you. I mean. Some have, you know, look, it's not, I'm, I didn't say they were, you know, every, I didn't say I could, you know, have any woman in the world. It's just, you know, no, you're, everyone's got a type. I, women I type like you, reason. women like you and find you attractive. They find you so attractive. They say, you know what? Let's bring someone else into this bed. Let's that's how it, the amount that's of how Dave it, in this bed. No, that's huh? what it is. They, they're like half, half a bed of Dave is, is one thing. Maybe a third of the bed, Dave would be more palatable. Just keep bringing more people in to dilute the amount of Dave in the bed. Yes. Are you getting off on the decadence or the idea of, of the act? Is, is the decadence? Neither. David, it's neither. It is neither the decadence nor the idea. It is the visceral act of sex. There is nothing, there's no pretense here. It is literally just getting to have sex with two women. And thumbing your nose at God. No, you get off on thumbing your nose at God whatsoever. About what? it. It's just it's physical. It's just a it's an it's an instinctual thing, you know, to to thumb okay. your nose at God to to. But how long has it been? Dave? What? Since you have one. Since I donated sperm. No, since you had a, since you had a threesome. Was I don't I don't have married? I've only had sex. I don't have I, I'm too intimidated to have sex with anybody other than a test tube to donate. Have you turned it down? Have you turned down two women saying, David Feldman, we saw you on MTV half hour comedy hour. We've been thinking about this for 35 years. Could you please come to bed with us? Now, honestly, did you, did you see that MTV special? Do you think any woman would look at that special and think, oh, I wish there's enough Feldman to go around for everybody? David, Do you think any David, woman has ever walked up to me after? Like, huh? David, you're a classic daddy. There are so many. You, you honestly, if you would stop wearing the sweatshirts with the collar completely worn out, you might even be bumped up to zaddy. So you really need to understand that there are tons of women out there who, for whatever reasons, whatever childhood they had, whatever mistakes their parents made, are attracted to you now. So, you know, you're selling yourself short. So if I'm if I'm going out with women who are young enough to be my granddaughter. Well, that'd be weird. Right. Or my daughter. Right. The greatest generation had threesomes, too. You can you can I go to them. I, I, I think yeah. it would, I think there's something unseemly about having sex with a woman who's young enough to be your wife. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I, um, all right. So what's going on in the news? I look at you differently now. Uh, so is it, I mean, I, I, I didn't really want to acknowledge it. I just felt like I, I don't want to lie to you here. Uh, you doesn't know, doesn't somebody I get I, cheated in a threesome? Normally, isn't somebody well, getting not, cheated in a threesome? Um, not when done properly. I mean, the whole thing of it is like, without getting graphic, it's just three people. And it's not like, yeah, if, if one person was like kicked off the bed because they were useless, then yeah. But I mean, it's not that complicated. <laughs> it's really not like that big a deal, to be honest. Um, it's just sort of, you know, Hanging out while stuff happens. I think if I were cockeyed, and that's probably why they call it cockeyed, and I could have one eye on one partner and the other eye on the other partner, then maybe I could enjoy it. But I'm not cockeyed. I mean, it's sort of just, I'll put it this way. There's, could you imagine what two women could do to you? I'm worried about what I'm looking at when I 
it's like when I was a kid, I had a time, I had to be very familiar with the episode of Gilligan's Island. So my money shot didn't end up on Mrs. Howell or God that forbid is... the skipper and landed on mm -hmm. either Marianne or Ginger. You know, I met the skipper's granddaughter. Really? Hale? Kind of looks. Yeah, yeah. Her, her last name is Hale. Yeah. Very funny comic. Hmm. They just, you, and when she tells you, when you find out, you can kind of see it. And it's actually kind of weird to literally look at a person and say, you are both very pretty and look like the skipper from Gilligan's Island. It's actually, it's almost a magic trick that she, that she did that. Yeah. It's, it's the grandchild. Yeah. Yeah. Of, uh. Skipper, yeah. The Skipper. Hale, that's right. That her, her last name is Hale, yeah. Right. She's a very funny comic. Wow. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, so look, we all masturbated to Gilligan's Island, David, obviously. Um, Bob Denver. You know funny? Bob Denver old, was a piece of ass. You know what's funny about that? The older I get, the more I like Ginger. I think when I was a kid, I like Marianne. Oh, whoa, 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 is that a joke? No, it's not. When I was a kid, I think I liked Marianne more. No, 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 no. Like no, 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 Ginger. Nobody, nobody, you're supposed to be turned on by Ginger. Well, first of all, you're too old, you're too young. Well, that's what I mean. When I was a kid, I wasn't really, I wasn't romantic. I, I mean, I wasn't like sexually, uh, you know, event, like aware yet. So I liked her, but I wasn't like sexually, I couldn't be attracted to someone. Then as an adult, I was like, oh, Ginger's so much hotter. Yeah. And who were you attracted to in Mikhail's Navy? I never actually watched Mikhail's Navy. Carpenter? I'm sorry. But I'd love to play this game with other 80s shows. I, I was attracted to George Ballantyne from <laughs> Mikhail's Navy. I never, I never saw Mikhail's Navy. Actually, Claudine Langer was the girlfriend of Tim Conway, Ensign Parker. And do you know what Claudine Langer is famous for? What? Destroying... Spider Savage's uh, skiing career. I but she didn't do time. Is, sorry. This is this, this is stuff. That. Okay. Spider Savage was a uh, famous a Olympic villain. skier who Claudine Langer, who was married to Andy Williams, she had an affair with Spider Savage, and she was cleaning the gun while pointing it at him, and he ended up. Uh, falling. That's why you should. That's why. Honestly, that's why they say you should never clean a gun. Never clean guns. Now, what about Alec Baldwin? Did you see the interview? Well, yeah, that he explained that uh, he did not pull the trigger, but that he pulled the hammer back, and because it was an. That, my, my, I didn't see the interview. I read about, it, but that because it was an antique gun, this is a fairly common problem. The hammer instead of simply going back to the rest position, went all the way to the point that it fired, that it hit the firing pin, that yeah. the firing pin hit the bullet. Yeah. Um, like, I, look, I told you this before, I don't think Alec Baldwin is the person responsible here because I've seen a million movies where the camera shoots down the gun barrel. It's just a common shot. So it's like, I can't act like everyone who's ever agreed to do that was a criminal. I think that as producer, he's more responsible than as an actor. I think the producer of a movie but though he said he wasn't he wasn't in charge of the production more the dialogue but either way like i said same with travis scott i think travis scott the the, the owner of the of the concert is responsible in a way that the performer is not if you know what i mean um i think it's very interesting that the script supervisor is suing uh because alec did make a fairly damning assessment of that which is that she's suing to get the money before the family of the murder victim gets it and if so that is disgusting but also the idea, I'm still confused by the idea of what exactly is she suing for? For witnessing a crime? Right. I'm right. very, very confused by that. And uh, if Alec Baldwin did not pull the trigger, which there are some people corroborating, um, it does lower his culpability. But I feel like it was already fairly low because the problem is everyone's saying they would have checked the gun. But... A, a blank looks like a regular live round to an uneducated eye. So he could have checked it and, and, and someone would have said, oh, that's the blank because they thought it was a blank, right? And only the armorer can tell the difference between those two. I, look, it would be very insane if no one went to jail for this. 
I just don't feel like that's Alec Baldwin. Yeah, I don't think he's going to go to jail. I think he's going to be sued. I think it's going to be ugly. And I, I think that's fair. I think as producer, he should have some monetary responsibility. He should have to compensate the family in some way. And there, there's, just something, there's, just, there's something careless about it. But uh, all right. No, this, we, as produce, if he wasn't producer, I'd say different. But as producer, I really do actually think that like everyone who was in a position of power on that set should be punished in some way. Because everyone, because it, it filters down. The armor is the most responsible. She's the one who made the biggest mistake. Next to the person who actually put the live round in the, the, the box of bullets. That's the person who committed murder or at least negligent homicide. But everyone there who is in any way responsible for safety, for just the overarching idea of safety, has some level of responsibility because you're supposed to run a tight ship. And when there's guns, and you have to be more careful than that. It's, it's like a construction site. People die when there's just a little bit of distraction. Okay. I didn't want to say this, but I'm going to say it. Have you ever held a gun? Yeah. Not during a menage yes. a trois. Uh, no. Okay. I have held a gun. And when I'm you hold a gun, when you hold, wh wh wherever you stand on the assault weapons ban, if you hold a gun, you know that you're holding death. And yeah. if you don't know that you're holding death, there's something seriously wrong with you. There is something seriously wrong and careless about Alec Baldwin. Every time I've handled a gun, my knees went weak. I had a friend who I was over there and he whipped out a handgun and started playing with it. And he kept spinning the drum, it's empty, it's empty. And I left. Even though he said, it's empty, yeah. it's funny. And he was like, point, I, I couldn't believe how sick this person was. He was pointing, he wasn't pulling the trigger, but he was pointing an empty gun at me. And I said, I'd never want to see this person again. Okay. George Clooney said that anytime he's handled a gun on a set, he was aware that he was holding death and he held it at, you know, arm's length. And they opened it and they and everybody looked at it and you never pointed at anybody. You can point it at the camera, but not at the camera person. And I had said, well, it was pointed at the camera, right? No, no. He blames. I said that this was going to happen by the time we're done with this story. It's going to be the cinematographer, the dead cinematographer's fault. And Baldwin couldn't even wait till the trial before he blamed the victim. He said- but I said before, the fact is, if she was not the person who was killed, she would be one of the people that they're saying is responsible. Just like the director. The director got shot. Doesn't mean he's not at fault here. So they're gonna blame, they're already, bl I said oh, this I was gonna happen. I said a lot of people here deserve blame. But he blamed the cinematographer. He blamed the victim who said, pointed towards my armpit. Do you, think she's lying? Do you think he's lying that she said that? It doesn't matter. She shouldn't. It's not her fault, because if somebody says, point the gun at my armpit, you, he, what is he, 63? He's been doing this for 40 years. He knows you don't point that effing gun anywhere near a human being. That's the protocol. And that's what George Clooney pointed out. It's not the cinematographer's fault for for if she did in fact say pointed at my armpit he should not he should have corrected her if he was point do you yeah, think he would have somebody said if he was if it was a suicide scene and he had to point the gun at his head do you think he would have looked inside the gun and double checked yes well probably not honestly no i think because he wasn't intending to pull the trigger he probably wouldn't have to be honest um but i also think that there is something disingenuous here, which is, look, the fact that she got killed is horrible. And I'm not saying she caused her death herself, but you just said, if she said, point the gun here and anyone but her died, we'd be talking about her going to prison. Right. 
just like everyone else. You know that. Baldwin's a bad guy. And he's bad because, because he... Because I mean, he, I'm, like, I'm not going to speak for him as a person aside from this. He's a bad... Because he presents himself as a Democrat. And I'm a Democrat. I'm left of center. And, and he's a fraud politically. He, and his... You know, he can't wait to attach himself to all the politically correct notions that I believe in. But he doesn't believe in it. He believes in himself. And by the way, he, but all, this year he also came to Andrew Cuomo's defense and said there has to be an end to cancel culture. Canc he said with Andrew Cuomo, cancel culture is going too far. You know. Well, yeah, he was wrong. He shoots his mouth off. He, and as I said wrong. earlier, he when he shoots his mouth off, he should shoot his mouth off. What? I'm sorry. Yeah, look, I, mean, I know you don't like Alec Baldwin. You very well may be right in the assessment of him. I just think we have to look at this very analytically. We have to look at this and say, you know, who's responsible for our movie set? Because to me, this is not that different from the catch a bullet trick, where a magician gave a guy in the audience a gun and said, point it at my face and shoot me, and I'm going to catch this bullet in my teeth, just like I caught it yesterday and the day before, and that day something went wrong and the guy died. Right. But they didn't talk about, they didn't say, oh, well, he pulled the trigger, so he's ultimately responsible. Because he's not. Right. The person who orchestrated it was responsible. Right. And, the guy, and that's the guy who died. You know that story. Yeah. We talked about that, right? So I was going to have Smigel doing Trump trip. today. And I was on the phone all... I, we have to wrap it up. I was on the phone with Zoom. Mm -hmm. If you look at the YouTube feed, it, it looks like it's being shot on a, a Dumont camera, a camera from the Dumont network. And I've invested maybe six hours of phone conversations with Zoom to six fix. hours. Jesus, that's like four percent of the rest of your life. <laughs> I don't have six hours, but uh, thank you, Zoom. Uh, uh, we'll be talking tomorrow. Uh, thank you so much for wasting my time and not giving me what I wanted. Another unsatisfied customer. I can't live stream this on YouTube. Unbelievable. What I'm do you sorry. do? I, I got to go. I got to go. I'm Dave Cyrus, fantastic. I apologize for the mood I'm in, but it's, uh, you know. It's fine. If you want to see, if you want, if you want to see more about my threesomes, just go to my OnlyFans. Uh, thanks, David. All right. Dave Cyrus, how do people follow you on Twitter? Uh, Dave Cyrus, D V E. S I R U S, same as Instagram. And where are you performing next? I don't freaking know. Um, I guess, oh, well, doing Netflix as a joke in April in LA. Wow. So I think that's going to be on Netflix. Wow. Um, I should probably book some stand up bits to, you know, some, some gigs to prepare Great. for that. Thank you, Dave Cyrus. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Dave Cyrus. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Let us now go to Los Angeles for Howie Klein, founder and treasurer of the Blue America Pack. And he writes down with Tierney. Are you there, Howie? I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Did you, you get my email a few minutes ago? Yes, I did. Uh, I'm going to have to set up the call. So why don't I? Is, is he standing by? Yeah, yeah, he's standing by. I'll, I'll, I'll babble while you do your setup. No, I have to do it on the phone. So what I'll do is I will give me two minutes to set this up, and I can't think of a better time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna lower your volume. We'll be back with Howie Klein, and he's gonna bring on a special guest. You're listening to the David Feldman Show, DavidFeldmanShow.com. We're gonna listen to uh, some music from the great. Professor Mike Steinel, who's going to be joining us a little later on. Are you there? I'm okay, so let me. Gourmand of the art of romance. The, because I'm doing, I have to put you on hold now and call him. Okay, I'm adding you. So, okay, so you're going to be on hold. Hang on. 
okay? Okay. My appetite's rapacious, but my capacity is dim. I seem so audacious, some call me Gentleman Jim. But when all is said and done, and the push comes to shove, I'm a to none, cause I'm a pig for love. Oh, what do I have here? What did I do? Oh, Howie, are you there? All right, so I have to hang up. Uh, I got his answering machine. So let me end this. All right, add call. Is this Lauren? Oh, great. It's David Feldman. I'm going to put you on with Howie. There we go. Okay. And give me one second and then we'll we'll start. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mike Steinell. And I forgot to turn the sound down. So uh, we played that song on Friday. Somebody was singing along with it because I didn't turn the sound down. And uh, you heard me talking over Pig for Love. I apologize, Professor Mike Steinell. Now, Howie Klein, are you there? I'm here. I'm here. Howie Klein, founder, treasurer of the Blue America PAC. They raise money for great candidates. And I think you have a candidate you're going to be introducing us to. Yes. And we're doing something experimental today. So normally when I bring a candidate on, I already know them. I talk to them. You know, we endorse them. But we have a long process which we, we are for vetting candidates. So today... We're going to get a candidate live on the air. Never been done before. Oh. And, uh, and, and, and there's a real news reason for doing this, which is that uh, Devin uh, Nunez decided he's quitting Congress. So when I say he's quitting, I don't mean he's not going to run again. Uh, he is not going to run again, but it's more than that. He's just leaving. And he's leaving his, um, you know, his constituents high and dry. Now there's going to have to be a special election. He was, uh, he was afraid to uh to run because his district has been redrawn uh, to make it a, a nice safe blue district and he can't run in a district like that so uh he's so he went and begged trump for a job trump get, trump gave him some make-believe job uh running uh, his uh, media company which doesn't even exist except there's a grift that's now being ex um being uh investigated by the sec F sec securities and exchange commission uh, for the, for the, all these frauds that he's perpetrating on people. I mean, he's got a billion dollars uh, in investments for nothing. There's nothing there. In any case, Nunez isn't running. Uh, the the DCCC is, uh, you know, has their uh, conservative candidate like Kirsten Cinema with pants on, a guy named uh, <laughs> Phil Arbalo, who ran last time and lost badly. Uh, and um, but there's a progressive running, and that's who we're going to be speaking to today. And that's Lauren Hubbard. So, Lauren, are you there? I am. Great. Well, welcome back. Uh, he and I were in the middle of a conversation, uh, and then I realized, oh, we could just do this on the air with David. So, one uh, instead of me talking about you, since I don't know that much about you, why don't you, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about you? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, a little bit about myself. You know, I, I grew up not too far from the district uh, down in, in Bakersfield. A little. 
uh, about 45, about an hour south of the district. Um, you know, one of these, uh, you know, grew up very blue collar, uh, had a single mom who, who really worked hard to instill in me um, uh, a love of education and, and to care about people. She was one of these folks that worked in a hospital. Um, she was SEIU. She bled, bled purple. She was uh, uh, part of SEIU, um, UHW for the health workers. And that's kind of how we grew up is, is, to, is through the lens of, of uh, a working family um, that really got our start through education. So she went to um, uh, a community college. And I remember her going to community college when I was in junior high, like walking downstairs at five, four or five in the morning, seeing her do homework. She ended up being the valedictorian of her class got a job at a hospital and, and that really, that hard work was put into us. So my sister and I, I grew up with a, a younger sister and education was that, that uh, point of social mobility. She always stressed to us knowledge was power and that's how we were going to get our power um, in life is, is through education. And, and because of that, I'm a lifelong learner, um, decided to dedicate myself to public service. So I went to uh, Fresno State, got my degree in political science, and immediately went into public service. I started with the Department of Social Services at Fresno County, uh, working as an eligibility worker, getting people uh, hooked up to the same benefits that my family used, uh, Medicare and food stamps to get by and make ends meet. Um, from that, I transitioned over to the state of California and worked as a pensions and health analyst for uh, the state of California for about six, almost seven years. And now I'm an operations manager at the Water Resources Control Board. So I'm on the front line of conservation efforts and really how we trying to solve the problem of how we get not only water to, to our communities that desperately need it here in California, but also to fix the water quality problem that we have in California. Because we have communities that uh, are very similar to like Flint, Michigan. You know, a couple of years ago, we had Flint, Michigan, where people were literally being poisoned by the water that ran out of their faucets. Well, we have that same thing in a lot of the rural communities in our valley here in California that are getting highlighted because they are black and brown communities. And is this the kind of thing that you want? I'm, I'm assuming this is the kind of thing that you want to address uh, when you're in Congress. Absolutely. That's the two, the, the, the three biggest things that we're running on is a platform of, of, of universal education in terms of uh, being able to go to college and afford it, but also to uh, go to trade school and community college and be able to get a trade and get a career. Um, another platform that we have is universal health care because a healthy society is a better society. I think we can agree on that, that, that health care is a human right and folks should not be living like, uh, again, my own story. Uh, my mother uh, actually passed away my junior year of college. She didn't didn't live to see me graduate. She passed away. It was one of those things in life where she was, uh, you know, she had health insurance, but with her prescriptions, um, did not have the adequate coverage for her prescription so she stopped paying for them. we had other bills and she was the same time she stopped paying for her her prescriptions she's also sending me money at school like you know here baby i got you some gas money and this and that and come to find out i would have totally traded the 150 bucks 200 dollars a month that she was sending me for gas money and stuff like that as a parent to have her with me here today to meet oh. her grandkids you know, so that's one of those things that that influenced me in, in going to public services, paying that forward. But the other, the the third pillar of our our platform is really highlighting the areas of um, of of our valley that have been ignored in terms of uh, water resources and allocation of resources in general. Um, you know, we have places up and down the valley, uh, Seville. Uh, East Orosi, where people cannot turn on the the faucet and drink the water that flows. I've gone into classrooms, have seen classrooms with sparklet bottles of water stacked up because the kids can't drink from the drinking fountain. 
you know, that's not how we should be living in 2021 in what I consider the the greatest country on earth and probably the best state in the said greatest country on earth. Um, that's just not a, that's something I'm, I'm willing to stand to have happen on my watch and say, I didn't do, do anything about it. So. And did New Year's ever try to do anything about that? It's his district. Um, not to my knowledge. You know, he's very, he was very concerned about making sure that his, uh, uh, funders the people that that his donors the people that fund his campaigns in form of large ag corporations got their water allocations a lot of the the reason why people can't drink the water that comes from their faucet is is because of pesticide runoff from ag um that didn't ever seem to be his concern in the 18 years that he served as the congressman in the area so I have, I have a question for you. Earlier, I, I uh, re- referred to uh, Phil Orbel, Abalo, the guy who ran last time. Can you can you tell uh, me and the, and the listeners how you're different from him? I mean, I think I refer to him as a you know a Joe Manchin, Kirsten Cinema guy, you know, from their <laughs> wing of the party. But but why don't you tell why don't you tell us how you see? Uh, I mean, why are you running? It's, I mean, this is a guy who you know, ran last time, uh, raised $5 million last time, um, which is pretty tough. And although he lost, uh, he's running again this time. But what makes you different from him? What, why is it that you think that you have a better chance uh, to win this race? Uh, I think the difference between me and him is, is you know, uh, I call it performative uh, politics. Um, in, in my opinion, you know, I voted for him in 2020 in the general election. He did not earn my vote in the primary 2020. Um, he is his messaging boiled down to vote for me. I'm not Devin Nunes and ra- ran five million dollars worth of ads about how he's not Devin Nunes. But, you know, the, the flip side of the coin is like, OK, but um, what the, who are you? Um, and, and, you know, these, the, the more I've learned about him um, in, in getting into this race, the more I could see my initial uh, concerns were warranted. Um, he's he's a very performative person. Um, he sits there and says, like, you know, I, I've, you know, I went to Fresno State. I, I did this and that. And, you know, Fresno State. He probably went there for a little while, but, you know, didn't graduate from there. You know, I'm, I'm from the Valley. He's from here, uh, but also just moved back in 2019 to to run for the seat. You know, he ran for city council in 2019, 20, early 2020 when he got here. Um, and then, you know, was kind of come in third in that race and subsequently um, decided, oh, I better run for Congress because nobody's running for that yet. And so he just seems like to me a very disingenuous person and i think we need a little bit more than hey vote for me i'm not this guy um i i I don't trust politicians in this area who think that they have to run like republicans and say talk like republicans to try to get people who are only going to vote for republicans it's like you know we live we're in a, a rural district and and if you don't wear cowboy boots you showing up in cowboy boots and trying to like and wranglers people could see through that we we could see people could see you know when you're genuine and so uh to me uh i think that um my biggest difference between him and i are are these things are real to me these issues i talk about uh those kitchen table issues because they're real to me uh when we talk about child care the need for child care my wife is a registered nurse and she went back to work uh, eight days after having an emergency C-section with our oldest child because she did have had not started working at the hospital long enough to have that leave. Uh, you know, last year with the pandemic, my wife and I were considered her as a registered nurse and me as an ops manager for the water board were considered essential employees. And we had to pay twenty thousand plus dollars uh, last year to have child care so that we could both work. Um, during a pandemic where we're supposed to be essential. Um, so these issues are, are front and center to me. Like these things that I care about. Again, the, the message of knowledge being power. I think we, I work with data at the water board, right? As an analyst. 
I think we can see through data, we have evidence that when you have a, a society that's educated, that they have better outcomes in life. Um, I always get the message as a black candidate, you know, what is what is your thoughts on on defunding the police and try to get caught up in the narrative of that? And and I try to point out the fact that, you know, not as you know, black people, we call the police too. We just want them when they show up not to kill us when we are the ones that call them. And there's got to be a middle ground between that, uh, between calling the police and them not showing up and calling them, calling the police and then them showing up and then ended up killing me who called them for help in the first place. I think there's there's middle ground there. Um, but again, when we talk about education, we can re- invest the resources in education. When you, statistics, again, I know that data is a pesky thing that shows when you have an educated populace, they're less likely to commit crimes. That helps the police. So we're very data driven in our in our view when it comes to these policies. Um, and I just think my, my, my message boils down to this is that a government that is made of the people and by the people should work for the people and that we have seen time and time again these these investments go into into business in the form of tax cuts for the rich and not to us and i think it's time that we start saying and start demanding hey we're the american people we make this country great now it's time for us to get our share of that how are you going to get this message out in you know the far-flung areas of the district like lindsay and tulare and visalia uh, how how are people going to hear about it? You know, I mean, we we have had discussions. Uh, my campaign manager is a, a Latina woman, and um, we've had discussions on how we can best reach rural voters and, and get our message out to some of these smaller districts. And um, it starts by you know by meeting people where they're at. So when we talk about doing advertisements and stuff, we are focusing on making advertisements um, in Spanish by native Spanish speakers to Spanish readers so that it doesn't come off again as performative, that we're wanting to to make sure that we're taking the time when we send canvassers out to go register folks and, and get them registered to vote, that we're taking the time to uh, make sure that we're checking the box if they're Spanish speaking or if they're Hmong speaking or if they are Punjabi. And we're taking the box to check, take the time to select the box of the language because I've had conversations with folks that have had people come out and talk to them and they got registered to vote and they were very excited about it until the time came when the ballot came and they speak Spanish, everything's in English. They're having to talk to their daughter who's trying to translate the stuff for them and tell them about it. And they just got frustrated. They told me they threw it away, didn't even vote because. The people that went out there didn't take the time. So that's what we're doing. And it's, it's we're doing very, uh, you know, old style campaigning. We're going out to places and just setting up with a, at the park with a speaker and some pamphlets and going out and talking to people. It's really kind of a, I would think, it, you know, we did some stuff in Dinuba and um, in in some of the South, South Fresno, that's really kind of more of a listening tour instead of a, a out campaigning. It's just going out and like getting the feedback from people and just getting, hearing their experiences and finding the commonality in our stories. And, and the reason why we need a, a representative who has that shared life experience with the people that they're going to be representing. Do you, if, if you get into Congress, do, 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 do you see yourself uh, as part of the Progressive Caucus? Um, I see myself as the California 22nd Congressional District Caucus. <laughs> um, and, and, and what I mean by that is, is ultimately, you know, we're there to represent our districts. And that's what Joe Manchin um, says. That is what Joe Manchin says, but Joe Manchin's full of crap. He doesn't have, he doesn't, he doesn't do, uh, you know, people in his district are telling him they want this. And he's saying no. It's very clearly donor driven and not people driven. Um, 
So uh, at the end of the day, my goal is to build relationships in order to get the legislation that my district wants and needs passed. So whether that is to um, to to caucus and meet with these folks or or meet with the uh, I, I, I highly doubt anybody in the Republican Party. They can't even get infrastructure passed without, which used to be a very Republican thing, without getting death threats by their own party members. Um, but it is it's who's going to help me with my ultimate goal of getting the things passed that my district needs. Um, and so I would I would I would, say, I would say I'm more closely aligned with the with the progressive caucus, um, folks like Ro Khanna and and. Um, AOC and, and and the things that they're pushing for, I would almost, I'm almost kind of critic, uh, a, a critic of them in the sense that you know I was one of these folks that said maybe we should use some of our influence to to kind of still have a conversation around universal health care in in terms of the uh, House leadership uh, speaker votes and stuff like that that were going on. Um, but at the same time, I, I see the, the benefit of, of building a relationship. Um, so at the end of the day, what I found in this race in particular, having um, talked to, uh, having staff that's met with the DCCC is our race at the beginning of this thing back in June was not on their radar. They were focused on red to blue house flips in red states, and they thought this was unwinnable. Um, and I see that up and down, up and down the board when it comes to rural districts that the Democratic Party has just forgot. They don't want to make the investment in. And so I think what we've seen is we've been lacking leaders and candidates who are willing to fight back and either fight back on narratives or find common ground with 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 people, um, not only in our district, but across the country in, in building uh, a consensus and building a relationship. So that's where I would start is ultimately the people of my district. Um, I have the, the, the integrity to say they've elected me to this office. I'm going to do what I think is best and then go back and hack town halls and, and get input and get feedback uh, from the people in the district. And then it ultimately explain you know what? We had a vote on this. This is why I voted this way. These are where my values were when I voted, took this vote and um, lay it out there. And if it's a, if it's a situation where I'm a one term congressman, but we got something significant like a, a universal health care plan through. I'm OK retiring <laughs> after that, if I. If that was my 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 swan song was the one vote and the country came away with universal health care, that would be fine with me. <laughs> I noticed on your website, the very first thing on the website when, when you go to the issues page is uh, Medicare for all. And when you're now talking about universal health care, you mean Medicare for all, right? That's what I advocate for. Mm hmm. Medicare. Do you think that, do you think I am, that I am, popular? I am, well, I'm open to how we, to coverage for every American. I, I am open to how we, to head to discussions on how we get there. I think that's the health, the Medicare for all is the best way to get there. Um, but I'm open to the discussion of it. Um, do you think that that's a popular, uh, idea among the people who you're trying to attract uh, to vote? I think what I think it is actually, um, and in the conversations that I've had with people that are both um, on the the left side of the political divide or the right side, but the issue that comes up time and time again has been healthcare, because people on the left that are are, are more left thinking, um, you know, see it as a as a moral issue, as a as a human right. And the people on the conservative side of the issue know or have a story that they have been, um, you know, toyed with by an insurance company, or that's ran them through the ran them over the break them over the coals. And so, when it comes to discussing healthcare, it depends on the audience. But the issue of healthcare is number one when I talk to Republicans and Democrats 
um, and independence um, in this district. So, do you mind if I ask okay. a question, Howie? Oh, sure. Go right ahead, David. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for coming on the show. Uh, <clears throat> Medicare for all is uh, my biggest concern. You, I happen to believe that you cannot have Medicare for all unless you outlaw health insurance companies. You cannot have Medicare for all unless you say health insurance is no longer being sold in America. Would you support that? Uh, I, 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 I do support it. And when I talk to people on the conservative side of the aisle about this issue um, in terms of, of what I call classical conservatism. You know, like putting, putting uh, health insurance companies, saying to outlawing the sale of health insurance, we maybe supplemental health rid. insurance, but making it making it illegal to sell health insurance in America. Absolutely. We've got to get rid of the profit motive in healthcare. It's one of those that I call it in the, in the system, uh, the belief that the free market will provide health insurance. Uh, we have the free market now and it's not. So that is a, 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 a good example to start with. We have to have the for-profit health system out of, out of cut out. I'm sorry, but it has to be gone. People right. are getting, getting extravagant, extravagant. Right. And, uh, and you see, the, do you see the problem. Not we're, care. We're, I don't mean to be rude, but we're running out of time. But you know that there's a difference. Do you agree there's a difference between free health insurance and free health care? Oh, absolutely. Right. Well, that's one of the things that, that, you know, getting to the platitude of people that that say, um, you know, I'm from for everyone having access to care. Uh, well, yeah, and people have access to care now. <laughs> right. I, I, how, um, I, you know, I, I know I'm being rude, but we're coming up against the clock here. Abolishing ICE. Where do you stand on the abolition of ICE? Can you name one good thing that ICE does? I can't. And so that's why I am for getting rid of it, uh, especially. And, and, you know, I make the conservative argument for it of, you know, it was a, a gross expansion of of. Uh, the government and government intrusion and oversight. Um, so the people in my district who uh, advocate for that on, on other issues, when I make that argument, have nothing to say about it. So, right. And my uh, last question, then I'll I turn it that. Last question, I'll turn it over to Howie. Did the Taliban attack us on 9-11? Did the people of Afghanistan, did the government, did the Taliban attack America on 9-11? No, I think it's very clearly that we, we know now. I mean, we knew then, but we know for definitively now that uh, most of these hijackers, if not all of them, were from Saudi Arabia, a country that we uh, see as our greatest ally in the Middle East. So the Taliban did not attack us on 9-11? I don't believe so. Right. Are, are you willing to say that? Are you Are you willing to go on record... Because no politician, no elected official, very few will say that Afghanistan was a lot. The war in Afghanistan was a complete and utter lie. I am and I have. I, I, that, that's, you know, I, I remember seeing the rockets launch off when I was a, a kid in school that we right. were marching over there for. And no one could explain to me as a child why we were there other than 9-11. And then you grow up to learn. That 9-11 wasn't done by these guys. They were just evil people that, you know, we had to to use our military to protect our corporate interests in the Middle East. And we have done so for the past 20 plus years. And that's the reason we were there. Howie, we, we have to wrap it up. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm being not here. a problem. Not a problem. Lauren and I are going to uh, continue our discussion uh, on the phone, but just between us uh, in, the, in the coming days. And then. Uh, Hopefully that'll uh, result in a Blue America endorsement. But right now, Lauren, how can people who are listening on the radio help you? Yeah, so I've become uh, really accustomed as a person who's not a politician to doing this wrap-up part here. Um, and if you want to help us, uh, we absolutely, uh, you know, are very grassroots or organized. You know, our campaign's funded by regular folks like you and me. 
Um, and you can do so by going on to my website at Lauren Hubbard, L-O-U-R-I-N-H-U-B-B-A-R-D.com. You can sign up to volunteer. You know, we really need those donations so that we can get our message out to folks in this area, in this district who desperately, desperately need help. All right. Well, let you and I talk. I sent you an email a little while ago. And David, I'll see you next week. Thank you, Howie. Thank you, Lauren. And read everybody over at Down With Tyranny. Read Howie over at Down With Tyranny. Thank you both. When we come back, we will talk with a presidential candidate. David Cobb ran for president on the Green Party ticket. And he was Ralph Nader's campaign manager in Texas. And he's up to a lot of stuff right now that will make Wall Street very unhappy. You're listening to The David Feldman Show. We'll be back after this. David Cobb is about to join us. I want to address a problem we're having with Zoom. I have had a problem with Zoom for three weeks now. The pixels look like it's a camera from the old Dumont network. I have invested several hours on the phone with Zoom troubleshooting this. And one of the things I love about work is when you're working, it removes all other worries, right? And I feel that, you know, I'll spend a little extra money on Zoom, on my Zoom account, so that I don't have to worry about my work, my tool. And Zoom is a, an international corporation and they have no problem taking my money. But when it comes to fixing a problem on the back end, when I call on a Sunday and say, I'm doing my show on a Monday, let's get this problem solved. They say they're gonna call me back and they don't. And then I even try to cancel. I call billing to try to cancel my Zoom and I can't get billing on the phone with Zoom. Uh, Anybody who says that corporate America is more efficient than government is an idiot. You are a fool to think that a corporation will treat you better 
then the government will. Corporations rob you of your time and your money. Anybody who tries to privatize a public good is a charlatan. Any Anybody who thinks government is inefficient is a fool. Joining us is David Cobb. Sorry, David. I'm David Cobb. I'm just, you know, I don't ask for much out of this life. I really don't. I just want my tools to work. Simple tools. Tools that that become a necessity like Zoom. Airlines. You know, I didn't want to fly, but they made it so you had to fly. You have to use the Internet in order to feed yourself. Zoom is a necessity now. And they can't do the job for me. How do you deal with this nonsense? Oh, uh, well, uh, not with uh, not without the uh, occasional venting, which I just heard from you. So, you know, no apology necessary. Uh, uh, and I will completely agree with you, uh, David, that anyone who believes uh, that capitalism is efficient uh, does not understand what capitalism is. Uh, the reality is that the, the economic system known as capitalism is actually quite efficient at enclosing wealth, power, and decision-making authority. Uh, it is actually a terribly ineffective way to actually get shit done. Uh, and uh, so I, like, uh, as you were going along, I found myself in basic agreement with you. Uh, and I also think it's, it's really worth pointing out, David, uh, that the... Uh, uh, you know, whatever the technology is, right? Because, like, you know, it doesn't matter. What, 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 where, where my head went was when you were engaging in your frustration is the recognition that if anything becomes like a, a genuine public need and an infrastructure, it should literally be democratized and actually under democratic control for the production and distribution of that resource. And I agree with you, the internet is a public infrastructure, uh, just as water, just as sewers, just as roads, we should treat it that way. Right, we'll, we'll move on. The other thing that I find really annoying is they, and I think Ethan Hershenfeld talked about this, the people on the other end of the phone, customer service, are forced to say what uh, scripted lines that take up time. So I'm working against the clock and you say, well, the pixels are down to two, uh, 240. I need them up to 1080. Well, I'm very sorry that this is happening and we welcome your uh, business and we're going to and and after a while, you realize they're torturing you. And, and, and then you just want to scream, you know, cut out the cut out the small talk and just fix it. Right. But but again, to be clear, the person on the end of the phone is not torturing you. Right. Like uh, the, the 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 scripted algorithm that they are making this person pay like parent is what is torture us. Yeah. So I just again. Right. Like, the systems are the problem, and and like, but but so. the, but but what happens is it's hard to it's they 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 don't allow solidarity because the customer service people you end up getting angry at customer service as opposed and and then well yeah no, that, and that's I what they want. At the end of the day, uh, remember that the the way that this system works is that they are extracting the surplus value of the labor of their workers. That's all they care about. This is why the uh, it's worth naming. You know the 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 corporation, if it is a person, is a sociopath, and the uh, the, the 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 data is pretty clear that. Uh, the number of sociopaths who are in fact successful 
CEOs of transnational corporations is sort of off the chart, right? right? Like, so you you, again, everything I heard from you cor- corresponds with my lived reality. With and, la- and, 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 and then I'm going to be quiet and I apologize. I bought an ab, one of these ab rollers to do sit ups through some company and they just dump, they send it to me. Stephen Hawking's couldn't put it together. I looked at it and I thought, nobody could put this together, no instructions, and now I have to spend two hours walking to a FedEx store to ship it, to find the receipt, and I'm thinking, I don't want to. I don't want to own anything. I, 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 something as simple as an ab roller that you don't even have to plug in. I can't get that to work. I don't want anything. I don't. This is what I've been telling my listeners: just stop buying shit. Everything you think you need, take a deep breath and and order it the next day and see if you still want it. You know what, David? you're onto something here because I, I actually did and this was about 20 25 years ago uh, uh, I forget the name of the book uh, on it it doesn't matter uh, but but actually I had this insight that m- almost all of my purchases were impulse purchases that were a function of being trained uh, and addicted to consumerism and materialism, right? Uh, and it's like, like the, the reality is that there's a special place in hell for advertising executives and uh, the artists and culture workers who make up that industry because our society has taken our alchemists, our best storytellers, our best artists and enticed most of them, not all of them, but most of them to, uh, uh, to 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 sell us right and and here's the thing, David. Like, like I want to give me give me space because I want to lay this out. Yeah. Because I think that uh, American citizens are the most tested group of human beings who have ever walked uh, planet Earth. There's no doubt about it. And like they know what makes us tick. They know what uh, what we want. And as my niece has taught me to say, what we really, really want, right? That's the uh, Spice Girls. The Spice Girls, that's right. That, that shows you how old my nieces are too. Uh, but here's the thing, Feldman, like we're told that what people want are big fancy cars and they, they da da da. But actually what the data shows, what we want, what we really, really want, we want human connection, uh, we want uh, meaningful, productive work for which we, we we will be respected and applauded. We want to be desired. Uh, we want a fair amount of sex, uh, which I would argue is back to the human connection. You know, what humans actually want, when you really break it down, uh, it's actually rather sweet as the hairless apes that we are, right? Like what we want is like connection, we want to, 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 to both make offerings and receive offerings. What we really, really want is beautiful. And there is a special place in hell for these advertising executives who say, okay, let's take what we know that they want and then we're gonna package it and, and, and exploit insecurities uh, and teach them uh, that in order to get those feelings that they want, they have to actually have things and stuff that we will sell to them. And it becomes, not only is it an addiction, but it's a crack cocaine addiction because the addiction is only met in the moment of acquisition, not even having the damn thing, right? So there is a very, very powerful, dangerous thing that is played. We're old enough to remember, uh, Feldman, when the Sears and Roebuck catalog, right? like. Remember, like it used to be to advertise something, you were supposed to describe what the characteristics of the thing was and what the cost was. That's not even how they do it anymore, right? Now it's this whole like, what it, it feeling is evoked. And if you spend the money, you can get this kind of feeling and it's all bullshit. It's all it's a all- story. Everything, that you're, the product you're buying has a story. Correct. And what they do to keep us buying things is they don't allow us to have a place to live 
a job, food, health care, security. If everybody had a safe home, a guarantee of an education like other countries have, food, no food insecurity, no threat of eviction, then and and open spaces, a park where you can go and talk to one another and dignity, you wouldn't work so hard. You'd actually you you'd you'd put in you'd say, you know, eight hours a day is enough. What am I what do I need all this nonsense for? Well better, I'll tell you this. People would work, but it would be different than the job, right? I think I made this point to you uh, once, uh, you know, in an earlier conversation. But it's worth pointing out that the 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 root of the word work literally simply means meaningful, productive uh, human activity, right? The word job actually began as a slur or a, an insult because you had to sell your labor. You were not self reliant. So this is the thing: we want to work by which we mean to have, to have meaningful, productive human activity. What we don't want is a job where we're exploited, oppressed, pushed around, bossed about, right? So what I'm saying is if we actually organized our society, which we are absolutely capable of doing now with automation, technology, robotics, if we organized our society democratically, where basic human needs were met, which you were just describing, I would argue that not only would more people be much happier, but actually more work would get done, but that work would include poetry, it would include art, it would include stand-up comics, it would include like it would include all any number of things, right? So to me, this is what is so vicious about a system that has pitted us against each other uh, rather than because like the, the real battle is not between left and right. The real battle is between the pyramid, those at the very top and all the rest of us. And what they've done is got us in pitched battles with one another so that we're distracted from the fact that the billionaire class uh, are actually in cahoots with one. Yeah. You know, I live in the most evil slice of land, the evil, an evil spit of land called Manhattan. There's nothing in Manhattan. The reason I'm so pale is you go outside and they say, give me 20 bucks. Just to step outside, it's 20 bucks. <laughs> and there is a place called Sotheby's. And it was my little secret. It was an auction house. And they had a coffee shop where you could go and it was on the fifth floor. And it was a little secret that I knew about that you could go sit like in a snowstorm. I could go over to Sotheby's and drink coffee and see a view that is only, you know, only Woody Allen movies. You can only have, right? And one day they do renovation and I discover that the coffee shop at Sotheby's is now in the basement. And you literally now have to look up at the pedestrians walking. Granted, some, you know, in the summer, it's not a bad view. You know, so, you know if you know what I mean, uh, you've got a dirty mind. But I thought so. They, so. So I actually when I, I went over to Sotheby's and I go, where's the upstairs cafe? Oh, it's in the basement now. And I said, I want to speak to your manager because I know, I know that when you built this building, you had to get an easement. You had to promise a public space. And that coffee shop was a public space and people forgot about it. And I said, what happened to it? And they said, it now belongs. It's now the office for our uh, president. So one human being gets the view what i said really so one person now gets that view and the rest of us can't have it and the person you know it's just a somebody working at sotheby's and they say well that's just you know and and you can't you know who am i i can't well, i'm gonna say i'm gonna take my business elsewhere from i'm not gonna buy your your coffee from sotheby's 
<laughs> it was like I had one little thing going, one little nice place in New York City. There is, there, like, the, 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 remember that uh, for the capitalist, uh, there is only one answer to how much is enough, and that is all of it, right? Like right. That's literally how the, the, the system is designed. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and the capitalists are they're competing with one another to get all of it. Right. It's like that's literally uh, what's happening. So, you know, David Feldman, when you tell that 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 narrative, I mean, on the one hand, it, it, it may seem trivial. But and on the other hand, what I would say is, isn't it illustrative? Like this is literally how they do it. This is how the system works. I'm in an and air shaft. My only access to a, a nice view of New York City was at Sotheby's for a cup of coffee. It was one, you know, in New York, there was always these little secrets of, you know, if you, at Sotheby's, if you go get coffee for $2, you, you can sit there all day in a snowstorm and see what Woody Allen sees. And, and one guy wanted that view. He turned it into his own office and the rest of us have to go live, have, are in the basement. I hope he goes blind. I hope the guy who runs Sotheby, I know that's the wrong thing to say, but I hope he goes blind and he needs a seeing eye dog to describe the view. I, I shouldn't say that. You shouldn't say that, but your frustration is understandable. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll use my, uh, my developing therapy skills. Dr. As long as people are going blind, as long, if, if somebody has to go blind, you realize there's a masturbation joke just <laughs> Hello, Dr. Harry. Uh, yes. Hi, Dr. Fr Harriet Fraud joins us. Go ahead, David. I'm sorry. So uh, before we get away, hello, uh, Harriet. And I, I know you get a lot of email, uh, David Feldman. So I want to make I sure saw that it. you. Yes. We want to give my slot at some point. Uh, to Dr. Ellen Brown so that uh, we can have her on because last week we had a great conversation around public banking and I did my best and you know I think I'm I think well. I, oh thank you but I know that uh, like Ellen is a personal friend she is the expert she is the absolute expert and I think that she deserves to be heard by your audience and so uh, let's 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 David you you good with this let's yeah whatever you want I'm yeah I, we could do another slot. We don't have to give up your slot. We can give her her own slot. Well, well, yeah, because those banking revelations are just amazing. And I didn't realize, I didn't know it either. And we're all so ignorant. We know we're ripped off. We know we gave their the money to the bailout and then they just made sure that they could charge us for every little thing and get away with it. But we didn't realize that they make so much money on everything and they don't have to. I mean, that that was amazing. And again, like I, I for me, Dr. Fraud, the, like I still remember it was and it's a fairly recent, like within the last, say, five to 10 years, something like that, that when when with the first person who told me about fractional reserve banking and how, uh, you know, private banking consortiums literally create money. Like the first time I heard that, I said, that can't be right. That's a conspiracy yeah. theory. Like mm -hmm. I still remember. And then I looked into it and the more I looked into it and it's like, oh my God, like this, this is like, it is a, it is a fraud being carried out in plain sight. It is a public theft, uh, what private banks do to literally control the, the like what gets financed and 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 what gets funded uh is it's it's obscene and it is. I, I am really excited to bring you know again like folks uh, who are listening and are watching you know i i'm proud of the role that i played with the california public banking alliance and we talked about that but there is a a growing public banking movement in this country to democratize finance itself and it can it really is a game changer and it is like 
everyone knows who knows me knows I'm an unabashed revolutionary. I want to restructure society. What's exciting to me about public banking, it is a true non-reformist reform. It's a reform that is well within Overton's window. That is to say it can be done right now. It is being done right now. And it ultimately undermines the logic of capitalism. It has the potential of literally transitioning into a new political economy. I'm so, I'm a I'm a I'm a believer in public banking. And they also it's also achievable because to some extent they have it in France. They have the bank at the post office, which is as certainly as popular as other banks. Iceland nationalized its banks after they all tanked in 2008. I mean it, it's not unknown in the world around us. Oh, listen, that's exactly right. So uh, there are many, many national banks. And uh, it's also, honestly, Dr. Broad, I tell people all the time, like, so in this country, we're the only industrialized country in the world with that universal health care. We are overworked, like in by every reasonable, uh, you know, uh, material way to, to judge, we are actually horrifically underperforming and under uh, under-resourced. And what, like, is it because we're genetically defective? No, because we have systems that are actually preventing us from having- And are mitigated. I mean, one of the things is we're not only losing the material base of a decent life, we're losing the emotional base too, because without the unions, that you're without the bowling league, without the group, without the cohesion, without the connection, that we don't, we, we don't join each other without the vital political parties, without the presence of an alternative, so everybody can get active. It's without the social fabric that wraps us all in a sense of security and possibility. We have the most divorces in of the prosperous countries too, because it's hard to keep a family together if there are that many strains on you. And the most child abuse and sex abuse it's, you know, we have huge problems of moral problems and emotional problems. We have the most people in jail. We are the only ones that don't have abortion rights fully. You know, that there's a whole raft of basic protections that we lack on it's, an emotional level and a, a financial level. The uh, We're talking about the opiate crisis in this country and the Sackler family and more Americans have died from the Sackler family than all the Americans in every war we ever fought combined. Not a, one single member of the Sackler family is behind no. bars. That's right. And I was no. thinking about the values that are foisted upon young people. STEM, science, technology, right? Uh, math, engineering, engineering. Math. and you have to fit the mold. And if you don't fit the mold, this is what they tell kids, especially like kids in South Central, you either get good at STEM or where are you going to go? You're going to end up on the streets. That, that what we have teachers now scaring kids straight. Like, you know, you don't if you don't work, you don't get the grades, you're going to end up on the streets. And, you know, the, with you, you internalize that message. I'm no good because I don't fit into this s s square, this circle. I'm no good because I and you turn to opiates, you turn to drugs because society says you're of no use because you're not good at STEM. And also you turn to drugs because you want something to look forward to. And this there's is, nothing else besides that high. It's really, there's so many threads here. First, I wanna lift up, there's this phenomenal book by Putnam uh, called Bowling Alone, which really was an eye opener for me. The second is uh, uh, I want to just address Rodrigo, who had asked me to just say a word or two about uh, the Green Party, and like, I, I, so I'll take I'll take advantage of that, and then I want to make sure to to entice Dr. Fraud to tell us uh, just a bit 
uh, about uh, the uh, uh, Rat Park and what we can uh, what we can learn from Rat Park, right? Because I feel like that'll that'll really get us there. So so very quickly, Rodrigo uh, has asked me uh, to just talk a, a bit about the Green Party. And I, it, folks on this podcast know I, I rarely do, right? But I will say this. I'm a Green because I believe that we need to restructure society, and I think the Green Party is the current best avenue to actually get it. In fact, I would say that folks who think that they are being realistic uh, by being in the Democratic Party are actually making a profound unrealistic mistake because they are they are ex they are doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results that's a capitalist party it is only it, it like every other establishment party it exists to to protect and perpetuate the establishment right so if you want transformational change it's actually quite simple to describe very hard to do but here's the recipe it's a two-part recipe one you need a mass movement that is broad deep conscious educated and engaged together so you need a mass movement and you need an electoral arm that will advocate at the ballot box and when elected uh, enact policies that reflect the values of that mass movement, right? So again, a mass movement and an electoral party. Doesn't have to be Democrat and Republican, but I'll tell you this, if you look at systemic transformational change, not just quibbling at the margins, not all, but most of the big systemic transformational changes were incubated and initially proposed outside of the so-called two-party system. Here's the list of what it took so-called third parties, which I'll call alternative parties, to advocate a ballot box. You ready? Here it goes. One, the abolition of slavery, women getting the right to vote, the creation of the Social Security Administration, unemployment insurance, workers' compensation laws, pure food and drug laws, ending child labor, the direct election of the United States Senate by actual voters instead of the state legislature. For goodness sakes, y'all, the entire fabric of what most of us today would consider the bare damn minimum for a just and compassionate society, that was woven together by so-called third party activists who did their work when they were called naive and unrealistic, who mm -hmm. did their work when they were called dangerous on Americans, and who did their work when they were called spoilers. So today, if you wanna live in, not just talk about, but actually live in a world that will treat healthcare as a fundamental human right, that will actually protect the dignity of the worker and allow uh, working class people to have a, a, a rich, meaningful life. If you want to dismantle the World Trade Organization and the the the, the the entire apparatus uh, globally that has created this nightmare, if we actually want to live in a world that will stop empire and get us back on track, I would submit to you, you've got to have the same courage that others did and engage outside of the two-party system. Yeah, so, well, the mass movement as well as a party, because you need... You can't have, if you have a mass movement and no party, then you just change hearts and minds, but you don't actually elect any, uh, you don't codify anything. And if you only focus on electoral politics without the mass movement, then it's forget it, right? Yeah, it, and the genius of FDR was he took a cue from the mass movements, from the millions who were joining the CIO and put an end to child labor and, and the, he put in the National Labor Relations Board. And he listened when the Iowa farmers were lynching bankers who um, foreclosed family farms and people were in pitched battles in the streets, which we don't learn about in history. He had the Small Farm Recovery Act. He responded these people don't respond. They respond only to Wall Street. I will tell you, Dr. Frost, I sometimes when I allow myself to, to fantasize and to imagine what might have been, mm -hmm. I imagine what might have been if FDR's first vice president, Henry Wallace. Wallace, if he had taken Henry over Wallace. as FDR wanted to. And well, here's the thing. Do you know what, I'm getting chills. Folks, history matters. 
Henry Wallace, uh, and look him up if you don't know who he is, but he he was a, an unabashed socialist, a, a version of democratic socialist uh, in the 1930s, responsible for so many of the reforms. Uh, and here's the kicker. He was the VP, the vice president, but at the convention during uh, FDR's last term, he was jettisoned by the Democratic Party operatives. Why? Because the ruling class of the Democratic Party were afraid FDR is not going to live. We can't have this guy who's championing working class people uh, and championing workers and who was an advocate of both farmers and uh, industrial workers. We can't have him as president of the United States. And they literally forced FDR to take Henry Wallace off uh, the, the ticket and put Harry Truman on the ticket. Like it's, it's, it's a, I mean, again, what might have been if, if we had actually had a taste of what democratic socialism. That's right, of what America could be and what possibilities there were during the New Deal, which was big government. That's, that's what Reagan was against and all of the rest of them, big uh, government. That's what saved us, big government. We can also say, you know, democracy, this is the thing that really gets me. And, and I, I appreciate that David Feldman and the people on this uh, uh, program consistently push back against the narrative that government is the problem. Like mm -hmm. government done correctly is us. Like it's how we're supposed to be making political economy dec decisions about our political economy. How our society is structured is supposed to be through a democratic process. And to me, what pisses me off is when I see uh, like liberals and even progressives fail to fight the big picture narrative. Like big government, like is like look if if by big gov like big government, big corporations like. No, 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 no. The question is, is it democratic? The question is, like, do ordinary people get an opportunity to meaningfully participate in the decisions, right? That's what matters. Yeah, but also, as soon as big government started really serving people, then after FDR died, they had the Red Scare. And Reagan came, comes in against big government, destroys the union movement, fires all the flight, the air traffic controllers, and government becomes the enemy. People don't see government's the puppet. Right. right. Let me give you and some numbers here. Spring, there's corporate America. When the riots happened in New Haven in the 1960s, Yale, a multi-billion dollar corporation, didn't bother with the government, they're only puppets. They dealt directly with the people in the movement that were that emerged after the riots. Let me Why give you some let me give you people. some blind not let me describe a government to you and you tell me what kind of system the country operates in. Okay? The this is a government whose budget is in nine in twenty twenty Six point six trillion dollars, which is thirty one percent of its GDP. So thirty one percent of this country's GDP is its federal budget spending. What kind of country would that be? Would that be a socialist? That sounds like a hybrid. That kind of spending when thirty one percent of the spending of the, of the gross domestic product, 31% is what the federal government spends. That's borderline socialist, isn't it? Yeah, well, look, Germany is now. I, I'm de obviously, I'm describing, I'm, de I'm describing America. Right, except America spent $8 trillion on losing Afghanistan. And that $8 trillion could have saved America. Sad. So... It, it, it's not about fiscal austerity. The people, it's about transferring that spending $6.6 .6 trillion into the bank accounts of the ruling elite, 
who are propped up by that evil federal government. The reason they demonize these fictitious welfare queens is somebody on welfare is depriving the ruling class of money. That money should be spent, be given to me. That's right. And Clinton, the big liberal, gutted welfare worse than anybody. And, you know, he claimed to be a feminist. He, and who was kicked off welfare? Women and kids. Right. You know, it's like his wife who claimed to be a feminist and yet wanted people to get twelve fifty an hour instead of 15, whereas 66% of fast food workers and minimum wage workers are women, often women with children, the poorest people. That these people have a class interest in maintaining the primacy of those who control the society who are rich. The billionaires made a mint. They, if you invested $10,000 in the munitions industry before Afghanistan, you'd have 100000 now. Right. And selling arms to the world so people can kill each other all over the world and the armament companies can make money. And then on a, on a national level, you have the NRA posing as a nonprofit that has, instead of saying, buy guns, make the gun manufacturers rich, it's buy your manhood, enhance your manhood. Feeling down, shoot somebody. And then you have Ethan Crumbly and his parents. You know, Ethan Crumbly killed those four people in Michigan and wounded another seven. And his mother was an avid Trump supporter, writing several notes to Trump to thank him for his gun policies. And now they they were on the run. What what happened? They were on the run and then they were finally caught. Why did they go on the run? They went on the run because the school called him in when he was caught in class looking on his cell phone to buy ammo. And he explained where we do gun sports in our family. And yet they sent that note home saying this concerns us. He says it's doing gun sports. They said, yes, we do gun sports, which they sure did. Then on the day that he killed all those people, he left a note on his desk with a picture of a bullet and a dead person blood everywhere and uh, LOL, it said, and emojis of an emoji of people laughing. And it said, help me, I can't make the thoughts stop. Help me, blood, blood. And so the parents were called to the school immediately. And he told the teacher, this is a video game I'm designing. And he had never had any disciplinary problems at school. The parents failed to mention that they had just gotten him a gun for Christmas and gave it to him early. And in their house, they had these semi-automatics unlocked and loaded with ammo. And they said, oh, yes, he's creative. He does video games. And they said, well, you have to take get him counseling within 48 hours or we report you to um, Child Protective Services. And we want you to get him out of this school now and take him home with you and they refused. And because he had no prior disciplinary action, they left and he went to the bathroom with his knapsack, got out his semi-automatic and killed all those people. And the parents who were very much his apologists they interrupted some of their messages. The father reported when they got home, they reported the gun stolen, the gun he had taken to kill all those people. And um, the father said, I think my son has it. And the mother sent a text to her son, Ethan, saying, Ethan, don't do it. That looked sort of suspicious. So they decided they'd get out of Dodge. They went and they hid in a commercial building basement. But since they're so stupid, and there was a a manhunt for them, man and woman hunt, since they are stupid, they parked their car outside of the place where they were hiding. 
and that was advertised what their car was and somebody turned them in. So they were caught and they said they were only hiding because they expected to be unpopular because their son killed all those people. Amazing. But they took $4,000 out of the bank to go before they went into hiding. So they were considered a flight risk and not allowed to go out on their own recognizance. So they're in jail, according to their son. What's exciting about this case is for the first time, the parents have been arrested. People get an idea. For some reason, the obvious becomes uh, becomes true, just like with the, the priests. Everybody knew they were molesting people all over the lot, but maybe because of the incest speakouts of the women's movement, calling out and also the calling out the Holy Fathers, mm -hmm. which translated, and the Me Too and the Time's Up, that these realizations perk down so that people can see and acknowledge the obvious. And what I hope they can acknowledge is children are not safe just because some woman got knocked up. She's not capable of taking care of the kid and neither is the guy who knocked her up. That's bizarre and it's a non sequitur. And they're questioning the family, which is very important because Americans don't have the protections that other people have. If you had any history of child abuse or trouble, you have a social worker assigned to you for five years in France, and you learn about sex through relationships, not through biology or not at all, which is what, you know, there's only 17 states that allow biologically accurate birth control information. You don't learn about anything. We are starting to crunch down on abortions Whereas in all the other developed countries, an abortion is part of your free health care. And so I think Americans are beginning to see the obvious. Hmm. Doesn't logically compute. You got knocked up, you're going to be capable of caring for 24 hours a day. I don't think so. This child was in the hands of his parents, these gun enthusiasts who are not only obviously stupid, you know there's a manhunt and so you park your car in front of your hideouts, but they're also crazy. Well, there, I'm getting, I'm seeing some interesting pushback to what you're saying in the chat room. They raise some interesting, mm -hmm. I agree with everything you're saying, and I think the people in the chat room agree with everything you're saying, but there is a problem when children are raised by the state in terms of sexual and emotional abuse that right. that there Just is like a legitimate the concern that the state there is. right there is a legitimate concern but if anybody ever did the research in um, the soviet union they had these amazing colonies for children because they were thousands and tens of thousands of orphans after the World War I plus their civil war. And they set up children's colonies where children ran the whole thing. And it, they were amazing. And they ruled their own colonies too. And when a kid came into the colony because they were caught stealing or something, they'd meet him with their own brass band and give him a uniform that they made. And there was a whole empowerment also, they have an organization called Kitez, where kids live with different families, and they can change families if they want. And the whole arrangement is around the development of children. And there, I, I, I don't mean to be rude, but there were no Lord of the Flies you know, moments the there? there? Look, there are, it also was a spirit of hope the kid, there was supervision, there was hope, there was a sense of building a new society. You know, it was a different time. Even right. after the war, the UN set up these refugee places for children because, you know, tens of thousands were orphaned. Right. And they grew up with each other in these homes together. And they basically prospered. There isn't much information on this. I researched it. And they don't want to look at alternatives to the nuclear family. 
in Hungary after the war, they found that babies could interact closely with up to five consistent adults and form deep relationships. And that was very important. They, every child needs love, they need attention, they need to be held, they need to be talked to, and there always has to be supervision and accountability. Where there's sex abuse, like they were in those Catholic orphanages and rampant violations, <clears throat> there's no accountability. <clears throat> it's all within right. the hierarchy. Right, right. The, the family... Americans haven't even allowed it to be part of our consciousness. So that's what I'm excited about. They actually are, are have arrested those parents. Am I wrong when I think of the family unit? When people talk about the family unit, I feel like saying, with all part of my French, F your family unit. F your traditional family unit. It is what it is. And there is no such thing as a family unit. You're, you're raised by your grandmother, that's a family. You're raised by your mother, that's a family. You're raised by your father and his boyfriend, that's a family. I don't want to hear about the family. I'm that's sick, right. especially this time of year. Go F your family. That's just this maudlin right. harking back to a family that never existed. If right. you read uh, Mark Twain, Huck Finn's father tried to kill him. That's why he right. wouldn't run away. Right. And it was treated lightly, you know, okay. The child abuse has always been with us. And children have always run away and been killed and so on. And they are regularly, if you read the newspaper, because people have a frustration. So what is the role Freud? The baby cries. How much culpability does Freud have in all this? Because he trained us to believe that the mother and the father imprint the child at an early age and everything in the future for that child is acting out the unresolved conflict with the mother and the father. It, it puts so much burden on the mother. It does look only at the nuclear family, but also there's a book called Psychoanalysis and Revolution by Ian Parker and David, somebody, Quaylar. And it turns out that they had free clinics. Freud was not a radical, but he did insist that they have free psychoanalytic clinics. And in the United States, when these people got here from Germany, it was they caught on. None of that stuff. If you so take it wasn't as backward as you say. Plus, he did talk about the Victorian family. He never questioned the Victorian family, and he should have. Also, he has that whole Oedipus complex that the, the um, girl sees herself as a castrated male and is jealous, and the boy gets solace that he can't have sex with his mother because he, he will be a man and be able to have sex with a woman, and the daughter says, I can be a mother like my mother. This is all, it's all chauvinist bullshit. First place, kids aren't all about the father. The father's hardly ever there. They're all about the mother and the breast and feeding. That's crap. And I know in my house, which certainly wasn't a male supremacist household, my daughter had a herniated navel, so it stuck out. And she would lord it over her older brother and say, poor Maxie, you have no vagina. Ha, ha, ha. And, you know, pushed around that she had everything, right? Right. Because kids want it all. Right. They don't want only one. They want it all. Right. And it, you know, he transferred a patriarchal society's initiative on a nuclear family where the fathers were even less involved than they are now. I had a so very weird. Wow. That's crap. Dr. Fred, my Oedipal complex was very, uh, I fantasized about killing my father and my mother and then sleeping <laughs> with both of them. That was my. <laughs> but I'm sick. I'm just that was my Oedipal complex. So t children who are raised without the traditional mother and father at an early age, they go through oral anal phases, just That's like right. they go through the developmental phases. 
And, you know, you could look at it in the kibbutz, you could look at it in these post-World War II successful child-rearing things, not places where they just dumped kids and they didn't get any interaction. And so human interaction, so they didn't develop because they had failure to thrive. Can a child, I know that Socrates said that children should be raised by the state in, in the Republic, he said. You take a child and in a kibbutz, the child really, I guess, identifies with a mother and a father, but is really raised by yeah, a group and of... Yeah, and identifies with the other kids in the kibbutz. One of the reasons that I think the French have such a, a more active political society is that... The, it was a demand in the French Revolution that state support for children. How the Nuclear Family came about is amazing. It's a book by Jacques Donzelot in French, very slow reading, but it's called Policing the Family. After the revolution, there were all these orphans. That women were getting, you know, people weren't under the rule of the feudal father. They went off the estates, they went into the countryside, and there was no law and order. And people had all these demands in the revolution. And after the revolution, they were desperate. And so the remaining the remaining powers of the society, which were the remains of the feudal aristocracy that hadn't been killed, the remains of the Catholic church that had feudal lands and were still rich, and the new bourgeoisie got together and thought, holy shit, this child state child rearing, who's gonna pay for it? We're the only ones with the money. So they invented the nuclear family. The father has the responsibility, so we better not go on strike too much. The woman has, and he, but he gets to be the lord of the manor, of his own little house. The woman gets protection from pregnancy, and the children are chattel. You can use them however you want. You can rent them out. Okay. But the father has to protect them. And they only gave employment to families, to fathers who were had dependent wives and children, and they totally rewarded that and punished other forms. And they still have in French society an excellent child care system and the demand for it. And so children grow up with their peers in child care centers. You can have your baby in child care from seven in the morning to seven at night in France. Right. And when you get the baby back, they're fed and they're in a nice clean outfit. But most kids aren't brought up that way, but they go through their lives in a group. So they have a sense of the group, not the omnipotent people who you have to figure out in order to survive. We're, we're, um, we're, we're out of time. I have one final question I wanted to ask you. We hear about the great resignation. We hear about a national strike. There was talk of a national strike last month in the United States. I'm not seeing that happen. What about a, a boycott? What, what about Americans waking up and saying, I'm not cheated. And when I am being cheated, I'm not being cheated out of McDonald's or nonsensical toys. What if the American people said, I'm only for a year, I'm only going to buy what's necessary, but I'm not going to participate in this nonsense. You'd You'd need a unified movement to get this across. You need a mass movement of which that was a platform. What we don't have is a mass movement with a party to represent it. What I envision is, you know, an umbrella with a central post being class and changing arbitrary divisions between people on the basis of how much money they have. And all the spokes being all the other issues. The climate is the spoke and the fabric, the racial justice movements, the sexual justice movements, the feminist movement, and so and the disability movements all around a central unified idea no arbitrary divisions between people we all deserve a chance and no one deserves 
five gazillion chances while other people have not. Great. Then, you know, then you could have movements and the mass of people would go along. Okay. We don't have that yet, but yeah. it's coming together. The pieces are on the jigsaw. The jigsaw puzzle pieces are on the table. And if they came together, we'd have what we need. It's very hopeful that way. Right. They're all there. Dr. Harriet Fraud is the host of Give the... I was going to say, give them an argument. Is the that's uh, <laughs> Ben Burgess's show? It's not just in your head and With Max Golding and Liam Tate, right? And also capitalism hits home. And capitalism hits home. How do people contact you? Hfraud at gmail dot com or harrietfraud dot com on the internet. Fantastic. Oh, okay, it, it's an honor. Thank you so much, Doctor. Har- Thank you. We thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to have you on the show. You're listening to the David Feldman Show, and Dan, do you want to? How are you doing, Dan, on Community Billboard? We have uh, Professor Hussein, and then we have. Why don't Why don't we do Community Billboard right after Professor Hussein? Does that sound good, Dan? Okay. Uh, I think that's what we're going to do. We will be back with Professor Adnan Hussein. But first, let's try to listen to music from Professor uh, Mike Steinel without any interruptions. I was talking over his last song, so we'll play, if I can find it, where am I? Okay, we're going to play a... uh, Okay, is that how we're going to do it? Here, hang on. Bring all to front. No, there we go. Okay, we'll be back with Professor Adnan Hussein. But first, some music from Professor Mike Steinel. <laughs> I'm a poor scene gourmand of the art of romance. I'm a maestro of the boudoir when I take off my pants. All of this is true, all of the above. I wouldn't lie to you, cause I'm a pig for love. Appetite's rapacious, but my capacity is dim. I seem so audacious, some call me Gentleman Jim. When all is said and done, and the push comes to shove, I'm second to none, cause I'm a pig for love. Others won't come close Cause they think I'm suspicious Please pardon me If I'm somewhat repetitious Like a hand in a glove I'm a pig for love Yeah, I'm a pig for love He's a pig for Welcome back. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Joining us 
is chairman of the religion department at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. And he is also the co-host of the very successful and popular Guerrilla History, along with the great Henry Huckamacki, who will be joining us a little later on with a, a fabulous interview, along with Jackie the Joke Man, Martling. It's good to see you, sir. I wanted to ask you about Erdogan and mosque attacks. I wanted to ask you about the new president, Raisi of Iran. He's coming in. He's got 100 days. So I'd like to find out how he's doing and what's going on with uh, Israel, delaying some settlements, all those kind of things. We usually get to them before it's too late. We usually discuss Yemen and something bad happens before we discuss that. But I want to ask you about something I brought up with Dr. Fraud, and that is a consumer strike that uh, you're a parent and it seems like trying to unionize is a monumental task here in the United States. But to organize a consumer strike, to say to people, stop buying things that are bad for the planet and bad for you. Would that hurt the would that hurt us? If we did, if we two thirds of this economy in America is what we buy, would we be punishing ourselves by saying, you know, I I don't need anything other than a couple of indulgences, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna reject all this nonsense. Is that a bad idea? Well, I, I don't think it's a bad idea from the perspective <clears throat> of ourselves that we could use less, we could put less emphasis on spending and acquiring things and perhaps more emphasis on social relationships and community involvement. And these would all probably be really beneficial for us in our lives and sense of happiness. Um, and of course, reducing the amount of um, fossil fuels uh, we consume and energy that is used to produce all of these goods, um, much of which uh, just gets thrown eventually in some landfill or pollutes the oceans or, you know, there's a lot of reasons why our current level of consumption contributes so much to the degradation of the environment and the, and the planet. So, of course, reducing, I mean, there used to be that phrase, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Recycle was the last component of a set of approaches towards consumption that would be more sustainable. You know, you don't need as many things as you actually consume and purchase and acquire, and you could reuse a lot of things. And, um, of course, finally, if you can't do those things, you know, eventually you uh, recycle them. Um, so I think there are a lot of good reasons, of course, to want to reduce uh, our consumption. And of course, this is the holiday period where there's so much gift giving and purchasing. And I think some people are a little fed up with um, the way in which the culture just, you know, um, almost seems to compel uh, people to buy things that they know the people they're giving them to won't even necessarily want or appreciate, but you have to get somebody something. And, you know, th this kind of culture, we're at a high point of consumption, um, but there's so much of the economy that's based on it that if we just dramatically cut back, of course, there are going to be 
consequences economically for small businesses, for, you know, employees in the service and retail. And so we have since I think World War Two with the Keynes, you know, kind of turn of how to kind of fix the economy um, under capitalism, it turned toward a consumption oriented economy in order to circulate and have that high velocity of the movement of money through society in order to overcome some of the obvious weaknesses of um, the capitalist system. And it seems like we've become addicted to that approach and orientation in the post-World War II period. Um, and it's very hard to wean ourselves from that. Now, the other point of you were mentioning is comparing it, however, to concerted political action through a worker organization. Now, if the goal is for political and change for democratizing workplaces or reorienting this economy. That I'm a little less um, optimistic that consumer-based political action um, would have the transformative effect. It can be used in targeted ways, like if there's a company that is doing something really awful and a campaign develops around boycotting that company, uh, you know, it could it could do something about changing that company's behavior. But in terms of changing the way capitalism works and making it a more egalitarian society that protects people's rights and moves towards, um, you know, a, a more holistic understanding of our um you know, interdependence upon one another, uh, that I, I would be a little less um, convinced that it would yeah. have that. One of the things that surprises me is the way I was raised and the way my kids were raised. We didn't go out to dinner when I was growing up. It was a, you know, a special yeah. treat to go out to oh. dinner. And if I went out to dinner, I wasn't getting a Coke. And, you know, there was... Uh, it, it, you know, uh, it's a given that you're taking your kids at the very least to Subway or to a fast food place just for the convenience of it. For you know, There's no time. It's in between soccer and, you know, whatever. And so we have to stop off at Subway and buy. And then you know, you're looking at 20 bucks here and 20 bucks there. That's one thing that just shocked me. Uh, about, you know, packing a lunch uh, mm. and being prepared when you leave the house to have food with you. That's uh, the other thing that shocks me is the idea of buying stuff for people, as you said, that they're never going to use but it's the the mere the thought that counts the 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 activity of just buying something the thing that really shocks me is somebody drinking coca-cola when i was a kid everybody knew coca-cola was evil it was poison everybody knew sugar was poison there are no consumer advocates in America anymore. There's nobody coming on the TV warning you against buying things. People are, it, it, it's not in the best interests of news organizations to have somebody come on and scold people the way they used to have. They used to have labor reporters and they used to have a scold who would say, this is a tooth. I'm going to put it in this glass of coca-cola and we'll come back in a week and see what the now the business model new york times wire cutter they're on strike over at the new york times you know what wire cutter is it's how yeah the consumer rating uh kind of uh, column or or part of the new york times that that uh recommends what's the best uh, in any category to buy. And then they have an affiliate link. So you buy it through Amazon and the New York Times recommends this Amazon product and they make millions of dollars saying, hey, the New York Times says buy this thumb massager to, you know, for 500 bucks so you can give your thumb a massage. It 
the New York Times, it's not in the New York Times best interest to tell you don't shop on Amazon and don't buy crap. Uh, there has to be a cultural shift. I think it falls on people like me. Well, there was a big cultural shift. You're absolutely right. I mean, um, growing up, we almost never went out to eat. It was a big deal. And we went to these Bob's Big Boy type places. Right. You know, like, uh, no, there was no gourmet kind of foodie experience. I mean, maybe uh, in some elite circles, people went to fancy restaurants and, you know, uh, I had not had salmon until after, you know, maybe sometime in college, like I'd never had salmon, you know, the, all these dishes and things that have just become staples and part of people's regular, um, you know, eating culture. Uh, were kind of unknown, like cheeses. I knew, you know, processed cheese. I, there was Velveeta and there was the orange stuff, you know, <laughs> in the plastic wrapping, you know, and right. it was so sort of cheddar, but they called it like American cheese. Right, and, right. You know, so these kinds of things, uh, definitely, those were not healthy ways of eating. So it's not like I'm endorsing that we should continue with that. But a lot has changed. But one thing it seems that's important or interesting here is that uh, when we think of consumption patterns, this gets back to what uh, Catherine Liu was talking about, about the PMC, is that, you know, there's been great variety offered. And this became the ideological, uh, you know, balance of forces in the Cold War. It's like, well, you have choices here. And so we developed more and more choices to convince us that we were free. We were free people because you could choose Coke or Pepsi. You didn't just right. have to have the one kind. You know, you had Burger King or McDonald's, you know, right. Whopper right. or Big Mac. And so and then that's just the basic sort of things uh, that now we've got a proliferation of consumer choices that, of course, it's wonderful. There are you know, great options. Quality has improved uh, and so on. But I think actually um two unfortunate things have happened which is one that our politics has shifted towards consumer uh choices it's a personal politics of what you choose to express as your ethics and your politics by what you purchase by what you wear by you know that kind of thing and that's a very unhelpful politics that has made um even countercultural uh elements of style and so on become absorbed as just one of the many range of options that you have to express yourself in consumer capitalism everyone's a rebel everyone's a you know a creative free thinker everyone's you know and you show that by the choices that you make um in this dizzying array and some people who are uh, overwhelmed by the uh, array, which I am always, you know, I like consumer reports and wire cutter because if I want to buy something, there's like 40 choices. Right. And, and so you end up having to research and it takes so long to just get yourself uh, a lawnmower or, right. or something like this. Right. So it's all of your time and energy goes into these things about expressing yourself as a consumer. Are you a good consumer? Are you a bad consumer? You know, uh, what do you, what's your ethical position on the variety of options? All of that. That's a very PMC kind of approach to politics. It doesn't lead, you know, very far. Um, and then the second, you know, kind of um, aspect of it, I think, is that, um, you know, it has drained... Um, uh, you know, it has drained, uh, I, I guess uh, what it has done is it's really drained, um, you know, our sense of the public because these can all be the private choices that you make. And so there isn't much of a sense of where do you act in the public sort of realm? You know, what is the outlet for action and activity as a collectivity and we don't even it's harder to even imagine things in that way because we've valorized individual choice consumer choice in this way and i think that's had a very detrimental effect quite apart from uh you know the broader problem of overconsumption and the pollution and energy and waste and all of that but interestingly, I mean, how is it that we're able to afford all of these things? I know some productivity gains have made these things possible, but clearly, um, 
you know, we are way over consuming beyond our actual productive wealth. And this is going to be a real problem, I think, um, uh, down the line. Um, uh, so I, I just I don't think that it's 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 healthy. Obviously, we all want to have a proper standard of life. But I think this is also why people turn towards new age uh, kind of movements or um, there's a real I think there's a real deadening of the spirit that comes from an over um, uh, fetishizing of things. I mean, this is, I think, the problem is that, um, you know, we're less alive to lots of other kinds of experiences that come from social interactions. Right. And, um, you I know, we, give you a, so much. I, I want to give you a stat that I gave Dr. Harriet Fraud and David Cobb, which I find staggering. The 2020 federal budget was $6.6 trillion, and that is 31% of America's GDP. So what the federal government spends is 31% of this country's gross domestic product. So we have a say in mm. what what is valuable and what isn't. The, the federal government could decide where the jobs are, what, you know, community colleges, you spend that money on community colleges. So we're spending money on professors and teachers and all the businesses that develop around a community college, mom and pop coffee shops. You provide health care, free health care. It's easier to work and run a mom and pop coffee shop. You zone big box stores out of the neighborhood. You don't allow Walgreens and Walmart to come in. And you tax Amazon. So the, 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 the village, the city that is built up around this community college through zoning becomes a thriving, self-sufficient community. That's not communism, socialism. That's good government. That's taking 31% of our gross domestic product, not spending, you know, uh, what is it? 3% uh, on defense, building communities. It's been taken away from us. It's, it's, it, we're, they're forcing cheese on us because the dairy lobby has too much cheese. So they pass a farm bill that puts cheese in all our public schools. It's, the people who complain about the government the most are the biggest beneficiaries. And I'm not talking about red state people. I'm talking about corporate oligarchs. They're the biggest recipients of largesse from the $6.6 .6 trillion outlay each year from the federal government. Uh, well, yeah, like, and, you know, ethanol. Ethanol is not a, you know, great fuel. It's not very efficient. Uh, you know, but you got all this corn and they want to keep producing it. So they'll turn it into 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 fuel. fuel uh, that, these like, yeah. big agribusinesses that you're pointing out are definitely driving a lot of government policy and priorities. And they receive so many subsidies. I mean, this is the kind of thing Ralph Nader was always up in arms about is that we've turned, you know, we've got corporate um, takeover of the government. And as a result, we have so much incredible waste um, and that there are resources. I mean, the government does spend quite a bit. It can direct policy. You tax the things that are harmful and you know that you want to discourage and um you enable and should give subsidies to things um startup funds these kinds of things that are going to be healthy and productive you know 
you know, investments in infrastructure and things like that that actually produce benefits for people. They produce jobs. They produce, you know, um, a more vibrant local economy. And, you know, there's a lot of ways, obviously, our policy could be reoriented. But as long as the priorities are driven by very powerful um, uh, corporations that don't have an incentive you know, they, they, you know, they don't have to care about any of the ex so-called externalities. All they need to do is maximize the profit. Um, so yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, like these um, local juris and local jurisdictions, they can do quite a lot. I think we need to focus a lot more attention on them. We get wrapped up with national politics, but, um, you know, like what they've done in Seattle. Um, they've done a lot of very good progressive things. Of course, now they're under attack by the Amazons. Um, and you have, you know, Kashama Sawan facing What is happening? When is her recall? Is it this week or next well, I week? I think it is today, actually. Um, I thought it was the 6th or the 7th. I don't remember the exact date, but it was a special election that they called um, for the recall um and so it's not tied to any other election which means that there will be depressed turnout it was a, a purposeful um attempt oh to... well, that's the cat who's making that sound yeah that is yeah that is sorry um so uh, you know it, it was just sometime in the first week or so of um of uh december is when it was scheduled for. And so it's like a month after certain other municipal elections were taking place that it could have been easily tied to, um, but they purposefully delayed it so that it would be isolated. And of course, during the holidays, uh, this holiday season when everybody is busy shopping, instead of thinking about civic you know, matters and concerns, it's going to be a real challenge. Um, so I'm actually gonna be looking at the news as well to see if it was today or whether it's tomorrow. Right. But my right. point there is that there is um, real action that we can take in local jurisdictions and municipalities. Um, but of course, once that happens, it's going, you know, those who are the authors of it will face a serious corporate backlash. Um, you know, they don't want a lot of precedence for this. I mean, you know, it gives people too many ideas about how much change they might be able to make, uh, uh, make possible. Real um, culture real progressive culture is music that attacks corporations by name, attacks the CEOs by name. But you can't play that kind of music on the radio. It won't get airplay if you're going after the CEO of Coca-Cola because they buy advertising. So you have to sing about love or make veiled references to the poor, but nothing too specific otherwise it's not going to get any airplay and the same goes for television it's the same goes for late night comedy you can make fun of the politicians but not the people who pay the politicians so that reinforces the idea that government is bad that was one of the things writing for late night television i used to think boy i'm undermining my government i'm everybody it's considered patriotic to make fun of our government leaders. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it breeds the idea that government is foolish and corporations are wise. I, me I remember thinking yeah, this can't yeah. be good for the country to have everybody making fun of our political leaders under the guise of, hey, you know, it's isn't the first amendment great yeah use it to go after boeing and mm. raytheon and monsanto not bill clinton's penis right right yeah that's that's an excellent point i mean under your suggestion at office hours you played us a little bit of uh don rickles um and some classics from that era um his uh i guess also his uh a uh, little bit uh, at the second inauguration for Ronald Reagan. Uh, and so that, that inspired me to go, um, you know, scour YouTube and find some of these. So I'm now, you know, deep into Rickle mania. And I'm oh! looking forward to your okay. explication of it. <laughs> okay, I want to do a segment. I, I cannot believe that, okay, this Friday, 
I want to book a half hour or an hour with you for office hours where we I'll pick out some Don Rickles because it's problematic. It's of oh, a time. Yeah, it's yeah. most. Uh, he does a jo- I was telling my friend, we were laughing so hard. Here's a recurring joke throughout Don Rickles career that I think is, 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 is a miracle. He would say to a beautiful woman, you're so beautiful. I'm married, but my wife is very ill. Yes. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. it is, there's nothing clever. There's no joke there. It's, and every time he says that, I, I just laugh. So what, what, were, uh, what, was your, what are your thoughts about Rickles? Oh, well, I guess we could get into it uh, in greater depth. But my basic view on him was that, well, when you watch about 20 clips, you realize that he repeats a lot of material. He's doing the same kind of thing. <clears throat> and yet it's entertaining each time because he's desperate. Um, he's he's just it, that's absolute. That's what it, this is what I wanted to say about him is that he comes on and he is there to battle. He is fighting for his life <laughs> for every moment <laughs> of that segment to be, you know, dominant in that segment. <laughs> right. I mean, no moment should go where he is not intervening and he's not fighting his corner. And that's right. what's amazing, I thought, about right. him. It's like he's there to fight to the bitter end. For <laughs> any moment, he's there to battle. And it's just so, like, uh, aggressive, and, but also very desperate, I thought, in a way. It's like, especially early on, it's like... Uh, he's always like talking about how much money Johnny Carson is making and or or uh, later on, you know, when it's David Letterman, you know, right. uh, you know, and, and in the beginning, it was kind of like I think it really was important to his career to have some kind of TV presence. And this advertised his uh, Las Vegas shows and kept him uh, a name, um, but that he came into that. Um, not having made it at quite as an actor, not getting his own show the way a lot of others, Newhart. He's constantly vacationing <laughs> with Newhart, and Newhart has always had a show. Right. And he, Don Rickles never has a show. Mm-hmm. And so he comes into this with like the biggest chip on his shoulder, and he's there to try and grab something from this like kind of elite world of the TV people <laughs> for himself. Yeah, and it's quite amazing. It's it, quite amazing. I would love. Yeah, we. we <laughs> this makes me so happy. The thing about Rickle, I could talk about Rick. I mean, I once a year I go down the Don Rickles rabbit hole and I just he gets me. He just makes me laugh. Be- it's in the moments where he had nothing and he at a, at a thin air, he pulls something out and, it, and it's not the, it's not a joke. It's an attitude. But what he what he does, because they aren't really jokes, which makes him so you couldn't he couldn't. What he what I love about him is there's a Zen it, throughout throughout all this. There's a Zen. He is totally in the moment and there is an elephant in the room that he finds and he addresses it. That what is the thing? So he would come out and there's something that nobody wants to talk about. And he has a sixth sense for what is the thing right now that people are tense about and he addresses it. And there are, I know people who do that. I can't stand them in real life. But they, right, yeah, of course, like he would be intolerable <laughs> right. in real life. But see, what I was thinking, the reason why I thought of him, though, is because you mentioned how, you know, these late night shows, the comedy, they never really talk about the corporate. Uh, back. Right. So what actually would have been so amazing is to have a left wing anti capitalist Rickles. Would that have been possible? That would have been amazing if he'd like actually brought that elephant you know, of, you know, what's happening in with the same aggression. But maybe nobody would find that funny. They would just find that um, uh, purely intolerable, right? I, he can be socially uh, get at what's awkward or unsayable or people don't want to address and bring that out. But to do it politically, that might have been too much. But I uh, uh, let me respond to that. And then thank you for this. This really I'm in a bad mood tonight. Uh, I've been in a bad mood. 
I, be, I believe that mean is funny. Mean, being mean is funny. Being cruel is funny. And then you hide the cruelty, you sugarcoat it, but underneath it all is ad hominem attacks. Uh, Michael Brooks said, what, be kind to people, but evil to institutions. I say with comedy, forget the institutions, attack the people, Add, get the people, attack the people. And I think if you're being mean to people, it's funny. If you're mean, <laughs> like, you know, go after oh, I, I, people. I, 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 I have to say, I think you may have sometimes achieved what I was talking about as the left wing Rickles in some of your 2014, 2015 era. There are not enough clips of your stand up on YouTube. I wish there were more, but there mm. are a couple with the Scott Rogowski um, uh, show. I forget the name of that, right. of that show up in right. Boston. Right. You made some people very uncomfortable, I think, with some very funny attacks that were personal attacks, but they're very political the way you were, you know, were after them. So that's the kind of thing I think would be really good. So anyway, anyway I'm, I'm looking forward to talking more with yes, you. Yes, thank about you. Some clips. Sounds Who's like on Gorilla History this week? Well, on Guerrilla History, um, we have a new episode on the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, the Rising in England in 1381, uh, coming uh, out. And that's with actually the guest that will be joining you with Henry Hakamaki tonight. Great. I think. He joined us for a discussion about this uh, revolt and what we can learn from it. And um, I guess one thing just to come full circle is that uh, in terms of culture, one thing that's really great about uh, what was produced by this uh, Peasants' Revolt are a lot of great songs um, that, you know, were circulated um, and expressed the outrage of the peasants against their uh, government and the oppression and corruption of their time. And they put it into song. And so we have these popular folk songs that come from this period of like the 14th and 15th century that, you know, memorialize uh, those conditions and the complaints against it. And that's a cool thing is that people's culture does express um, you know, these kinds of ideas about equality, about how hierarchy is not natural. Um, mm -hmm. One famous phrase from one of the sermons um, of John Ball, who was a dissident priest who seems to have been the ideological leader of this of this revolt. When Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? Um, just beautiful stuff like this you, you find in it. So anyway, listen to that episode if you're interested right. in people. It sounds like a good album for multimillionaire, Harvard graduate and fraud, Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine, who is actually part of the machine. He should put together an album of those songs and make another couple of million dollars. Did you have a chance to read Tom Morello in The New York Times? I, I didn't. I've, I've been hearing your complaints about his self-dealing and self-serving. Unbelievable. Uh, Unbelievable. But not a Bernie a supporter. Video. Thank you, Professor Adnan Hussein. Let us now go. Well, we're kind of on time here. Not bad. Peter B. Collins joins us from San Francisco. Hello, sir. Sorry to keep you waiting, but we're doing OK. You are a member of the Bay Area Radio Hall of Fame. I just found an email from Michael Krasny that uh, was sent to me uh, like two weeks ago. I can't believe it. My email box is all screwed up. Uh, is that what has you in such a bad mood? No, I'm dealing uh, with <laughs> Zoom tonight. Zoom. zoom oh. All I want to do is Zoom, 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 and I can't Zoom properly. <laughs> it's good to see you, sir. Happy holidays. It's nice to see you. And uh, I'm sorry your email gets all backed up. But, yeah. Uh, well, that's not all. Understand. <laughs> that's not all that's backed up. How are things in beautiful San Francisco before we get into it? It's uh, we had a couple of weeks of really nice uh, Southern California weather, and uh, we're heading into a potential uh, light rain tonight. It's been uh, uh, overcast all day and kind of kind of gray and dull. We're not used to that. 
Okay. So Chris Cuomo is out $18 million. He's going to be suing CNN. He was fired from CNN for really being an a-hole and Ooh. sexual assault. Well, they hired him for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, people didn't like Chris Cuomo. He was he was a bully. We all knew that. And he allegedly assaulted a woman or two. It's not sexual harassment when you grab a woman's derriere and say, you know, I can do this because you're not my boss anymore, that kind of stuff in front of her husband. That's assault. That's not harassment. That's assault. So... And that is the case of Shelley Ross. Uh, the more recent investigation by a white shoe law firm indicates that there is another complaint, but we don't really know any details on the individual or what her complaint is. And uh, Jeff Zucker, the original Zuck, uh, he has said that uh, Cuomo's failure to come clean about his role in advising his brother, the former governor, on how to uh, beat the uh, allegations of his own sexual harassment, uh, that that was sufficient to fire him. And of course, let me say at the outset that news organizations are not very good at reporting on their internal problems, even when they make news. Mm -hmm. And CNN has told us that this investigation into Chris Cuomo is going to continue. And they pretend that sometime in a week or two, uh, Anderson Cooper is going to lay bare uh, all of the uh, misdeeds of Chris Cuomo. And we know that they will just keep moving on and uh, distract us with, with other things. So uh, there may be an investigative reporter, a print journalist, who will bring us uh, the details uh, Ronan Farrow has a score to settle with uh, Chris Cuomo. <laughs> so uh, because he, be, he was being spied on by Chris Cuomo or something else? No, because Chris Cuomo was making calls from CNN while he was on duty to find out when Ronan Farrow's article about Andrew Cuomo was going to drop. And so, you know, I'm, I'm just speculating here and, and, you know, joining the zeitgeist of the Feldman show. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if Ronan Farrow is working on a report. Um, and, you know, there are other people like at The Atlantic who will see this, maybe even The New Yorker, as a, a juicy story to dig into. But we're not going to uh, learn about it from CNN. No. Jeff Zucker, head of CNN, Harvard, Harvard graduate. All problems in this world come from Harvard. Jeff Zucker, <laughs> a, a graduate of Harvard who worked on the Today Show with Matt Lauer, who's a rapist. Yes. Matt Lauer is a rapist who now is selling off some of his homes to, you know, handle the out of court settlements. Uh, Let's stay with Chris Cuomo for a second. Mm -hmm. Was he doing journalism? Was he doing the Lord's work on CNN? Well, CNN doesn't uh, ordinarily do journalism, so we have to start there. Because journalism would be an actual uh, <clears throat> set of stories on the important events of the day. And, uh, you know, if you go back to when Ted Turner started CNN, it was that. It was a newsroom setting, and uh, earnest reporters like Bernard Shaw would anchor uh, a digest of what actually happened. And it was, wasn't all, um, you know, political get stuff. It wasn't all um, based on press releases from corporate PR firms. Uh, they had actual reporters who would go out and uh, spend a few days researching a story and then present uh, what in the biz is called a package uh, that, uh, you know, gave us information on that story. And so now, uh, you know, CNN is a uh, 
kind of uh, output of a Cuisinart where the input is breaking news, breaking, whatever is breaking. And, you know, sometimes what they're reporting on is important breaking news. Thanks, Chloe. Uh, but uh, a lot of times it is jazzed up as, you know, here's the latest installment on a story that our research shows is drawing a big audience or that is number one with women 25 to 54, right. which is the target, but the hardest group of people uh, to get to pay attention to so-called hard news. Right. Then, then there is the, uh, the, the Washington-based political gossip that uh, you know, reached a peak with Russiagate. Uh, I know I sound like a broken record, but that is the apex of media malpractice in recent years. And uh, so the effort to get Trump, uh, you know, coupled with that uh, banner and the red flashing light of breaking news uh, became a, a standard. The way, uh, you know, stations like WABC used to play the number one record every 45 right. minutes. Right, right. Top 40. <laughs> yes. Yeah, here's our top story. Yeah, top, our top story, which we'll be playing over and over again. Yeah, it's Stairway to Heaven or Alec Baldwin. That's, you know. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to uh, lower our standards and uh, accept what passes for news on What is news? Channels. What is your definition of news? If you were put in charge of a news organization and I said, that, you know, uh, we don't need to make money here. We need to do the Lord's work. What would what would be the definition of news? Well, thank you for the caveat that we don't have to make money because right. that's what has corrupted television news. So, uh, you know, we can use Cronkite as a standard that his job was not to generate ratings or advertising revenue. It was a service to the viewership. And William Paley was the founder of CBS, and he was a stodgy old guy who, who believed in this, that the, uh, you know, the news service that CBS provided uh, without a profit uh, was part of their obligation in order to feed you primetime comedies and dramas which is where they got the cigarette companies and the beer companies and the poison beverage companies you were talking about with Adnan mm -hmm. to pay the bills. So it was 60 minutes that broke the, the paradigm because it got big ratings on Sunday night. It became a profit center. The anchors, you know, started to get huge salaries, uh, Mike Wallace and, you know, that a uh, group of, of veteran reporters uh, who barely worked. You know, Mike Wallace would parachute in to do the interview after a producer or a team of producers had been on the scene uh, and warmed up the interview subjects uh, before Mike got there. So Mike was just a poser, you know, who, right. who acted tough. And so, you know, 60 Minutes really is where we cross the line from hard news to profitable news. Then uh, Ted Turner kind of hit the reset button with a cable news channel that, uh, you know, he, he didn't pay his anchors mega millions. He paid them more than an average reporter, but, uh, you know, not, not uh, into the stratosphere. And so he made his bet that people were looking for something like news radio that you can flip on whenever you have 15 minutes, get caught up on the important stories of the day, and maybe a little bit of context, but not the kind of spin that is so common in television news today. So I wanna answer your question. My components would be uh, that we operate on the web so that we don't have the restrictions of uh, a defined time period, like 30 minutes or an hour, that the news stories uh, can run as long as they are interesting uh, to provide enough detail 
and that uh, <clears throat> there is a, a balance attempted to address not just the interests of the viewer, what they want to see, but also the needs of the viewer, what they need to know. Right. And we have lost that in the, uh, the chase of ratings. And let me just take a minute here to depress our listeners and viewers with a quick rundown of the cable news ratings for uh, October. Uh, the number one show in primetime was Tucker Carlson. Anderson Cooper and Chris Cuomo were in second and third place. Hannity uh, in fourth place. Aaron Burnett in fifth and Rachel Maddow who at the beginning of this year was uh, dominating uh, these ratings uh, she's now in sixth place and uh, she's followed by CNN tonight I'm not sure exactly what hour that is this is among the key uh, demographic in terms of total audience Fox these these are ranked according to adults 25 to 54 right. Right. Um, but the total viewers, it's all uh, Fox, vary because, for example, Fox is top heavy with old people like me. Right. And and so Tucker Carlson has four point four million viewers. Uh, but the second place show, Anderson Cooper, only has two point four million. But most or more of those viewers are in the desired demographic that advertisers pay for. Right. So um, which is also a, that whole desired demographic thing is garbage. Well, it's it's pandering. It, it's exploitation. But the right? idea they, that the idea that people of a certain demographic spend more money than another demographic is, has been disproven, hasn't it? Well, I don't know. I, th I think that. You know, people over 55 have different spending patterns and they they've already got uh, all of their household items. And uh, unless the guy's having a midlife crisis, they're not going to buy a luxury car unless that's been their habit. Don't uh, you think people so who are older people are susceptible to Fox News? Why wouldn't they be susceptible to a brand of toothpaste? other than not having teeth. But if you're that mm. stupid to be believe Tucker Carlson is telling you the truth, why wouldn't you try to sell these people soda? Well, because you can make more money on a cost per thousand basis by selling ads for drugs. Uh, oh. It's the prescription drugs that are the top billers on cable news across the board. And uh, I'm not making funny fun of people with HIV, but uh, they're too bit carvy and one other HIV drug they appear to be on every hour. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all kinds of drugs aimed at the senior population. And that's the, the biggest uh, profit center for the cable news channels. And it reflects the older audiences that spend more time watching. So we, we have to recognize that there are two components to ratings, whether it's for radio or television. One is the total number of people who have tuned in, and the other is how long did they stay? And the longer they stay, the more value uh, is you know, reflected in their, their viewing habits in the ratings. So uh, I, I do think that you know, the advertising works uh, or they, you know, the advertisers wouldn't continue. And especially, you know, I'm a DVR guy. I, I never watch anything live. Uh, even if I turn the TV on live, I pause it for five minutes to get some headroom so I can zip through the next batch of commercials. I do see them flitting by, <laughs> but that's, that's about it. Uh, and of course, they've adopted strategies to get me to pause uh, because there's some kind of a graphic or an image that uh, they think will catch my attention. Let me ask so, you, Bill, Bill Moyers said news is what somebody doesn't want you to know. That's often the case. Then you said what you need. To, it's what you need to know. And yeah, what I somebody mean, doesn't want that, you to know that. 
producers, editors, news directors used to make a determination that this story we're about to give you is not sexy, uh, it's not going to drive more eyeballs to this channel, but it's something that's important that the, you know, the American people, the, the body politic, uh, need to know about. And we've gotten away from that because of the stovepiping, where they feed you what they their their market research leads them to believe you want to see and then they repeat that because you know last night it worked what happens to chris cuomo well you know he's already worked at abc and at fox uh so he and he's not going to one america or newsmax i think we can be pretty sure of that uh I don't really know. He, you know, he he's only fifty. Uh, we've we've seen that. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm blocking on his name now. The NBC anchor, Lauer, Brian Williams. No, oh, Brian, Brian Williams. Williams. Uh, you know, he took a fall in public and uh, rehabilitated uh, more or less uh, by working the late night shift. He's bailing from NBC because he believes he's kind of pigeonholed there and i think he's hoping that other offers are going to come in and that uh, he'll have a new lease on on life as a tv anchor even and, though he even though he was a liar well the nature of television news is that people don't hold on to information for very long because it's been pushed out of the front of their the frontal lobes by whatever uh, sizzling, breaking news uh, or tabloid style uh, stories uh, are distracting you today. And so uh, because Cuomo did get, you know, good ratings, relatively speaking, for CNN, he, he's a marketable property. Um, and, you know, with appropriate uh, timeout and whitewashing, uh, I, I think in two years we'll see him back. Really? On, uh, yeah, I do. I, I mean, you know, Americans have short memories, and TV assists in that by never offering context, never presenting the history of an issue or or a person. Uh, you know, Jeffrey Epstein is a, a focus, you know, of uh, because of the Ghislaine Maxwell trial right now. Um, but, you know, he relied on people forgetting about uh, his plea deal in, in Florida and was able to hang out with Bill Gates and, you know, get all kinds of uh, famous people, including Bill Clinton, to take rides on his jet. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I <laughs> let me ask you about a corporate utopia that would, you know, in 20 years would catch us both by surprise. <clears throat> uh, my experience in corporate America was wear a cup, wear a helmet and knee pads and shoulder pads. You're going to get abused. I'm of a generation where if you went to work for a corporation, you were going to have co-workers with sharp elbows who were going to stab you in the chest, forget the back, and you were going to have a boss who made comments that were inappropriate and horrible, you know, and then God knows what they did to the women. Right. That going to going into those offices, I'm of a generation where you just girded your lines and you were going to be abused, you know, held against your will, even though the work was done, you know, can't leave. We were just an abusive relationship. And I've always thought the solution was class struggle. But. We're discovering I have uh, somebody I know is being me too as we speak, and I'm reading the interview with him and I'm thinking, my God, his perception of power and entitlement, it's 
he's a dinosaur, but it's a new dinosaur. It's like because of the Me Too generation that people who believe in class struggle. Could they be surprised if corporations weed out all the bullies? Because it seems to me that if you're a bully, you're going to cost a corporation money. And if they get rid of the bullies, I don't know if that's possible, but if it becomes prohibitive to have bullies in corporate America because of the lawsuits, you're going to have gentler employees and employers who will then, with that would come an understanding of power and possibly a shift in terms of class struggle. Is it, I'm talking about a 20 year cleansing of white men from corporate America. Could there so be a have, utopia have, waiting for us? Have you been drinking a premium bottled water from uh, Walden Pond? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what you describe is flatly incompatible with capitalism. Right, but... Could... And the, the bullying that you talk about is considered a necessary component to, uh, uh, to beat productivity out of the peasants. And uh, the, you know, when you get caught, it is simply a cost of doing business. I mean, I mean look at Elon Musk. Uh, he has a bully personality and, and you know, he uh, has genius capacity. Uh, he has said that he is on the spectrum. Um, but those are not excuses for the kind of behavior that he exhibits. And, you know, for example, he has pulled up stakes uh, figuratively only uh, to move his headquarters, which is a small operation, probably a little bigger than the Trump organization, but nothing like uh, AT&T. So he's moved it from Palo Alto, California to Austin, Texas. But his production plant is in Fremont, California, and he will not change that because it would be too expensive to try to rebuild that in a lower labor cost uh, market. But he continues to operate union free. He uh, bullied workers into continuing to pump out electric cars, uh, despite a risk of COVID during the early stages. He racism, defied, race. Don't forget the racism in Emeryville, yes. I believe. He defied public health officials, uh, and you know, basically, he wouldn't report the number of uh, positive cases and uh, hospitalizations that resulted from exposure in his uh, Musk mobile plant. And, and so he, you know, his attitude uh, will continue uh, because he's, uh, you know, made a billion or billions of dollars on paper. Uh, and that's what people in this country respect. So uh, I like your utopian vision, but I simply don't see that uh, America is headed in that direction. I, I mean, we won't even take reasonable steps to curtail the extremes of capitalism. Reasonable ones, you know, not full-blown socialism, uh, but we've seen that, you know, Biden has not moved to restore the environmental regulations that were eviscerated by Trump. Uh, he did move the Interior Department back to Washington, but, you know, I'm not sure that makes a big difference. Uh, and, and so, you know, uh, th there's only a limited interest in uh, the ideals that you uh, described. And most people simply accept that this is the plantation that we've got to work on. Right. Is it possible that you could... I... I believe that somebody who abuses people in a workplace is abusive in their politics and the way they do business. 
if these men can't behave, if they're sued into simpering, uh, spineless men, they're not allowed to be who they th think they should be. Wouldn't that change? Wouldn't that change corporate America a little? If you if you have if you end up removing the toxic masculinity Ooh. just by suing them out of the business, doesn't that? No. <laughs> then we well, see toxic feminism. We have to look at at how much Trump. Um, uh, really moved us in in retrograde directions on so many fronts. Yeah. All right. So racist expression is normalized. Uh, contempt for regulations and the courts um, is institutionalized. Uh, with the help of Mitch McConnell, he packed the federal courts with judges who won't recognize the kind of abuse that that you're talking. Kavanaugh about. won't. <laughs> not after a couple of beers <laughs> we have to wrap it up I'm, 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 we're 10 minutes over uh did i we did a half hour right just about i i would like to mention two yes, things sir. quickly yes. one is that um the longest serving political prisoner in the united states leonard peltier uh, won support from an unlikely source, and uh, the Huff Po has reported that Patrick Leahy has called for the release of Leonard Peltier. The prosecutor who helped convict him has admitted that they didn't really have any evidence that Leonard Peltier was central to the uh, uh, insurrection on the Pine Ridge Reservation that ended up with a dead FBI agent, but he was the man who was fingered for it. And uh, also, while I often criticize the New York Times, they had a very strong and worthwhile editorial, the sole editorial in the Sunday paper yesterday, uh, about the effort to uh, sanction prosecutors who preside over wrongful convictions like the one of Leonard Peltier. And this is a, a situation that has developed where there have been a number of wrongful convictions reversed that originated in Queens, yet those who presided over those wrongful convictions remain un untouched. And a group of legal scholars has attempted to get them disciplined or uh, you know, penalized in some way. And the state agency that is supposed to preside over discipline of lawyers in New York State is going after the whistleblowing lawyers and not the prosecutors who wrongfully convicted many individuals. And there is a new commission that's been set up to explore wrongful convictions and to hold the prosecutors accountable in New York State. And it was first passed when uh, Andrew Cuomo was up for re-election and he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And immediately after election, he got the legislature just to gut the whole thing. And that has been largely corrected. So there is a commission that is in the process of being set up that may uh, result in, uh, uh, you know, really imposing the full brunt of the law on prosecutors who have broken the law. So I see this as progress. And there is an effort uh, to pass legislation here in California to set up a similar uh, commission. And I just want to encourage your listeners and viewers to uh, keep tabs on this subject. This is something you need to know mm -hmm. because you might get uh, on the wrong side of a prosecutor sometime and you will see just how much uh, unfettered power they have. Great. If you see Michael Krasny, tell him I, my inbox. Anyway, thank you. Peter becomes he's, go to he's looking he's looking for the link to hear his interview that right. uh, you you and I did on the show what, three weeks ago yes yes yeah. uh, Peter B Collins go to peterbcollins.com for a treasure trove of interviews and Peter B Collins is a Bay Area Radio Hall of Famer and I hope you can come back next week I'll be here David it's thank you a pleasure thank you well. Let us now go to, I 
would assume it's Aurora, Illinois, where Professor Marianne Cummings is standing by. There, he, Peter is waving to you, Professor. Thanks for flipping with me. I'm going out to dinner. Where are you, where are you going? <laughs> uh, it's a new restaurant here in uh, San Anselmo hmm. called, called Keats Hall. Uh, so I'm going to check it out. I'm jealous. Anyway, it, it worked well for me to flip, but it doesn't have to stay this way. Okay. Thank you, Peter B. Collins. Marianne Cummings is a professor of physics. She is also a parks commissioner, an elected officer, a parks commissioner in Aurora, Illinois. I want to talk about whatever you want to talk about. I'm getting my last licks in on Biden and Kamala, I, I, you know, starting in January. I, I cannot I cannot tell you how worked up I get, Professor, about this administration. And I feel obligated to defend them come 2022, because God forbid we see the Democrats lose the House and the Senate. Why do you feel so obligated? I don't know. You're uh, you're you're very convincing. I don't know how convincing you are or how bad the Democrats are. I think it's a combination of the two. But well, you know, um, I remember reading many years ago um, about how part of the reason why the Nixon administration fell apart was because the Democrats in particular weren't really an opposition party soon enough. Like if the Democratic, if there was real opposition early enough in Nixon's first term to some of the stuff he was doing, he wouldn't have felt at liberty to continue doing what he was doing. In terms of, you talking about the crimes he was committing? He was, the, the crimes he was committing, the corruption, um, you know, I, I, I appreciated that Nixon was, at least he, he had some uh, functioning brain cells on some level. And if he hadn't been paranoid, insecure, insecure vindictive, and a raging alcoholic, <laughs> he might have been, uh, you know, semi-decent guy. But the, the thing is, he had, he had no pushback. I mean, look, for God's sake, that's what happens to these people. Well, but the, what, from what I understand is that de the Democrats were pretty much doing the same thing Nixon was doing. Kennedy and uh, yeah. Johnson were taping all their phone conversations. Oh, yeah. well, and that's very interesting. That they, they were always taping. Go see the um, documentary, The Fog of War. I recommend everyone. It's basically, you know, war criminal McNamara, who was the defense secretary, the war secretary under Johnson and Kennedy. Uh, it's very interesting to listen to just just him talking about yeah. that whole period. But, and and um, the crime and just let me just point one thing out and yeah. then I'll then I'll be quiet. Mark Felt okay. was deep throat, right? He was the one who yeah, helped Woodward absolutely. and Bernstein. Mark Felt was a criminal. Mark Felt had to be pardoned because as an FBI agent, he was breaking into the homes without a warrant of suspected weather ground, weather underground uh, people. And he had to be pardoned. Uh, so the idea of breaking in to people's homes and offices, that didn't start with Watergate. Nixon. Oh, no, that didn't. However, yeah. you know, it's one thing to be massively violating the civil rights of Black Panthers, American Indian Movement, the peace movement, and all those hippies. It's quite another thing to be uh, targeting the CIA and FBI at the ruling class itself, like other rich white people. That's where right. Nixon kind of crossed the line. I right. mean, when he won, in a landslide, I think it was Halderman was kind of uh, reminiscing. I'm going, I remember watching him on one of the late night shows going, oh, there's a criminal on Johnny Carson or somebody's show. And then he was saying that everybody was quite taken aback after Nixon won in a landslide. I mean, he just humiliated poor George McGovern. So, you know, if you win like that, I mean, 
that that's the time to be magnanimous to like uh, you know just offer the olive branch to you know because you're you're sitting you're you're sitting as high as you're ever going to be and at that point nixon just told his staff like no now we go after our enemies now this guy and this guy and this guy and people were kind of stunned like whoa wait a minute you know that may not be the wise thing to do right now you have all the power in the world to do what you want in kind of a nice way right anyway yeah nixon was uh, had some let's say he had some character flaws yeah that's it's so, kind of like he reminds me of chris cuomo nixon committed the same crime chris cuomo committed being an a-hole i think you can get away with a lot yeah. but people don't like chris cuomo because he's an a-hole and nixon yeah, he's was, a jerk he's he, I mean, somebody called him Fredo, you know, not really smart enough for the family business. Right. He's got to get a job at CNN. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, and the, the, you said something earlier about the, you know, the privilege and the, you know, the, the, these people just have a sense of entitlement that has got to be, I mean, it's got to be mentally debilitating at some point. I mean, I'm used to having pushback all my life and pushback is what in some sense, you know, makes me get better at certain things. But if you were surrounded morning, noon and night by people who kissed your butt, like, and that's like anybody who becomes a senator or congressman. Mm -hmm. And which is what I've said before, I think that's why partly why Bernie Sanders remains an independent because he gets just enough garbage from, you know, people in Washington to remind him that, you know, they don't like him. Right. And so that he sort of keeps anchored to reality. Right. And he does his own shopping at the Costco when he goes back home to Vermont. I think that's kind of cool. But, Costco's, uh, Costco's one of the better companies. They treat their employees better yeah. than, <laughs> than, um, Walmart. And they won't, and, and they do have standards about what products they will sell, too. Right. So, at least they used to. But, yeah, it's, um, there, yeah, there's a certain amount of coolness around Bernie Sanders because he, because he keeps it real. And because people, I mean, he, he is in touch with people who really suffer, and he genuinely empathizes with them as people. Um, he doesn't really try to fit people into left or right or he's got a, he's got the kind of class consciousness that you were talking about earlier that we don't have and part of the reason why the republican party has just gone back crap crazy is because people like bill clinton and hal gore kind of took over the traditional republican turf so the neoliberal turf and you know it and and with that they kind of elbowed out from the left the vestiges of, of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, and they left the, the what we call the populist or working class. You know, they they, they left them to the Republicans. So it, it, the we just developed on the in the Democratic Party the party of professional, the professional class, the money, the big, money, which is everything. I mean, it's it, to me the finance. It, it doesn't even matter who the oil companies are given money to or the drug companies. It's all finance. Ultimately, the finance, right. Wall Street actually dictates all this stuff that's happened. Let me give and, you a, let me give you a headline from mm -hmm. December of 2022. The Republican landslide that never materialized. I'm just asking how how do you see that headline playing out? Can you imagine a story? 12 months from now, where they said, we got it all wrong, Biden, uh, people in, in 2022, in his second year, people took stock of his accomplishments and he, Congress and the Senate wrote his coattails. And <laughs> I mean, structurally, it's almost impossible right now for the Democrats to hold on to the House and the Senate. Right. Well, I don't know what you mean, because I, I, I can see one scenario where that could play out is if they uh, if this traction, if the Supreme Court and Roe v. Wade get some traction. Now, I don't think they're even going to decide this case until next year. They they 
in in the history of the Supreme Court that I paid attention to, um, it would be June of next year. By June of next year, they have to decide. Yeah. Um, Usually, the the questioning doesn't isn't a real good uh, predictor of what actually happens. You know, they might get hostile to somebody's point, but they want to have some clarification. So, it's it's kind of hard. Um, it's hard, kind of hard to predict what happens. But if the Republicans are going to make big hay of that, that will be the one issue that gets that gets Democrats to the polls. Women. It, well, women and and men, liberals, you know, younger people. Um, that w- that will be an issue that gets. That's one of those, you know, put you in a, a trigger right. to put um, button issues. Um, if if the if if the Supreme Court has a doesn't doesn't do anything to essentially uh, change the status quo. And by the way, the status quo is and has been for over a decade. Abortion is effectively unavailable in most counties in this country. And that and it really it was there was always uh, there was always a fight and a struggle because of the way Roe v. Wade was done. And uh, as I said, a, a feminist lawyer at the time, her her position was that Roe v. Wade was the worst thing to happen to the feminist movement because a it women were getting involved and they were very systematically state by state changing the laws and she thought was great. But B, you know, the way it was done, if it had gone through the states, then the Supreme Court would have been reacting to the reality on the ground, much like they did the gay marriage. It was basically gay marriage. They won. They changed the law state by state until the majority of the states had some kind of marriage equality protections. And then uh, Judge Roberts was just kind of in a position, well, equal protection. You know, we've got the majority of states now recognizing this uh, in their laws. And so we can't have a country where, you know, there are some states where there are rights in some states and not rights in others. So Let me ask I you a stupid have, question about abortion. Yeah. Plan B. Mm hmm. What happens if we just flood the market with Plan B so that women, if they think well, they're pregnant, Plan they... B, I think is, yeah, but that's just for the, you know, the night after. Um, and many women are, don't even realize they're pregnant until like, you know, the third month sometimes. So it's... Yeah, I mean, that would be helpful. I would have thought that, you know, technology would have been more advanced than it is right now. And it will be advanced so that you, know, you don't even have to go to abortion clinics, a clinic someplace and go through a picket line of pro-lifers. Um, I'm just I'm just but, thinking I'm just thinking out loud. If in Texas. You made pregnancy tests free so that women like the same way we test for COVID, we test for pregnancy. Would the right wing support massive testing for pregnancy to lower the, to make abortions happen earlier? They'd be against that, right? They want well, women pregnant. Well, I don't know. There was something, this, would, this, would, this might possibly dovetail into something I wanted to talk about, which is like universal biometric ID, where, you know, a clutch full of, massive corporations can access all of your medical data. They're talking about this. I'm going to talk about this in just a little bit. Well, go ahead. Talk about that. They they, they did pass a law. Remember, they, there was a law that got squelched in the Virginia State House, but they were going through formulating this law, which would require any woman who had a miscarriage be required to file a police report because that was a possible crime scene. And even right wingers went, oh, wait a minute, that that <laughs> that's just some kind of a, a, a dystopic scenario that even they didn't want to you know, to go into. I'm very, very. Were they talking uh, about holding funerals for miscarriages as well? Oh, they do. I mean, yes, yes, they 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 did some performative stuff because, you know, uh, the kind of arguments rational rational people were making that you know the number one uh if you want to give uh, full humanhood to a 
fetus embryo at all stages, then the number one killer of children are uh, is miscarriage. And there's nobody seems to be, you know, mounting a campaign for miscarriage, maybe one out of every four, one out of every three pregnancies in that way. And, uh, and, and you know, I, I was, uh, I, there was a priest that my parents had invited to Thanksgiving dinner and uh, I gave, I read him the riot act and one, and my mother <laughs> for once didn't even like bother to shut me up because they were sponsoring this, uh, this doctor that performed abortions and then he found Jesus saw the light and I'm going wait a minute you're telling me that a guy that you think was a mass killer and you're now like sponsoring him to talk what happens if there would have been some reformed racist a guy that went around killing black people and then suddenly found Jesus I mean you'd be demanding he go to prison right Rick Santorum's well, wife <laughs> Rick Santorum's <laughs> wife was married to an abortion or was dating an abortionist. But the thing is, my, the point is, and of course, you know, my father is getting all upset. Now you're just, you know, over the top. I'm going, really? I'm over the top. I'm over the top. So what you're saying is you guys pointing to my father and the priest. You guys don't even believe your own BS on this. Right. And everyone's giggling and stuff like that. And uh, the, the priest I knew was smart and he kind of did some lawyerly crap you know back backpedaled <laughs> right. but the thing is this, this has always been um you know you could this has always been a very ludicrous kind of discussion set of discussions uh i think it isn't about abortion ultimately i think i think the lawyer that was telling me that her her view that roe v wade was the worst thing that happened to the women's movement i think she had a great point it became a culture war it became you know, it, it became a trigger point for a culture war, and every it, it, you could freight the whole reproductive uh, rights issue with everything, pretty much like work, working class that went over to the Republicans could pile on about how they've been abandoned by the elite culture, how no one respects their traditions or what they do, and. Unfortunately, that's when you get all these genuine class resentments kind of finding expression in a cultural issue. And, um, you know, I was just listening for some reason. I, I, I listened to Scott, to Scott Adams. Do you know who he is? Dilbert. Yeah, the Dilbert cartoonist. He's a, he's a libertarian. He was a kind of a Trump supporter. But he was talking about how he said if i had to like be a democrat marketing you know the abortion issue to republicans um he had an interesting he had an interesting kind of argument it's what is more important life or freedom and you know liberty is very important when you start getting into draconian abortion laws you start getting into totalitarian regimes you know you talk like really like you have to be monitored your missed period makes you a possible murder suspect and how could you even get any of this information unless you had a massively intrusive state apparatus into your basic biological functions right and uh, and so it's like yes i mean it's it's a tragedy if you think it's a life but we often choose liberty over life we do it when we go to war people do it when they give their lives to save somebody else uh police do it you know when they get shot by crime i mean it's this is it was i had to admit you know and scott adams came out of marketing <laughs> so that was his, really that was his yeah he came out of, in fact one of my colleagues worked for bell labs he was at pacific bell and his, uh, his skill set was that he was also a hypnotist, but he worked for marketing. And, and basically, he came up with this um, persuasion theory. They didn't come up with it, but that was kind of the rage. And, you know, he, when he was talking about how you message, and, uh, and the Democrats are usually horrible at it, and that the reason why he thought Trump would win before anybody else did is that he had... Of messaging, you know, who cares? If, he said, "Put aside your politics or your, you know, questions of ethics. 
But how Trump messaged, he said, was just incredible. And the only one that came close, he said, was Bernie Sanders. He said that um, that one ad, when they had the, the uh, um, all come to look for America. Yeah, Paul Simon. The Simon yeah. and Garfunkel. He said he thought that that was the single best political ad he had ever seen in terms of how it moves people, because people aren't moved by, you know, by by logic or rationalizations. They right. are moved by something that actually touches them by symbolism. So, you know, when I went to our convention into when Democratic convention in 2016 and they were passing these stupid posters, love Trump's hate. And Trump was in red, which is, you know, it's red broadcasts across the room. You know, you see red and you also see very bright yellow. So you had love in bright yellow, Trump in red, and then hate in some, you know, not really spectacular color. So when you looked out over the convention, all you saw was a thousand love Trump love trump and he says the first part of the message is what gets into people's brains so anyway this is just all let's uh, let's talk about something you brought up because i remember when obamacare passed they were going Mm -hmm. to nationalize our records that obama said it's insane that you can be living in california end up in an emergency room in omaha and they can't go online and look up your health records so they were kind of feeding a, da- a database. He wanted a database, a national database of our health records. And many Americans said that's a violation of our privacy because you can't get hired if you are in remission on some illness. It should not be available to your boss and rightfully so to find out. So well, where are we? Was, uh, some things, there was some, and I think one was, uh, I guess it's under medical information technology, and there were courses on this, and, and it's basically getting a standard like Dewey Decimal System of how you categorize. And one of the, I thought one of the better ideas in Hillary Care and in uh, Clinton Care was that they would standardize like insurance forms, standardize, you know, things, just one big universal way of categorizing illness, disease, uh, uh, type of uh, injury, just one big universal categorization so that you'd have a uniform way of talking to people so that at least, you know, local or regional databases would have a way of talking and Mm -hmm. would not, it would just ungarble a lot of communication. The um, if we had something like Denmark, I believe, has a database, a relational database where your identity is encrypted. I mean, the even the government can't get at it. And so you would so they would be able to do studies. They would be able to correlate, for instance, you know, uh, somebody having early pregnancy or an abortion early, does that result in later breast cancer or things like that? Things that would be very touchy and personal. And, you know, there's a, what they call, there, there's a, a bias and I can't remember exactly what it is, but uh, people are reluctant to, to name bad things in their past if there's no, you know, if they're perfectly healthy, healthy now, they're not going to, put on, you know, a, a survey if, they, if they've had a miscarriage or if they did drugs or something like that. But if they have, if they've got cancer and they're scared, they might recall. So I think it's recall bias is what they say. So this is a kind of, you know, but in the United States, we've had a very, um, there's been a very testy relationship between our national security state and any encryption software. Mm-hmm. And I, I personally know two people one of whom is in our own chat room and and the other wrote a book on encryption who could re- completely redo the internet and 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 make it secure and open but our government doesn't want that our government wants back doors into everything which brings me to the subject of vaccines i just wanted to talk a little bit about that because i think there's been a little bit of um, oh i'd say uh, sloppy reporting. Um, I just want to say there's a difference between people who are anti-vaccine, and there are some, 
um, and people who are anti-vaccine mandate, and furthermore, people who are anti-biometric ID card. So uh, you had a guest talking about the, or somebody was talking about the massive anti-vax protests in Italy. Yes, they're anti, it's not so much anti-vax protein, they're against the biometric card concept. And what is, so what is a biometric card? Well, but biometric card is something that, you know, you would have that would have all of your data, medical data accessible through it. The problem with that is that who who is managing this information? Um, we have a local uh, congressman, Congressman Bill Foster, a colleague, an old colleague of Saul and myself, a uh, particle physicist, who is... Um, Put in, he's, he's put in legislation to um, basically expand a program that's in the state of Illinois. And I wasn't real, I didn't realize it was in the state of Illinois. It was called Vax Portal, which would be sort of the beginning of a biometric ID. I didn't realize when I tried going through this Vax Portal because I have my, I have two vaccines. I'll get a, the, the booster as soon as our proposals are in this week. Um, I couldn't find my name on it. And in fact, it's being run by Experian. Experian, you people might recall, was uh, infamous for having this massive data data breach because yeah, they're they're the, uh, they, they do the your your uh, credit score. It's one of the big three credit score companies. So um, the idea that you would have these companies run such, you know, such intrusive type or the ability to be so intrusive into your personal data. Bill Gates, I mean, uh, old Bill Foster made this presentation in front of Bill Gates ID 2020. Um, he, he had this convention. And of course, they love it. And Bill Gates was going on and on about how these kind of biometric data cards would be a bonanza for like corporations. I'm going, yeah, I bet they will. And so, you know, this is, and, and, and this is kind of, you know, very consistent with the whole response to the vaccine, to the, to the uh, COVID crisis across the board. I mean, we have a disaster now, but the disaster is no longer, you know, nature. The disaster is our response to it. I mean, I was just reading the headline of Forbes where Pfizer stands to make $33.5 billion dollars off of vaccines alone this next year. This is crazy. You know, we could have solved this. I mean, over a year ago, the countries of the world could have gotten together as soon as uh, as, as soon as Biden was sworn in, he could have waived the IP rights to these vaccines. There were like there there were factories all over the world ready for the AstraZeneca vaccine, the Johnson and Johnson, everywhere. And we didn't do it. We did not mobilize and get everybody vaccinated. So what happened? Well, the UK variant happened. Then the Delta variant happened. Now the Omicron variant. It's like for the vaccine corporations allowed to make billions off of mostly publicly financed r and I mean, this is, cap this is late stage capitalism and it is failing us. I mean, the World Health Organization Claims it, it needs it, it lacks like thirteen billion dollars to you know get everything up and going. Massive vaccination uh, programs all over the world, and and yet we're giving thirty three billion dollars. Who is this from? It's from the governments. They're giving this. We could have just commandeered this stuff. National emergency. I mean, you know, there there is. I think we've discussed this before. There is the. Who was it? The the Bay Dole Act. God rest his soul. God has rest his soul. But I mean, this is it's an emergency. I mean, the president doesn't need even Congress to do this, but they won't. So we're going to have probably the two biggest problems this world is facing: COVID and global warming. I mean, this is that's a whole that's a whole another issue is where there are no marketplace solutions to this right. this is a failure of capitalism and unless we really understand that 
that you can't, I mean, the existence of these, these several billionaires is what's standing in between us and solving major problems on this planet. And we can't do it. Yep. <laughs> we're, we're insane. I don't know what has to happen before that dam breaks. And people, I don't know, real guillotines in public squares. Um, but it is just so, you know, even our best in Congress, you just feel they don't feel the urgency. We're not even, I don't think they're even going to pass this ludicrously watered down Build Back Better plan before Christmas. Or pass it at all. I, there's a part of me that thinks, well, it's never going to happen. The progressives should not raise the debt ceiling. Mm -hmm. Be kind of interesting. Well, Shut if the progressives shut down the government. Well, you know that because they're not willing to do this, and let's get back to your first statement. Why would you signal, even on your podcast or any public forum, that you feel obligated to back Biden or the Democrats? You have just given them license, meaning the Democratic leadership to be as awful as they possibly can get away with. I mean, that's, I, have, I was off a meeting earlier where, you know, uh, the, the, uh, our revolution works has many chapters in the state of Illinois. And yeah, I mean, it was young people who did get to the polls and did push Biden over the top. Barely in terms of the electoral college, by the way. And their number one issue was like the environment. Number two issue was likely, you know, student loan debt. But the environment was absolutely the number one issue among younger voters. Well, and Biden is now just <laughs> doing a damn thing. I, I think that there, the argument, I mean, David Cobb earlier was making the argument for third parties and what mm -hmm. third parties have accomplished. I, I feel that you need people in the Democrat. Everybody has a role to play. And right now, I feel my individual role is to purge the Democratic Party, to stay in it and take on these frauds. I'm looking for a fight. And there are people in the Democratic Party who have to go. They cannot defend themselves. And I want to hear them defend themselves, and they can't. Well, you know, that's admirable. And I, you know, I'm going to be going door to door in the frigid January weather for Janet Ahmad getting signatures to get him on the ballot. I mean, I will do this for individual candidates. However, some people have been asking me, why don't I run against Bill Foster? Like, you know, I have a million dollars lying around. But I'm thinking about it and I said, you know, I think the best thing I could do is run as an independent and, you know, take that five or six percent. I don't have to get the majority, take five or six percent. And if the Democratic Party is losing its mind over that, well, they'll have to sit down with me and negotiate. Exactly. And by the way, I want to see Bill Foster right now, this fall, introduce legislation. You know, that at least gives something to the people that got him elected. I mean, I'm look, Jill Stein made it very, very clear that if Bernie Sanders was going to be the nominee, that she would drop out of the race and endorse Bernie Sanders and have and 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 urge all the Green Party people to do that. I think that would have happened. But you have to think of just being the spoiler. You have to think of doing that to just push these guys because they don't understand anything else but force, but political power. And, you know, I'm sorry. I like Mark Carvesco. Is this his name? He, he seems very, very cool guy. Certainly is a window into the thinking, the inside thinking that goes on in Congress. But no, this isn't a blood sport at all. I mean, this is what you do to avoid blood in the streets. You have these big fights. Right. Publicly. Right. You know, that's and being polite and, you know, pretty please. And, oh, we're going to push Joe Biden left. You haven't done it at all 
as a matter of fact, he's, he seems to have, he and Nancy Pelosi seems to have utterly quieted the left. There's no talk of Medicare for all in the middle of a raging pandemic that we don't see any end of. Uh, you know, it's so, I, uh, I have to be of the position that, you know, I've got, you have to have some standards. I, I've told everybody back in 2008, I would never vote for Hillary Clinton because of her war vote. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was the deciding thing. I mean, that didn't, that didn't bother a lot of my folks around here because they were all for, uh, they were all for Obama. I was never going to vote for a racist like Joe Biden. Joe Biden, it still freaks me out that he's president. His his career should have ended in the 1980s. Right. But, you know, it didn't. Del- how hard is it to get elected? I mean, it's Delaware. We have to wrap it up, okay. unfortunately. Run for office. We'll set up a super PAC. You're muted. See, she's already watching what she... I just did, I just did that this year. Well, we need more people like you running. Professor Marianne mm-hmm. Cummings, thank you so much. We'll see you, I hope, Thursday for the mm-hmm. professor and Marianne. You're listening to The David Feldman Show. Friend me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. When we come back, we will be joined by... Oh, it didn't work. Did that work? Uh, When we come back, we will be joined by (laughs) Professor Mike Steinel. You're listening to The David Feldman Show. And uh, where am I here? Yes, I'm a little out of it today. You're You're listening to The David Feldman Show. We'll be right back. Thank you. It's time right now. For the David Feldman Show He's talking politics And comedy too Now tell a dirty joke If you want him to He's just a lefty From way back He's a union man With an Emmy for right Someday he's mad And he feels like fight <laughs> It's time right now for the David Feldman Show to get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. It's time right now of the David Feldman Show. So get your ears on right, the buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Professor Mike Steinel joins us in Denton, Texas. Hello there, Professor Mike Steinel. Hello, David. How how do I sound? Am I too loud? Not you loud you sound great and you look great. 
What is, well, uh, why do you have I Want Candy? Well, what? the song I have written for you today yes. is based on the Bo Diddley, the Bo Diddley um, vamp, which, and it was kind of stolen by three white guys, Bob Feldman, any relation? Yes. Seriously. Uncle Bob. <laughs> this is good. This is so good. Richard Gotterer and Jerry Golson. They they took that the vamp. Let me see if I I'm, I have lost a Who was uh, Bob who was Bob Feldman? They, they were three songwriters. They're still alive. Isn't there a Victor and Feldman who played with Steely Dan? He was Yeah, Victor Feldman played with Miles Davis too. He he was a great He was a great jazzer. But um, the, the, the Bo Diddley vamp is... But anyway, so they, I, I can't, when I wrote this song, I was worried a little bit about copyright infringement because I, I borrow some of that in the song. And then I realized that these three guys wrote a song called I Want Candy. And then <laughs> they, they, when they had that hit, they had to have a band. So they called themselves the Strange Loves. Hmm. And that's who did the, they did. And um, it was a tribute to Candy Johnson, who was a dancer in some of the beach, those beach movies. Ble beach, um, beach Blanket Bingo. Maybe she was in a couple. I, I Googled her today. Uh, she was in three of them at least. And it looks like from the pictures that she was already in her 40s by the time she was doing those. Right. But um, she was a good dancer. And, and uh, But it isn't, it's so funny. Like, it's, like, I want candy. Just, I thought it was about, there was a book called Candy that was kind of a, low, kind of a Lolita ripoff, wasn't there? I, I don't know. Yeah, there was a, there was semi pornographic book called Candy uh, when I was in high school. I always thought it was about that. I want a girl. I know a girl who's really sweet. Um, but anyway, uh, I thought that these three guys they called themselves the Strange Loves, and then they made up a backstory to fit it, and they said they were from Australia. Really. <laughs> And they were three That's brothers. Funny. This is three brothers: Giles, Niles, and Miles Strange. That's that's great. <laughs> it is great. Like the brothers you know, again. Yeah, like they they <laughs> they. Uh, but anyway, they, they all were pretty successful. Um, I don't know if you can see this. Can you pin my screen uh, so the people uh, can see? Well, it? you talk, and I'll uh, let me switch to speaker mode. There we go. Okay. There we go. But if, okay. Do I need to switch my view to see it? No, 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 no. Just stay. Okay. Just stay. Yeah. But anyway, the guy with the longer hair is Bob Feldman. I figured that out. And uh, it's so funny. But uh, like Richard Gott, Gotterer was a, he was a Brill uh, building. He wrote, um, Oh, what did he write? He wrote uh, an early 50s hit. Uh, my Boyfriend's Back. I think he wrote My Boyfriend's Back. Yes, that's right. But later he, he was a producer for Blondie and the Go-Go's. Hmm. And Jerry Goldstein, they all moved uh, to uh, California. And then one of them ended up in Nashville. And I think they're all still alive. Jerry Goldstein um, was a... Uh, Manager for Eric Burden's War. You know that band War? Yeah. Anyway, so uh, Giles, Niles, and Miles Strange. I thought that was pretty funny. But anyway, I've written this song as a Well, let me give you a proper introduction, which I never did. Yes, please. You sometimes give me an outro, which is good. Yeah. Too. Let me give you a proper introduction. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know you like sound effects. <laughs> I do. <laughs> uh, Mike, oh, come on, I'm not that funny. Mike Steinell is a jazz trumpeter, 
composer and educator. He was a member of the University of North Texas Jazz Studies faculty from 1987 to 2019. And he is the author of the highly acclaimed Essential Elements for Jazz Ensemble, Volumes 1 and 2, Building a Jazz Vocabulary, and the soon-to-be-released Running the Changes. If you want to listen to one of his CDs, go on Spotify and listen to Song and Dance, the Mike Steinel Quintet featuring Rosanna Eckerd. It's on Origin Records, and it's I, I, I love it. Please say hello to Professor Mike Steinel. Hello, Professor. <laughs> so I, I understand you like Catherine Liu. Yeah, I have to admit, I have a, I'm smitten. I'm a little smitten. I'm a little starstruck, smitten. I got a little Catherine Liu crush. She's so entertaining. Yes. You know, and the book is fantastic. I reread, I reread, I, mean, I reread, I guess that's right. I reread some of the stuff. Virtue just Hoarders. Today. Virtue Hoarders. Great yeah. little book. I hope mm -hmm. you can have her back and maybe play her this song, you know. Well, this will, but, um, this will, in lieu of hope. Catherine Liu, we will play <laughs> the, this song. Yes, I'm, I've, thank you, Professor Adnan Hussein, for bringing her on. And maybe yeah. this will, maybe we can lure Liu, who I believe was your first girlfriend, Lure Liu. From Denton, Texas, right? Literally? <laughs> no, no, I have, I have uh, no recollection of that. <laughs> you don't? Okay. Is it everybody in Denton named Lurlu? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, how are things in Denton? <laughs> hey, it got cold today. It got really chilly. I it got so cold, uh, Ted Cruz flew to Mexico. That's how cold yes, it was. Did he? That's how cold it was, yeah. yeah. Hey, um, I... I went over the last interview with Catherine and kind of I zabrooded it. I, I, mm -hmm. I looked and I mined it for a lot of things for the song. I have so much. I've been thinking about this song since. Um, was she on last week or was it? Yeah, a week ago, ago today. Yeah. I, after I heard her interview. And uh, I said, I'm going to do a song about her. I'm going to do a song and. Uh, it's kind of it's called who's afraid of Catherine Liu. It's you know, it takes it takes um, I take on the persona of the uh, a person of the professional managerial class. Um, that's not right, is it? Yeah, PMC. Yeah, the professional managerial class. Yeah, PMC. And um, but she, she, she just rapid fire comes out with so much information and says it so uh, cleverly and so succinctly. I, you know, you would just like, would you like to go to a party with her and just yes. sit, sit at a table and just let her and just feed her ideas? Hey, what do you think about this? And I have a feeling she would just keep things entertained for hours. She's uh, really vivacious. And uh, like I say, I'm a, a wee bit smitten. Yes. But uh, well, should we there's play other it? things. You want to play it? Sure. I, yeah. Well, uh, let me find it. Uh Oh, I found it. Okay. Um, cool. Well, first, now that I've got my sound effect machine up, hang on, I'm getting a call. It's Liam McEnany. <laughs> okay, hang on. Uh, here we go. Okay. Uh, let me turn this down. This is new music from Professor Mike Steinel, Who's Afraid of Catherine Liu. Correct? Correct. Can't wait. Who's afraid of Catherine Lou? I'm a little bit scared and you should be too. She's coming after us, you got her number. One eye open if you want to slumber Cause we're card-carrying members of the professional managerial class Ah, we went to the finest 
Sabbath school was all right. We protested Nam cause we didn't want to fight. We got solar panels and a Tesla car. But we think the Black Panthers went a bit too far. Cause we're card carrying members of the professional managerial class. We hoard our virtue nice and tight We hate everybody that's on the right We take advice from a spiritual llama Still got a crush on Barack Obama we're card-carrying members of the professional managerial class, managerial class. Our lifestyle is lubricious, our values are sclerotic. We're totally meretricious, we make politics erotic. We launder our reputation, we want to raise a minimum wage. As long as we can keep our vacations, and we can take along our maids. Cause we're not carrying members of the professional managerial class. Managerial class I'm afraid of Catherine Lou I must admit I don't know what to do All I want to do is stick to the man Turns out the man is who I am Cause I'm a card carrying member of the professional managerial class. Managerial class. Cause I'm a card carrying member of the professional managerial class. Managerial class. Cause I'm a card carrying member of the professional managerial class. Would you mind if I played that again? I have to hear that again. You have to unmute yourself. I, 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 need, sure. to, I need to hear that again. <laughs> that it, you just when you think you can't top yourself that the, is, the that police is are coming to get you david that is that is, and read the chat room people are one more time for professor mike stein i'm going to play that right now the first you went to the finest schools all right I love yeah, that. A little little, Dylan, that's a little Dylan thing right. there. But I um, noticed, Lou, I noticed some words from the. I went, let's play it again. I got to hear it again. Okay, it, first of all, I had to look up lubricious, lubricious. Am I saying it right? And I had to look up sclerotic. That's when you were talking about Bill Maher. Right, lubricious means kind of drunken, sexual. Well, sexual, yeah, depraved. It means yeah. depraved, I think. Yeah, yeah. lubricious is a great word. And then I, I rhymed it with uh, meretricious. Yeah, meretricious. There's some. There's some. The this meritocracy. Is, um, um, I, like, I like the uh, the one um, at the end. All I wanted to do is stick it to the man. Turns out the man yeah. is who I am. <laughs> it is a masterpiece. That's the whole. That's the whole feeling I got from her book. I'm going like. Wow, this is an indictment of just me, of me, and about everybody I know. Wow, you know, wow. and um, wow, you know, because because I'm a professional. I was a professional. You know, she she talks in there about uh, the fear, the fear of uh, loss of livelihood, and uh, that is in academia. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of be real honest that I probably, if I was still teaching, I probably wouldn't be doing this show. Oh, you know yeah. I, mean? I was reading about a, a professor. They would. Yeah. Yeah. 
and uh, you know, just because it's one word it's political, one word, yeah, one yeah. word, and uh, you know, so that's the benefit of being um, liberated in retirement, you know, and uh, but I have a question. She talked about the sixty eighters. Is that the sexual revolution? She considers that the people that the sexual revolution happened in sixty eight. That's a, I, I think a summer the, of love. Well, the Summer of Love, I think, was 67. I think the 68ers are the ones who... Uh, the anti-war protesters who got beaten up in Chicago and bled into okay. Chicago. You know, the uh, Chicago 7. And, right. You know. Wasn't it, wasn't it 68 when... Um, was that when... You, they, they either way, you hang on for one second. Hang on for one second. Either way, you're going to get this. Hang on. <laughs> Let's hear the song okay. again. What's your question? OK, what was your question? No, I just I was just going to I was just wondering about what she meant by this 68. She dropped it in there and I felt dumb that, oh, I don't know. I think from her book, I think she thinks that's the that's kind of when the sexual revolution happened. That's Woodstock, and you know that's right around there. But it doesn't really matter. But yeah. um, I'm pretty happy with. I, I put a lot of you, bass on you, this. you, 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 <laughs> you. Well, this is a let's masterpiece. play it again. I'm gonna dance now. Who's afraid <laughs> of Catherine Lou? Cause 
That is a masterpiece. That's that is just <laughs> phenomenal. Thank you. I may I play it. I'm, it together. I'm, I'm ready to play it again. I'm thinking. <laughs> here's the problem. I have monomania, and I listen to music over. Like I will listen to the same song over and over again, and yeah. I don't know. I would easily play that again, but I thinking that Maybe would be your audience would want something a little it different. might be uh yeah uh when you hear that are you able to enjoy it the way everybody else can? yeah i like that but i like the way that turned out i like the you know what i did on that um i stacked a lot of stuff it's funny like you you, you know you start with just a and i've learned it i i need to put some uh, you know gestalt figure ground what do you mean? Fig Gestalt, there's a thing called figure and ground. And the figure is the thing that gets your notice, but it means nothing unless it has something that's ground. Right. It doesn't change. So there's a lot of repetition. And then there's a little, these. This, I got a little piano part in there, you know, just a little bit, you know, and then I put the heart. And it's funny, like um, one thing I've learned from, and I mentioned this last time from doing your show and doing these things is that the more I put stuff in there, the more interesting it gets. And then I added, I did, I did real shaker, which, and I like the feel of that. And I notice when I listen back that one of the things I do is as the, as the, and I think it worked out in good, as it gets to the end, I start to play on top of the beat with the percussion. So it's, it's, it's moving ahead all the time. And I like that feeling. I don't like, see, that's the thing about um, drum machines and all that. They just, they're really boring. So th this is, I did the drums. I made the drums on the keyboard and I like the way it, it feels a little uh, warmer than when I use just a, a canned drum track, you know, but um, you, it's, um, I, I'm a, I, I can enjoy that one. I will, what I do on uh, Tuesday mornings is I get up early and I have coffee with my wife and we listen to the show, uh, you know, and, and uh, she, I think she'll enjoy this one. I didn't say anything dirty, so that's good. Um, well, you're not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> You're not done yet. I owe you an apology. Pig for, what? for well, pig for love has been butchered. Oh, God. <laughs> it's been why? Well, why what? On today's show with Howie Klein, we were trying to line up a call, so I played yeah. pig for love, but I forgot to pot down my microphone, so I talked over it. And then Ethan oh, the other right. night was singing along with Pig I for loved Love. It. I love. I, I gotta get him. I think we can uh, insert him in the vocals. So it's got the bass. I'm a pig for love. I should. Well, I, should, I was, but I do I think lower it down about. Uh, I'm gonna lower it down about a fifth. I'm still not happy with Pig for Love, and there, you know, that's my little beef. Is that your it, little it beef? <laughs> my little beef with you but those some of those pigs are pretty cute actually yes, they in that are. video <laughs> well that's my message is don't eat pigs i'm a don't eat pigs because they're vegan. You're cute pigs yeah. are great animals would you consider uh doing something with ethan just something down the oh line? yeah i've I, I you know i have i have his email because we've talked um about something else he had a student uh, that he wanted to introduce me to, and uh, so I have I have that information, and we might get to do that. Might be the maybe something way. Freudian <laughs> for his dad. How about a song well, about? You know, I, I did a I did a theme song for them, but then I learned quickly that you quit playing theme songs for people. You know, no, just did. send it to me. I'm, whatever you want me to play. 
just send it to me. I'm well, you, you don't. You no longer play. I mean, after all the, you know. Uh, no, you're right. You I gave bet. me about Harvey J. K. You never played, but I've got a new one for Harvey J. Because it's Minsky and K. If you send me, I apologize. Minsky and K. One's in L. A. The other's in Green Bay. That's. Great. You, David um, Feldman, don't you call me because I can't go. Harvey, uh, Misky, and Kay are on the show today. I did a horrible thing today on this one, though, the one I just did. I, you know, you got all the tracks in a file with everything there so that you can go back and later mix and stuff. I saved it. I, I, um, I replaced it with a condensed file that's already mixed. So I can't go back and use that. <clears throat> I can't go back and tweak anything really, or add like a, another voice. And I'm not real happy with. Uh, uh, we are members of a passion and the jury. Um, they're kind of the vocals are kind of wimpy. That's the one thing I might change. I need to hire some uh, some real backup singers. I think it's great. It's perfect. Well, I'm glad you like it. And yeah, I, I love you. That, that and, you uh, cheered me up. I was having a bad decade, so you. This you know, the, the Zoom looks okay. The Zoom looks okay. Not on YouTube, and it's just something that uh, I wanted to. You know, if something works and you, it does, it stops working, and you can't get. Uh, yeah. It, it just it annoys me, and uh, I was going to ask you a question about something hang on they're still crazy for sondheim did you see the sunday papers no hang on big uh big articles about sondheim still oh what about a song about uh an oedipal where where ethan sings Kills his father well just a song about the oedipus <laughs> complex okay i gotta figure out what rhymes with oedipus probably quite a lot <clears throat> Okay, I'll work on that. I've got a, a couple other ideas, you know, that I wanted to want to do. You know, um, uh, hey, did, did you know that um, a couple of days ago there was a, a palindrome date? Yes. Twelve o two. Twenty twenty one is yes. a palindrome, and I think we're, we're not going to have another palindrome date for a long time. Because the years will be 22, 30, you know, they're, they're beyond what the months would be. Is that right? Yeah. I think so. I think does, we're at the does end Sondheim die on a palindrome day? That would have been appropriate. Uh, no, I think he died the day after Thanksgiving. He died Friday after Thanksgiving. Wow. Because he had Thanksgiving with uh, friends, and then he died the next day. I, no got, the, I got his book. I'm going to get into it. But yeah. um, anyway... That's about all I got, David. Yeah, that's it's more than enough. Thank you. <laughs> Thank God bless you. I love you. Thank you, Mike love Steinel. You too, right? I you. God bless this man. He is an inspiration. Mike Steinel is a jazz trumpeter, as you know, a composer, as you can tell, and an educator. And he was a member of the University of North Texas Jazz Studies faculty from '87 to 2019 author of the highly acclaimed Essential Elements for Jazz Ensemble, Volumes 1 and 2, Building a Jazz Vocabulary, and Running the Changes should be coming out pretty soon, as well as Lake House, his Murder Mysteries, The Man is Prolific and Great. He, he you. He's like, you're like Stephen King. You just <laughs> turn it out. All right. You do. <laughs> okay. And... Go by Song and Dance, the Mike Steinel Quintet, featuring Rosanna Eckert on Origin Records. Thank you, sir. Thank you, David. Bye bye. What a what amazing what an amazing job, Pro Professor Marianne Cummings. Wasn't that amazing? That was amazing. Oh damn! As you said, this man has never had writer's block yep. ever. Yep. Unfortunately, I haven't either, <laughs> which is. Uh, anyway, Henry Huckamacki is in Russia, and he's the co-host of Guerrilla History. He joins us, and then Jackie, the joke man, 
Martling, let us now go to Russia, where Henry Huckamacki, host of Guerrilla History, is standing by. It's pre-recorded, but it sounds more professional. Hello, David, coming back to you from Russia. And I've got, as always, an excellent guest to be joining us today and a guest that's going to be talking with us about a topic that I kind of wanted to get into when I was on the show for the first time live after being in Russia. And uh, now that we'll, now that uh, my guest is here, we'll have the opportunity to really dive into this because he has been studying this uh, to some extent. My guest is first time guest, Taylor Genovese. Hello, Taylor. How are you doing today? I am doing great, Henry. Thanks for having me. I'm real excited to be on the show. Absolutely. It's great to talk to you. So Taylor is a, a comrade of mine who does some very excellent work and uh, is studying some very interesting topics. And I thought that it would be a, a really good time to bring him on. So Taylor, since it's your first time on the show, why don't I just turn it over to you and let you introduce yourself to the listeners in any way that you see fit? Sure. Yeah. Um, I am a, a PhD candidate uh, at Arizona State University. Um, my, I'm an anthropologist. My background is in cultural anthropology. Um, the PhD program that I'm in is an interdisciplinary program though. Um, so I study the, what the title of my, uh, PhD is, which is human and social dimensions of science and technology. Um, so it's a pretty broad field, but, um, you're able to do a lot with it. Uh, and I bring kind of an anthropological perspective, uh, to science, technology, and religion, which is my, uh, special specialty, I guess, for in the program. Yeah, excellent. And the reason that we're bringing you on, the main reason, I'm hoping to bring you back on basically anytime you want, really. Um, but the main reason that we're bringing you on now is that you recently returned to the U.S. from Ukraine, where you were doing some field work. And the field work that you were doing was quite interesting. So um, instead of having me try to explain what your field work was, why don't we just let you tell the listeners roughly what your field work was, what you were looking for, and perhaps some other things that you noticed while you were in Ukraine that weren't necessarily directly related to the field work that you were doing, but ended up uh, being quite interesting to you anyway. Yeah. Um, so as an anthropologist, for those that aren't familiar, um, field work in cultural anthropology is a very inductive process. Um, so uh, my plans and my research questions and some of the things that I ended up looking at in Ukraine began to change after I entered the country. Um, my main dissertation work uh, centers on a, a philosophy called cosmism or Russian cosmism um, that many pinpoint to a librarian philosopher named Nikolai Fyodorov in the 1880s, um, who was a librarian in Moscow. Um, and so I'm really interested in the ways that this cosmist philosophy has endured or reconfigured, uh, depending on how different social groups deploy its ideas. Um, so the main kind of thrust of cosmism uh, centers on ideas about physical immortality, geoengineering, um, and space travel. Um, so this may sound familiar to many, especially in the West, because um, uh, what I'm really ultimately interested in looking at are the ways that reactionary libertarian capitalists, particularly in Silicon Valley, uh, which we hear a lot about now, um, have taken up a similar project that Fyodorov was talking about, yet they've stripped it, uh, stripped this philosophy of all elements of egalitarianism. Um, so uh, that's what really what I'm studying. But as I entered U Ukraine, um, I wanted to investigate whether there were these traces of cosmos thought there, but I quickly realized there were a lot of these ancillary kind of junctions that I should follow instead uh, that were still related, but, but were definitely ancillary um, within uh, spheres of memory and nostalgia. These are the two kind of uh, uh, concepts that I was really honed in on, protect, particularly when I, um, went to the Chernobyl exclusion zone, uh, which I was able to access and carry out some field work. Uh, and after leaving that field site, after that excursion was complete, uh, as, as is 
often happens in, in anthropological work. It changed the way that I saw other parts of the country, um, particularly many of the aesthetic aspects uh, that that I saw around Ukraine. Um, uh, the Ukrainian government uh, uh, has attempted really uh, the way I see it, uh, to strip away a lot of its Soviet past, uh, uh, to remove any kind of n- nostalgic triggers um, through a uh, set of laws that they call decommunization laws um, that went into effect in 2015. Um, and so that's really what I, I suddenly saw happening uh, after leaving the exclusion zone. It's really interesting and something that I forgot to mention during the introduction uh, and just to put our cards on the table a little bit here is that if you're wondering the perspective that Taylor is coming to this from, uh, Taylor is also one of the editors of the excellent journal Peace, Land and Bread, which is a Marxist-Leninist journal published by the Center for Communist Studies. Really excellent journal. If you're a fan of guerrilla history, of course, the podcast that I co-host, you'll also most likely be a fan of peace, land, and bread, and vice versa. If you're listening to this because you're a fan of peace, land, and bread, and Taylor, by extension, um, you'll also probably like guerrilla history. So check out that podcast that I co-host along with Brett O'Shea of Revolutionary Left Radio and Professor Adnan Hussein, if you're interested. But just to put our cards on the table a little bit. Right. Yeah, very good. So you, you mentioned a few things uh, that we're going to try to dig into in the next 25 minutes or so. Um, but the first that I want to talk about is one of the things that you ended up coming out of this field work with and something that you're looking on expanding on is uh, a concept that you talked about at a conference recently called cannibal dialectics. It's this concept that you're, that you're putting forward. And I found it to be a very interesting uh, concept. I also found the presentation that you did at this conference to be quite interesting as well. Before we talk about cannibal dialectics itself, though, I think it would be useful for us to do a brief refresher on dialectics more generally, more broadly, because we have talked about dialectics on the David Feldman show before, but it's, you know, intermittent. We'll talk about it once or twice, and then it'll be a few months before we mention it again. The show, David, I know nobody's complaining, but it's a seven hour long show. So, you know, the one mention of dialectics every couple of months might not be picked up on by everyone. So let's just remind everybody what dialectics is in a very broad sense before we dive into cannibal dialectics. Yeah. Uh, so dialectics in, in less than 25 minutes is quite the challenge uh, already. Right. Uh, and there's a, there is a joke, uh, you know, that you, you ask a hundred philosophers what dialectics are and you'll get a hundred different answers. But um, with that in mind, um, dialectics is, uh, um, well, it's a, it's a philosophical method uh, that's probably made most famous by uh, the philosopher Hegel, German uh, philosopher Hegel, but it goes back really to classical Greek philosophy as well. Um, but it's really a way of reconciling uh, contradictions, uh, or, or maybe a better word would be, uh, it's a way of analyzing contradictions. Uh, and um, this explanation will be a bit of an over, oversimplification just because it has to be, but um, you have one concept uh, called the thesis, uh, which is met by a contradiction called an antithesis. Uh, and these two concept, uh, you know, contradictional concepts are resolved through uh, struggle or tension between them, which results in a synthesis of the thesis and, and the antithesis. Um, Hegel tweaked this kind of earlier understanding of dialectical reasoning with another triad, uh, which he called um, uh, abstract, negative, and concrete. Uh, and Hegel described the overcoming of the negative by the abstract, um, Aufhebung. Uh, I probably pronounced that terribly. I don't speak German. Um, but it's often translated in English as sublation or, or to abolish or to overcome. Um, but roughly, he was trying to describe the way um, that useful portions of the abstract and the negative are preserved uh, while moving beyond the limits into the concrete. And so this is where we sometimes get a confusing Hegelian description, the negation of the negation. Um, but it's, it's ultimately dialectics as a way of analyzing and, or reconciling contradictory concepts or material uh, um, actions. 
Yeah, and you mentioned to add there, Henry. I, I, the, no, no. I mean, uh, like you said, it, it's an oversimplification, and people that read Mao would be very mad that we just went through something that sounds very much like the two into one view of dialectics, whereas you know they are very firm believers in of the one into two viewpoint of dialectics. Yes, listeners, we understand this is a b- very, very big oversimplification. But like we said. We're trying to do a two-minute overview, not a two-year overview. So I promise, uh, I, I, I promise I'll self-crit after this. Uh, to- self-crit, put it in peace, land, and bread, and then we'll direct everybody over to the, the journal to read about that self-criticism. Um, but yeah, I think that talking about the negation of the negation is important because that really is one of the main points of your concept of cannibal dialectics, or I should say the sublimation of the p- possibility of a negation of a negation. So why don't I let you turn, uh, I'll turn it over to you to kind of introduce your concept of cannibal dialectics from a more theoretical level rather than an analytical level. Um, we can talk about that. We can talk about the uneasy state that it results in this uh, as a result of this cannibal dialectic um, kind of state i don't know have really have a better way of putting it than that uh and the reasons why that is yeah um so this is a concept that's very new that i'm playing with still um so it's very early um but essentially i was trying to uh, uh come up with a name for something that i started seeing in ukraine that i also see here in the united states that i see happening in europe of um rather than a a resolution of contradictions i'm seeing a kind of uh falling out a a uh a deterioration uh that that generates itself uh in in a in a kind of way that if philosophers are listening or psychologists are listening that jung describes the shadow as um and so there's this kind of shadow that is spreading around technology centers and is replicating itself around the world in ways that are bottoming out the, what you could describe as the soul of a place or of a, um, uh, uh, the kind of, uh, concrete, um, liveliness of, um, of places or, or, uh, um, I'm, I'm really interested in the concrete of the places of it. So, um, what I, what I, what led me to see this, uh, uh, was in Kiev, there's, uh, a bu- there was a building down the street from where I was living, uh, that was cover uh, a building covered with these beautiful mosaic tiles, uh, from the Soviet era. Uh, and this building, uh, was being maintained, uh, by Nike, um, by this corporation that had moved in and kind of gutted it out. Um, except it, re- it left the tiles, uh, and it, and we see this happening a lot with these, uh, kind of large corporations, especially tech corporations in which they're trying to find some kind of liveliness or soul within these kinds of spaces. Um, but they're un- constantly unsatisfied by it, um, because they're constantly moving to places where they think they're going to find it, but they're left unfulfilled. And we hear this a lot as anthropologists, we're hearing this a lot from tech engineers and tech people that they're moving into these spaces, looking for some kind of magic to invigorate themselves. Um, but, uh, when they get there, they feel let down. They feel, they feel like, uh, what they, what they're seeing isn't living up to the expectation that they thought they were going to get. Um, and what I, I'm calling this as cannibal dialectics because rather than the famous Marx quote of capital being um, is dead labor, you know, it feeds vampire like on the, on living labor, which is an extractive metaphor, right? That it's removing something. Instead, what I'm seeing with the tech companies is actually generating something, but it's generating something that is, that is not very good. Right. So instead of extracting the good and then, holding on to it, it's becoming, it's spreading itself around like uh, a, a virus, right? But it's feeding, constantly feeding, which is where the cannibal uh, uh, metaphor comes in. 
So yeah, that's a very good overview of the theoretical side of things. But as you mentioned earlier, dialectics is is used as an analytical framework to analyze the real world. So I guess what would be probably more interesting for the average listener of the show who's not a uh, you know philosopher, how how can we use this concept of cannibal dialectics? You kind of laid it out there a little bit, but how can we use this concept of cannibal dialectics to analyze the real world, and how can we use that to further our understanding of the world? So the way that I've been using it, because I'm I'm very much an active. I'm, I'm not about the theoretical as much, right? I, I'm interested in this, the, the active. So I'm starting to try and think of some of these concepts that we think of as being nebulous, uh, as uh, having real concrete um, ability to um, influence and change what's going on in the world. So I'm looking at my argument is that concepts like Silicon Valley or this, this nebulous blob we name Silicon Valley isn't really a bounded place any longer. It's not this closed border within the Santa Clara Valley. Uh, rather, Silicon Valley is a culture with a capital C that can has the ability to move around the world. And so we start seeing Silicon Valleys popping up all around the world uh, in uh, areas that are as I described, they're trying to sap something from the native area, uh, but still replicating the same kind of architecture, the same kind of uh, uh, political economy, the same kind of, you know, every kind of cultural aspect that existed in Silicon Valley. Likewise, we see, I'm calling cosmism uh, as something which is no longer bounded within Eurasia. We're seeing that here in, here in the United States, we're seeing it in Europe as these, forces that are able to manipulate the world. And the, the major problem that we have now is that uh, these uh, Silicon Valley billionaires have accumulated so much capital that they're able to enact their personal egotistical view of the world into our world, right, as, as a community. And so this becomes uh, very dangerous, obviously. Um, but looking at it with this framework of uh, uh, of kind of viral framework or a framework of, of cannibalizing things, we can start to analyze and hopefully maybe combat some of these material forces that these billionaires are enacting and press pressing upon us. That's great. Uh, I, I'm very excited about this concept. Like you said, you're really just starting to toy around with it now, but uh, I, I'm really looking forward to the further development of this concept and and the usage of it as an analytical framework in the real world. So I'm going to keep us moving because I want to cover a lot if if we can. And again, we, I'll bring you back anytime that you want, but I do want to get a a lot of things into this interview. So there's two things that I kind of want to bring up um, that I was thinking maybe I'll bring them up if we have time, but they, I think that they fit pretty well right here. So one is the the Russian concept of Tosca, which is um, kind of like longing or uh, almost like when you lose something, the the feeling that you have. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that that fits into the concept of cannibal dialectics pretty well. And also one of the things that you uh, were talking about in your presentation at, at the conference where you were talking about cannibal dialectics was uh, related to the field work that you did. And it's the self settlers in the exclusion zones. So like you said, you, you did some work in the exclusion zone uh, around Chernobyl. And uh, there's these self settlers there that I think also these two things kind of relate to each other uh, in certain ways. So if I can keep it relatively brief, because there is a big topic that we will be getting to soon. Um, but can you talk about Tosca a little bit and how that fits in within this analytical framework, as well as uh, the self settlers in the exclusion zone, perhaps as a case study uh, of, of Tosca, as well as perhaps how they might tangentially fit within um, cannibal dialectics. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, this is the big uh, conceptual um, affect, I guess, that I use within this is this concept of Tosca because we don't really have this word. It's not easily translatable in English, right? As you said, it kind of has this feeling, of, it's like longing or, or um, 
uh, you know, that you, you have melancholias is in there as well. Um, but it can also kind of mean, uh, that it's kind of longing and melancholia, but there's boredom in there as well. Or, you know, that it's, it's hard to translate into English, but, uh, uh, I think it's useful because, uh, it really, uh, encapsulates the, the, a wider breadth of what nostalgia uh, can mean. Um, we, we have a kind of closed, uh, idea of nostalgia in English, but so I use this, these, uh, as an ethnographic case study, these semosolia, the, the self settlers that return that have recently returned to the exclusion zone and have been allowed to resettle in the outer areas of the exclusion zone, which are actually getting, uh, which are actually because of containment efforts, not that radioactive anymore. It's, it's relatively safe in the, in the outer regions of the exclusion zone. And so they've been allowed to resettle there. What I found interesting and is that they, there's a deep connection to the Palesia, the geographical region uh, there between the self settlers and the region. So much so that where they're living, uh, it doesn't have electricity. It doesn't have running water. They're serviced with deliveries of food and sundries, usually only once a month that go out there to take care of them. And only people that are over 50 years old are allowed to return uh, to that area as a precaution for the radiation. Um, but there, there, there's a deep um, nostalgia that is in contradiction to the decommunization going on in that country because many of these self-settlers are returning to their kolkhoz, the collective farms where they grew up, um, and practicing and living in the same way that they lived and grew up when it was the Soviet Union. Uh, and so there's a longing there. There's a, um, a, a connection to the earth, the literal place that is drawing people back there. Um, and so I don't want to, I, I could go uh, more and talk about the stalkers, the people that enter the zone illegally too, uh, that are also drawn by these, this kind of feeling of Tosca, even though a lot of them grew up uh, not knowing about the Soviet Union. So there's this kind of draw going on, um, this affective draw going on there. Yeah. So now I'm going to do a pivot and we're going to talk about a topic that's kind of divorced from this in, in, in some ways. Um, but something that this is the topic that I was hoping that I could talk about on, on David's show when I came on live a couple weeks ago, but wasn't able to because of time constraints, of course, which is decommunization. So decommunization, as you mentioned, is this formalized legal practice within Ukraine. Um, so I'm going to ask you kind of like a two part question, but don't feel constrained by how I'm asking it. Feel free to take it however you want it. So the first part of it is, can you expand on what decommunization is a little bit for the listeners? Because I feel like um, for those who haven't previously heard of it, they still probably don't have much of an idea of what it is. But then the second thing, and, and I'll just throw it out there right away, is that it's very interesting to me that decommunization is happening and has, I mean, happened extensively in Ukraine because Ukraine really, in terms of the populace, does have warm memories of the Soviet Union. Pretty much every few years, there's a big poll that comes out from post-Soviet countries asking the people, did you prefer communism or do you prefer capitalism? Was life better under communism or is life better under the current system that we have. Uh, there was a very famous one that came out from Pew in 2008. I keep the results of it close by at hand because I, I cite it all the time. In Ukraine, they asked the people, is life better now than under communism? 75% said no, it was better under communism. Only 12% said yes. And in 2008, all of the individuals who were taking the survey would have been alive during the Soviet time. So this is a, a very good time to do this poll. Although, a little bit tricky because it was getting into the great recession. So that might've colored people's perspective of what the, the system now is like, but still 75 to 12 said that it was better under communism. That was much higher than in Russia, for example. And in Russia here, we, we absolutely do not have decommunization. I mean, there's Soviet relics literally all over the place. The district I live in is called Sovietsky. Uh, it's the Soviet district of the city. It's everywhere. So like I said, the second part really wasn't a question, more of just a statement that you can play off of, but take it however you want it, Taylor. What is decommunization and what are your thoughts uh, about it, just for the listeners? 
Sure. Yeah. Uh, the, the long and short of it really is the decommunization laws. They, they came into practice after the Maidan, uh, if, if folks remember when that happened. Uh, and in 2015, they really came into effect. Uh, essentially, what they did was they outlawed all they tried to outlaw communism, uh, the idea and the material practices of it. So in order to do that, they banned uh, three political parties, the Communist Party of Ukraine, the Communist Party of Ukraine Renewed, and the Party of Worker and Workers and Peasants, which are were three uh, political parties that w- identified with the uh, uh, Soviet project. It also outlawed... Uh, which is what I find even more interesting is they also outlawed all aesthetic components that have to do with the former Soviet union outlawed the hammer and sickle outlawed the red star outlawed anything that was on the emblem of the Soviet union or on the emblem of the, uh, of the Ukrainian, uh, you know, Soviet Republic. Um, and so, in order to uh, comply with this, they have ripped down statues, ri- uh, you know, ripped out anything that has these symbols on it or plastered them over. And so what this has created is kind of this ugly infrastructure uh, uh, that I, I have a photo essay that I'm working on in a film that I shot while I was there that that kind of documents this. Uh, where you see, I, I, you see what it used to look like prior to 2015 and now, and you have this kind of like plastered overness, this, uh, you, this, uh, idea that is usually levied against communists of, uh, censorship and like not allowing, you know, uh, covering things over this is being employed by or, or deployed by the, the, um, right wing, you know, government that is now in charge. We've also seen a, heavy spike of right-wing populist movements similar to the United States um, and throughout the world really is happening in Russia as well. Uh, um, but the, the, um, the second part of, of your question about how, how uh, the decommunization has, has kind of uh, formulated itself, I guess, uh, or, or uh, what was the second part that, that we should touch on Um uh yeah um well let me jump in for one second and just mention when you said that you there's this ugly infrastructure left over uh folks if you want if you're interested in this just just google decommunization ukraine and you'll see literal like beautiful murals beautiful murals that had a tiny hammer and sickle in them somewhere or a small red star in them somewhere we're talking a mural that's you know 50 feet wide by 70 feet tall and there was a five inch by five inch hammer and sickle somewhere in there, like on a flag in the mural. And they would go in with hammers and chisels and literally chisel out a part of the mural because even that was seen to be subversive. And to just kind of bounce back to that second part of the question, as you mentioned, it's very interesting because it's, there is a right-wing government there. There's very strong right-wing factions present within Ukraine. This is something I talked about during that first live appearance that I made on the show when I, when I came back or when I came to Russia, um, there's these very active right wing, uh, groups within Ukraine, but yet there still is this very deep, uh, longing. We could almost say Tosca in some ways, uh, for the Soviet union for communism. I mean, it's overwhelmingly popular with the populace there. And yet the government that's in charge, uh, and this is across two administrations now since uh, 2015, they're still, I mean, really, really diving headfirst into these decommunization practices, despite the fact that these, that the communism is still quite popular with the people who were alive during the Soviet Union. So I find that to be a very interesting contradiction there, that you have government doing one thing and sentiment, mass sentiment, completely the other way. I find that quite interesting. Yeah. Um, so when I was there, I would, I would talk to people on the street and ask what they thought about the Soviet union, especially older people that had lived through it. And I didn't get any negative, uh, reaction, uh, from people that I maybe talked to 15 or 20 people, um, as I was, you know, sitting on the, at, at memorials or sitting on the street or waiting for the, you know, the, the Metro or whatever. Uh, and overwhelmingly it was, it was much more stable. 
uh, before I had a pension, I could live uh, in my home, which I can't do, you know, all of these la- this laundry list of uh, things that we, we would hear from, or I would hear from people. Uh, but we don't hear about that in the West, particularly because similar to Cuba, uh, the diaspora, Ukrainian diaspora is heavily right wing. And so what we hear is Ukraine was this, you know, place that was tortured and uh, ignored and it was despotic. Um, But the people that are actually living in Ukraine think differently. While I was there, there was actually a a fascist rally uh, in Kiev. Um, So these contradictions display themselves uh, on a daily basis there, right? There is a small segment of the population uh, in Ukraine that are in belief of these kind of fascist ideas and right-wing ideas, but an overwhelming majority of the people there are, have this longing, this Tuska for their life before the fall. Um, and so they're, uh, they're, they're deeply engaged in it. Uh, but all we hear about because the government enables the right, uh, and and literally suppresses the left. Uh, it's not just a suppression through uh, kind of a, a, a cultural suppression that we see a lot in the West, but literal banning of the parties, uh, outlawing of symbols um, that we you you only really hear about that in the in in the West, right? Um, so it, yeah, the contradictions are ripe. Super interesting and something that we could certainly talk quite a bit more about. Uh, Unfortunately, we're completely out of time. So uh, Taylor, uh, Taylor Genovese, again, was my guest. Super fun to talk to you. Uh, I'm hoping that we can get you to come back on the show again sometime to talk about, uh, to continue this conversation or talk about something completely different. Up to you. Uh, I know that there's a lot of things that we uh, have common interests in. So uh, really anything, it's up to you. Why don't I have you just tell the listeners how they can find you, find your work and find peace, land and bread. Um, which again, I highly recommend the journal to anybody who, like I said, is a fan of guerrilla history, or even if you're just a fan of the David Feldman show, you still might find some very interesting material within peace, land and bread. So Taylor, how can the listeners find you in your work that you're doing? Sure. Yeah. I'm on Twitter at T R Genovese. Uh, and you can also find my work at taylorgenovese.com. I have a website there where I have any of my writing and films and photography. Um, you could find peace land and bread at peacelandbread.com or communiststudies.org. Uh, and you can find uh, a lot of really great information there. Um, and, uh, tons of reading material. So we're working on our our next issue now. Yeah, absolutely. And just a last brief mention, I'm sorry, David, that we're overrunning by a minute, but uh, Peace, Land and Bread is completely free to read. Uh, So listeners, it's not like a lot of journals where you have to subscribe. And a lot of these academic journals, as you know, are quite expensive to subscribe to. Peace, Land and Bread has a print edition that's available for pretty low prices in case you like reading things in print, or they make all of the PDFs available for free on the website. So uh, don't worry about having to pay for it. If you'd like PDFs, it's all there available for you. So on that note, David, we'll turn things back over to you. Again, thank you, Taylor Genovese, for coming on to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comedy, too. He'll tell a dirty joke if you want him to. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a union man with an Emmy for writing. Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show To get your ears on right, buckle in real tight He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way It's 
this time right now Of the Dame Bill Feldman Show So get your ears on right And buckle in real tight He's got a lot to say And he's coming your way He's got a lot to say And he's coming your way He's got a lot to say And he's coming your way All right, here we go. From New York, from beautiful Bayville, on the glorious Gold Coast of Long Island's North Shore, let's welcome our old friend Jackie the Joke Man Martling. See Jackie Thursday, December 16th at the West Palm Kennel Club in West Palm Beach, Florida. Ticket information, go to jokeland.com. You'll love Jackie's autobiography, The Joke Man Bowed to Stern, syllables and words and paragraphs. Oh my. Follow Jackie on Twitter at Jackie Martling. Repeatable jokes every day at 4.20 p.m. International Marijuana Time. Hey, you want the perfect holiday gift? You want personalized videos? Go to cameo.com com forward slash Jackie Martling laughs 24 seven call Jackie's dirty joke line. Use your finger. 516-922-WINE. Hello, Jackie. Mommy, mommy, what's euthanasia? Shut up and unplug your grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> So girl says, Harry, I'm going to have a baby. That's impossible. I had a vasectomy. I didn't say we, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know why priests don't moon? <laughs> you know why priests don't moonlight as lifeguards? Why is that? <laughs> because the kids have to be drowning before you can kiss them. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Okay. Great green globs of grimy, greasy gopher guts, mutilated monkey meat, concentrated turkey feet. Great green globs of grimy, greasy gopher guts, and me without my spoon. <laughs> <laughs> and Felton, I figured out how to make my cock nine inches. How's that? Folded in half. <laughs> <laughs> So Mrs. Johnson says, wake up, Johnny. It's 6.30. Time to get up and go to school. Ma, I don't want to go to school. Come on, Johnny. You have to go. I don't want to, Ma. I hate school. The kids hate me. The teachers hate me. But the janitors hate me. Johnny, get up. You got to go to school. Why, Ma? Because you're 40 years old and you're the fucking principal. <laughs> <laughs> so two pals are sitting across the bar from a pair of old drunks. The first guy says, you know, that that's us in 10 years. The other guy says, that's a mirror, you asshole. <laughs> So a guy wakes up really hungover, and the foot of the bed's a very, very ugly girl. <laughs> Woo! She smiles at him, and she says, what are we going to name it? <laughs> oh. He picks up the rubber he used the night before. He ties a knot in it, twirls it around, tosses it out the window, and says, if he gets out of this one, we'll call him Houdini. <laughs> 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 hey, what's the difference between your wife and Santa Claus? What? Well, there's an outside chance Santa Claus might give you a blowjob. <laughs> <laughs> what's the only thing worse than seeing your father naked with a raging heart on? What? <laughs> Seeing your mother naked with a rage. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice, very nice. Very nice, yes. <laughs> so, guys, this is the bartender. My wife told me for Christmas I should get myself one of those dick enlargers. So I did. The bartender says, You did? Yep. She's 21 and her name's Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> hey, why did the Jewish guy break off his engagement and get a dog instead? Why? The license was cheaper. The dog didn't have a mother and it already had a fur coat. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Falcon, here's this week's cheer. Are you ready? Yes. What do we want? What do we want? A cure for Tourette's. When do we want it? Come. <laughs> nice. I like that. I think it's a little silly. Yes. But I think it's funny. Mm-hmm. So it's dark. It's almost dark, and a mounted cop's in traffic next to a little kid on a bike. He says, nice bike, kid. Santa bring that to you? He says, yep. Well, next year, tell Santa to put a taillight on that bike. He says, nice horse you got there. Santa bring that to you? The cop says, yeah. Well, next year, tell Santa to put the prick underneath the horse instead of on its back. A little old lady, a little old lady's walking along the mansions. She's walking along a row of mansions, and on the lawn in front of one of the mansions, there's five couples stark naked, fucking to beat the band. She knocks on the door, and when a woman in, she says, what the, what the hell is going on out here? The woman says, lady, this is a whorehouse, and we're having a yard sale. <laughs> So how does a hillbilly farmer tell the difference between a bull and a cow in the dark? How does a hillbilly farmer tell the difference between a bull and a cow in the dark? How? (laughs) He sticks his nose in the animal's ass, and if there's a place for his tongue, it's a cow. (laughs) 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 So Schwartz, Revelian, O'Flanagan, our old friend, Schwartz, Revelian, O'Flanagan, are walking along down south. And a bunch of rednecks jump out from behind a bush. The biggest guy says, all right, y'all got 15 inches of cock between you. We're going to let y'all go. So Schwartz pulls it out, and he's got seven inches. Revelli pulls it out, and he's got seven and a half inches. O'Flanagan pulls it out, and he's got a half inch. Well, he hit the total, so the rednecks let him go. And as they're walking away, Schwartz says, I'm glad I had seven inches. And Ravelli says, yeah, it's a good thing I had a seven and a half inches. O'Flanagan says, I, and thanks to the Lord, I had a heart on. <laughs> <laughs> so Stokowski's on the sidewalk in New York City when a whore walks up and says, you want to sleep with me for $50? He says, well, I'm, I'm not very tired, but I could really use the money. <laughs> <laughs> a couple's in bed watching TV and the husband keeps switching the TV channels between a fishing show and a porn movie. His wife says, for Christ's sake, Eddie, leave it on the porn movie. You know how to fish. (laughs) 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 A lady says to the bartender, my husband's cheating on me. A bartender says, how do you know? I saw him going to a movie with another woman. Well, did you follow him into the movie to see who she is? Nah. The guy I was with already saw the movie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how many vaginas does it take to change a light bulb? How many? <laughs> Just one, but it's got to be really sticky. <laughs> nice. nice. That's, so, that's just so great. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> so the bartender's about to close up, and there's a banging on the door. Yes, and the drunk says, I, I, I need a toothpick. And the bartender fetches a toothpick and gives it to the drunk, and a while later, the same drunk banging on the door. says, I, I, need, I need another toothpick. The, the, the first toothpick broke. The bartender says, listen, Mac, before I give you another toothpick, I need to know what you need it for. Uh, some, some, some broads threw up in the alley and I'm using it to stab the big pieces. Oh, God. 
<laughs> oh my god. So this is the bartender. My wife and I just put a mirror over our bed. Bartender says, Yeah, I put up one of those, but then I took it down. Why'd you take it down? <laughs> I realized there's just gotten a heart on from staring at my own asshole. <laughs> 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 hey, how do you get three Democrats to agree on a budget? How? Shoot, two of them. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, they, I'm a Democrat. They just can't fucking make up their minds. I know, cocksuckers. I know. Assholes, I motherfuckers. Know. Oh. Hey, Feldman, what's cowgirl sex? What's cowgirl sex? Well, she climbs on top, and as she's fucking him like there's no tomorrow, she says, your brother's cock is much thicker. <laughs> and then she tries to stay on for eight more seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I says to the bartender, what do you think is the most important thing in marriage? Bartender says, complete honesty. Yeah, you think so? Yep. Once you learn to fake that, you got it made. <laughs> right? I like that. That's too sad. Yeah. What's the difference between a lawyer and a vulture? What? Vultures can't take their wing. <laughs> Fuck me. <laughs> Vultures can't take their wingtips off. <laughs> I was doing so well. I know. I know. Bart, Bob, and Bill, are you ready? Yes. Bart, Bob, and Bill are on a scaffolding when Bart slips and falls to his death. Bob says, "I'll go tell Bart's wife." An hour later, Bob comes back and he's carrying a six pack. <laughs> and Bill says, Did you tell her? Bob says, Yep. Where'd you get the six pack? Bart's wife. Wait, you told her her husband just died and she gave you a six pack? Yep. She came to the door. I said, are you Bart's widow? She said, I'm not a widow. And I said, I'll bet you a six pack you are. <laughs> <laughs> a guy says, a bartender, you know, I haven't got laid in so long when I jacked off last night. I thought about my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so when none is outside of bars, the guy's about to walk in. She says, it's a sin you drinking in there. He says, sister, you can't judge if you never tried it. <laughs> you know, okay. Yeah, you bring me a bit and I'll try it. But please, bring it in a coffee cup. I, I can't have people seeing me taking a drink. The guy goes in and says to the bartender, give me a beer and give me a shot of scotch in a coffee cup. The bartender says, what's that fucking nun out there again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing one more and then I'm saying goodbye. All right. A guy's in a diner and he says to the waiter, I'm sorry, I'm blind and I can't read the menu. So just bring me a dirty fork and I'll smell it and order that way. So the waiter picks up a greasy fork and hands it to the blind guy. The blind guy puts the fork under his nose, breathes in and he says, ah, that's what I'll have. Meatloaf and mashed potatoes. Well, the waiter can't believe it, and he goes and tells the cook, who's his wife. Next day, the blind guy walks in. The waiter says, I'll get you a dirty fork. He gets a dirty fork. The blind guy smells it and says, mmm, that is perfect. I'll take the macaroni and cheese with broccoli. Well, the waiter's sure the blind guy's fucking with him. So the next day, when the blind guy walks in, he says to his wife, Mary, rub this fork on your snatch. And then the waiter goes out and hands it to the blind guy. The blind guy puts the fork to his nose and goes, Whoa, I, I didn't know Mary worked here. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'll talk to you next well, time. Let me, let me, great. I love it. I love it. See Jackie, 8 p.m. Thursday, December 16th at the West Palm Kennel Club in West Palm Beach, Florida. Tickets on jokeland.com. You'll love 
Jackie's autobiography, The Jugman Bow to Stern, syllables and words and paragraphs. Oh, my. <laughs> Follow Jackie on Twitter at Jackie Martling. Repeatable jokes every day at 420 p.m. International Marijuana Time. And you want the perfect holiday gift? Personalized videos. Go to cameo.com forward slash Jackie Martling. Laughs 24 7. Call Jackie's Dirty Joke Line. Use your finger 516 922 Wine. Thank you, Jackie. So, two guys in Miami have a new store and they've only got a few shelves set up when the first guy says, You know, I bet any minute some old geezer's going to walk in here and ask what we're selling. Just then, the old guy walks in and says, well, what, what, what are you selling here? The first guy says, we're selling assholes. He says, well, well business must be pretty good. You, you only got two left. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. One more guy. A guy's on the emergency room gurney on his elbows and knees with a half dozen number two pencils deep in his ass, a racer end out. <laughs> and the nurse says, sir, are those pencils sharpened? He says, sharpened? What do you think, I'm crazy? <laughs> <laughs> See you later. See you in the Kennel Club in West Palm Beach. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Jackie, the joke man, Martling. That's our show. Uh, let's take some calls. I see one hand raised. Rodrigo. Let's take some hands, as Dan would say. Rodrigo. And I see John Hayes. Rodrigo. Hi. How are you, sir? Good. Just let me post this. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, why is it so hard to get traction on fighting climate change? Why is it so hard to get what? To get traction on fighting climate change. I give up. Why is it so hard to get traction on fighting climate change? I bet this is a good one. What do you got? One of the biggest reasons is all the people who think very loudly in the back of their minds I'm white in the USA, I will be fine. And what they don't understand is that they're playing the odds in a real life casino. Maybe you will not become a climate refugee and you don't care that your children might. So you're betting that you, you will be safe even though this year again, the power companies in Texas have not been required to waterproof their pipes. Uh, even if you never lose your home to a flood or a fire or a winter storm and you never die because of a heat wave, enough of your neighbors will that you might become redundant and lose your job. Or at the very least, you will spend the coming decades hearing that you should be grateful to, ha to have a job and that asking for a raise is un-American. And that is why golden parachutes for CEOs, which already make 30 times what CEOs make in Europe and Japan, keep getting larger, but conservatives have refused to vote to increase the minimum wage since 2007. And that, in turn, is why capitalism has to go, because of the incentive to say, I agree, everyone should pay a little more tax, except for me, because I have these special circumstances, and I'm happy to pretend everyone else doesn't have equivalent or better reasons to be exempted. So it's a, it's a numbers game. And the question you need to ask yourself is not, are you feeling lucky, punk? But will you keep getting lucky day after day, year after year? We, while people in your community lose their houses and keep trying to rebuild them instead of moving to a safer place. Thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo. How are things in Mexico tonight? 
I this weekend I got my second dose of AstraZeneca. I stood in line for seven hours, but good. Second dose. I'm glad Thank to you. hear that. And was it free? Yes. Good. It um, was from the federal government. Good. Thank you. Let's go to West Hollywood. John Hayes. Hello, John. John, you have to unmute yourself. This question really probably a lot to uh, about signing up for the Zoom of Nader's show, the live recording, but there was nothing on his site that pointed to that. I will look into that. Yeah, they yeah. were doing a live recording of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour a week from Wednesday. And I don't know how to sign up yet, but this will be exciting. You can see how we produce the show. So this is exciting. All right. What's that buzz? <laughs> got. What's your buzz in the background? My buzz? Uh, I don't hear it. Maybe it's a little buzzing. Line. A little buzzing. All yeah. right. I will look into that. By right. Thursday, I will have an answer for you. Thank you, John. Uh -huh. All right. I will lower your hand and disable your uh, talking there. That's our show. I want to thank all our guests for showing up. Dan Frankenberger in the newsroom. Dave Cyrus. Howie Klein. David Cobb. Dr. Harriet Fraud. Professor Adnan Hussein. Peter B. Collins. Professor Marianne Cummings. Professor Mike Steinel. Jackie, the joke man, Martling, and of course, Henry Huckamacki and his guest, Taylor Genovese, PhD, researcher of anthropology and editorial board member of Peaceland and Bread magazine. Please subscribe to this show as a podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would like to see you in the Zoom room in the in the virtual studio audience. So please go to my website and hit attend a live taping. Also, every Friday night office hours starting at 8 p.m. Eastern. Would love to see you there. Go to my website, sign up for office hours and we have a YouTube channel. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel. We have Andy and the Invisible Ninja, and we have Dan moderating the chat room over there. And thank you to the Invisible Ninja, as well as uh, Andy Brown and Dan for doing that. I'm David Feldman. Remember to stay strong and protect the weak. Taylor Dirty Joke, he knows quite a few. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a human man with an enemy for right. Some days he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your ears all right, buckled in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Thank you.
Yes, it's time right now on the David Bell Show. Get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming way. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. 